How do we evaluate our presidents and prime ministers? Ideally, we should do so on the basis of their governance. But governance is complicated, the economy is complicated, policy is complicated, the state is a convoluted beast that moves in many directions at once, and this entangling all of these is hard. How much of what happened is down to the decisions of the person at the top? How many of those decisions were good or bad, regardless of the consequences? What are the counterfactuals? What are the counter narratives? In most cases, we can't tell. So we instead judge our leaders based on our prior perceptions of them, the image we already have in our minds. We rationalize or condemn everything they do, regardless of what they actually do. Often, we judge them based on the ideological or political tribe we have already chosen. Sometimes, though, a leader is either so bad or so good that even those blinkers are irrelevant. I feel like that when I think of a man called P.V. Narsimha Rao. Born 101 years ago, on June 28, 1921, Narsimha Rao happened to be the compromise candidate candidate when he became the Prime Minister of India in June 1991. India was in the middle of an existential economic crisis. Bold action was needed to get us out of it. We needed to go against every political current that had brought India to where it was. Narsimha Rao was a man of great learning, but India needed a man of great action. He realized the gravity of the situation and used his political skills to bring about the famous reforms that lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. What he did for humanity is incalculable. And yet, his achievements are today minimized and even mocked by his own party. There's a haunting image of dogs nipping at his half-burned body on his funeral pyre after he died. And that's a perfect metaphor for what this country has done to one of his tallest leaders. If it was not for P.V. Narsimha Rao, I may not have been recording this today. And if you're Indian, you may not have been listening to it. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is Vinay Sitapati, a political scientist who's been on the show before to discuss the history of the BJP before Modi. That's one of the most popular episodes of this show and I'll link it from the show notes. When Vinay got in touch recently and said he was visiting Mumbai, why don't we meet for coffee? I instantly took the chance to invite him back to my home studio to discuss his outstanding first book, Half Lion, how P.V. Narsimha Rao transformed India. Vinay came over for a meal and a recording and we had this conversation. Vinay's book began with the question of how central Narsimha Rao was to the 1991 reforms. Would they have happened anyway? His narrative reveals that without the man who put together the remarkable team that carried out the reforms, they may not have happened. His book also paints a fantastic picture of Narsimha Rao, the man. Here was a boy from humble background whose hunger for learning was second to none. He was a self-taught polymath who knew 13 languages, 10 of them spoken by humans, and three computer languages that he taught himself when he discovered computers in his 60s. He was erudite, pragmatic, and when action was required, a man of action. Vinay's book brings out these aspects of his character and is also unflinching in looking at the things he got wrong. Vinay and I spoke about many other issues and the first half is a freewheeling chat on politics, history, political science, why we want the things we want. And a road between Bandra Station and Bandra Reclamation that contains all of India within it. Before we get to the conversation though, let's take a quick commercial break. Do you want to read more? I've put in a lot of work in recent years in building a reading habit. This means that I read more books, but I also read more long-form articles and essays. There's a world of knowledge available through the internet. But the problem we all face is, how do we navigate this knowledge? How do we know what to read? How do we put the right incentives in place? Well, I discovered one way. A couple of friends of mine run this awesome company called CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com, which aims to help people up-level themselves by reading more. A few months ago, I signed up for one of their programs called The Daily Reader. Every day for six months, they sent me a long-form article to read. The subjects covered went from machine learning to mythology to mental models and marmalade. This helped me build a habit of reading. At the end of every day, I understood the world a little better than I did before. So if you want to build your reading habit, head on over to CTQ Compounds and check out their daily reader. New batches start every month. They also have a great program called Future Stack, which helps you stay up to date with ideas, skills and mental models that will help you stay relevant in the future. Future Stack batches start every Saturday. What's more, you get a discount of a whopping 2500 rupees 
2500 if you use the discount code unseen so head on over to ctq compounds at ctqcompounds.com and use the code unseen up level yourself vine welcome to the scene and the unseen thank you very much amit it's a pleasure to be here yeah and it's especially a pleasure for me because our last episode was actually recorded remotely and it's just much better to kind of be sitting here in front of each other isn't it and yeah this could not be less remote <laughs> this could not be less remote uh, listeners he is not on my lap it is a little remote but the episode we did together by the way if i if i remember correctly is the fifth most downloaded episode of the scene in the unseen so i think it uh, struck a chord with a, a lot of people Oh thank you thank you very much let's hope this gets a little higher than that <laughs> let's let's hope this gets a little higher than that and i want to start off by sort of referring to uh, and from my episode with you and and indeed your book on the bjp really eye opening for me and i want to start off by asking you about something that we spoke about and then subsequently you know there's been a counter narrative to that yeah when dhirendra jha's book gandhi's assassins came out recently there was a prominent blurb by christoph jafrelo saying that oh to the effect of i don't remember the exact words but to the effect of this proves that the rss was involved in gandhi's murder and uh, when we spoke you pointed out how ya yeah, gotse was in in the rss in the 1930s but then by the early 1940s he had i mean he didn't formally resign but he had nothing to do with them and most most importantly in his magazine agrani for uh, years before uh, he assassinated gandhi ji he railed against two targets which were rss and gandhi ji which kind of you know uh, proves that uh, he would have had nothing to you know the, he was completely out of the rss orbit and uh, this book using mostly circumstantial evidence claim seems to imply that uh, no he was an active part of the rss which i didn't see any direct evidence for it was circumstantial and also that the rss is involved in the murder so firstly you know uh, what would your response to that be and uh, secondly the broader question is is that you know i abhor the rss and uh, uh, obviously abhor godse as well and i don't think that one needs to associate them necessarily and force fit them together to be against them uh, so it, it, it's almost as if that this narrative is important for people to prove as they've been kind of talking about for the last you know since G- gandhi ji died uh, uh, so what w- what's your take on this well let's stick to the facts for a minute before you know the larger narrative right it's a clear fact that godse was a hindu nationalist in that he believed in hindutva he was a fan of savarkar the criticisms that he had of gandhi are the exact criticisms the rss had of gandhi there's no disagreement on that even the rss would say that look we may respect gandhi but these are the criticisms we had of him etc etc appeasing muslims appeasing muslim league um you know appeasing pakistan after creation of pakistan etc etc so both godse and the rss had the same views on gandhi the question and the question for criminal liability is was the rss involved in the murder of mahatma gandhi there is no evidence for that right there is a little more circumstantial evidence that says look what's the role of savarkar right but in the and this is not a question that has not been asked this is a question that has been asked heavily for the last 75 years um immediately after gandhi's murder rss was banned um a, the the police which was run by uh, patel was not sympathetic to the rss at all uh, and a year later they found no evidence against the rss which is why they removed the ban on the rss why would they remove the ban if the rss was involved right the rss was not charge sheeted people were arrested but nobody in the rss was convicted or punished for this and for decades later this question has been asked again and again and again right and as you point out the new book is a you know is a, is circumstantial evidence and you have to then ask the question why are we interested in that today because somehow you want to tarnish the bjp today with something that happened uh, 75 years ago and on which so much research has already been done right and as you said why can't you just criticize the bjp saying that you know and i do that in my book saying that you know its treatment of muslims is unconscionable etc 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 so why do you have to invent these other things right the other thing that has constantly been i would say invented on the bjp is that it's fundamentally a brahminical upper caste organization um it's not and if it if it has that in the beginning it's certainly not the case under modi and um, you know 
Amit, I keep wondering, why can't you just say the problem with the BJP is that it's majoritarian, that, you know, 200 million Indian citizens, it seeks to exclude from citizenship. That's bad enough, right? Why do you have to, you know, and, and the problem with doing this, and especially things like the relationship between RSS and, and Gandhi's murder, which, by the way, was a Congress political platform for decades after, which is, you know, vote must de do Gandhi ke hatyarun ko. That, that used to be the voting rally in Clive, but there's just no evidence for that and I feel in some senses you know critics of the BJP do themselves disservice with these kind of allegations that have been exhaustively studied and exhaustively disproved over seven decades yeah absolutely and uh, and, and Dhirendra Jha by the way is a wonderful writer so it's not about him as well I loved his previous two books which I recommend you read called The Dark Knight and uh, Ascetic Games The Dark Knight in fact has a history of how the whole Babri Masjid controversy started Akar Patel first told me about that book so a wonderful journalist not a knock on him and this book also has some excellent journalism slash history and uh, you know all of that but it, it also seems that there is you know a need to kind of push a, a narrative about a party where absolutely everything is black and if this has become a dominant narrative that the RSS killed Gandhi, then they've got to find a way to kind of talk about it where I found, you know, my conversation with you enlightening on this that, you know, Godse railed against them for years in his magazine Agrani and uh, yes, you can't um, necessarily absolve Savarkar in the same way, but that's again a, a whole different story and as far as caste is concerned, you know, the fact is that mo both in 2014 and 2019, more Dalits voted for the BJP than they did for any other party. And it's the same with OBCs and tribals too. Exactly. Casteism is pernicious and is unfortunately still a part of Hindu society and uh, you know and, and that's a terrible thing and hopefully one day we get past it though we are nowhere close to doing so but that doesn't mean that Hindutva per se is necessarily casteist what Hindutva is especially as we see it uh, today is anti-Muslim and and you know and and that is a big problem and that's reason enough I think um, in my mind to sort of um, oppose it you know you you've mentioned to me that you've never voted for the bjp and why and so on and so forth and we, we've just um kind of uh, spoken about the anti-muslimness and all of that but is it the case that after you came out with these two books on uh, narsimha rao which we'll discuss in some detail and which i really love reading and your book on the bjp before modi that people especially within academia within the world of history began to look at you differently as if in some way uh, you are an apologist of some sort just because of the subject that you chose I mean a long time back I remember I did an episode with Prashant Jha who wrote the book How the BJP Won which is about 2014 and there is nothing nothing in that book which indicates study supports the BJP it's just data analysis and really sharp analysis and all of that but I mentioned that book to a friend and said you really must read this if you want to understand why they won in 2014 and he's like, nah, nah, he must be a BJP guy or whatever. Yeah. Have you <laughs> had to go through that? That's a very interesting question, you know, because for my first book, which is what we're going to discuss today in detail, um, the biography on Nansima Rao, the hot button political question was economic liberalization, right? And of course, I asked the question, who did it? Who was the author of liberalization? And I argue that, look, it was a political, not a technocratic process. And therefore, the primary responsibility lies with the politician in question, which is Narsimha Rao. But an underlying assumption was that liberalization was a good thing, right? That it worked, that it, you know, has brought about growth, that it has lifted enormous amounts of Indians out of poverty, that it has uh, increased government revenue to the extent that it can fund welfare schemes like NREGA, Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, or even the food security uh, package that India has in a way in which uh, prior to 1991, Indian government simply didn't have the resources. And while it has increased inequality, which is a problem, Indian e inequality by at least by Gini coefficient standards is not alarmingly high. It's a problem. But Po you know, poverty reduction, high GDP growth are spectacular, right? Now, when I wrote that, I was worried that I would get pushback from lots of people who felt that liberalization was a bad thing, right? I did not, right? And I was not tarred saying that, oh, you are a, you know, a neoliberal. neoliberal, right? And I think, Amit, it's because in India, that battle has been won. 
you know that in a deep way whether it's mayawati or uh, samajwadi party or dmk the broad agreement is that you know the state has to retreat from the market broadly right and instead the state has to play an active role when it comes to welfare schemes and the two are connected because when the state retreats from the market and allows for private enterprise state taxation goes up and it's able to use that increased revenue for welfare schemes which then allows them to win votes right this is a broad social democratic contract that has now become common sense in india and it has become common sense that look if you want welfare schemes of the nregs scale you know you better get high gdp growth and if you want high gdp growth the state better retreat from the market right roughly so that has not happened right for the second book on the other hand amit i have got push back saying that in you know are you an apologist for the bjp right and i find that a ridiculous argument that just because i'm saying that they're not fascist they are you know driven by elections they are focused on winning elections and i'm arguing that if you want to beat them beat them on the electoral battlefield right and i was thinking about amit that you know i mean i'm not invested in hindu nationalism in that i'm not going to spend my entire career writing books on hindu nationalism but something that i did notice is that there's very little academic genuine academic debate on hindu nationalism you know i mean i you know i did my phd in princeton i just finished doing teaching a semester at princeton so i'm quite familiar with global academia when it comes to india and also of course indian academia when it comes to india i teach at ashoka university and you know if you wanted a genuine debate on the bjp genuinely you'd be hard pressed to find an ideologically diverse panel academic panel right that's a problem because academia works best when you have peer pushback and peer review right when you have group think in academia it's it's deadly because there's no other way in which academic truths are validated it's not validated by the external world by the number of books you sell by a third party it's you know especially social science humanities is inherently subjective so what you hope keeps academic honest is peer review and that just doesn't exist for hindu nationalism right uh, and the debates on hindu nationalism are minor you know is it fascist or is it on the way to fascism right and that's a problem and i worry and i and you know this book was in some sense an attempt to counter that saying that look you know it's dangerous when academics and intellectuals tend to have just one narrative right and if you notice the right wing keeps pushing back against academia saying this and i think that it has more than a kernel of truth of course to what extent they you the right wing uses this is very different right? you know and they use it often to stifle debate rather than to say let's have better debate right but they are onto a kernel of something saying that you know you don't have ideological heterogeneity on a very very hot button question in in india on the other hand on economics you do and i'm happy about that you know if you wanted to have a panel on is liberalization good or bad even though there is broad political consensus that it's a good thing you would have intellectual disagreement and i even though i literally wrote a book saying that liberalization is a good thing i'm happy that there are academics who are constantly pro- pointing to flaws in the way india did liberalization in 1991 and that makes for a healthy academic atmosphere Yeah I mean I'm one of them who criticizes the 91 uh, reforms because I feel we didn't reform enough right. which is I think one a point of view which would have been absent at the time because I think uh, uh, the academic world would have been against them at the time but I guess gradually it turned I mean you get mugged by reality uh, yeah. so what do you do and and I had a great episode on the 91 reforms with uh, Shruti Rajgopalan and right. Ajay Shah which I'll link right. from the show notes and w- what you mentioned about poverty going down and inequality uh, going up is a point I keep making I mean on the show and in columns that people confuse the two people often rage against inequality when actually is poverty that they mean you know a common question that i like to ask people on the subject is in which of these two countries would you rather be poor bangladesh or the usa and obviously everybody would rather be poor in the usa but the truth is the usa has far more inequality uh, than bangladesh and now that bangladesh is having a healthier economic growth than before hopefully that's changing and it it would be changing in the direction of poverty uh, going down and inequality going up because everybody is getting richer but the rich are getting richer at a faster rate than the poor but what is important here is what the philosopher harry frankfurt calls the doctrine of sufficiency that do you have enough to live an autonomous life with a certain amount of dignity and if you have that that's what matters and therefore when you are a nation that is as poor as india is your first priority is always to kind of get rid of 
poverty so uh, before we kind of uh, get to your book on narsimha rao which um, uh, is so illuminating and fascinating and so resonant even in uh, uh, modern times i'd like to know a little bit more about you now typically i do spend an hour and an hour and a half with my guests talking about the past life so i had assume that i must have done that with you the last time we spoke but even though that was i think 3 hours 40 minutes we didn't spend that much time you did speak a lot on uh, writing your writing process which i loved and many of my writing students have loved i keep quoting you uh, you know what you said about perfection being the enemy of production which sinks in with what i believe about uh, writing as well that your priority should be to get it done and not to get it right and often just getting it done again and again is a way to get it right but we didn't speak about your childhood and i just found out today that uh, you are a Bombay boy, and you were kind of born and brought up here, and all of that. So, tell me a little bit about that. You know, what was, how did you grow up? What what were your childhood years like? So, I grew up in Bombay. My dad worked for Exim Bank, which is a PSU, public sector enterprise. And in 1991, he moved, um, and it was a dislocating period for us. If I look back at it, because you know, when you're in a public sector unit, and this is pre 1991, uh, Narsimha, pre Narsimha Rao. You know, you have a car, you have a driver, you live in an apartment. There's a certain sense of stability, right? And then he, you know, he tried to make it on his own, and you know, big bad world of uh, you know the private sector. And I saw, you know, that change of '91 taking place in my family, right? What did that mean? It was opportunity, but it was much more, um, you know, winner takes all. There was an element of uh, insecurity. There was an element of risk. So I grew up with that. So in that sense, '91 shaped me. Um, I spent much of my childhood in Bandra, right next to Lilavati Hospital. I don't know uh, how many of your listeners know that. Uh, but it was quite a fascinating uh, part of Bandra and Bombay that I grew up in. I still remember that I used to take this road from Bandra Station all the way back home to Bandra Reclamation, and that one road told me much more about India than I learned, you know, at Princeton or anywhere else. You begin that road in Bandra Station, which is a cosmopolitan place. People of all castes and communities and and classes come there, and then you walk a little more, and you know, you cross Lucky Restaurant, and as you enter, uh, it's a Sunni Muslim part, so they are Indian Muslims. Many of them are Sunni, and you know you'll see butcher shops there. You know these are lower middle class Muslims. Uh, you'll see many electronic stores, etc., etc. You just walk for a minute on the stream road, and you'll see a Jain temple, right? And I'm just you know I used to turn back and I used to see meat shops, and I used to look in front and I used to see this Jain temple, right? And then I used to see Jains basically crossing to go to the temple, and they wouldn't look left or right because otherwise they'd see meat. <laughs> and you know what? There was coexistence. There was coexistence, right? Um, and in 1991, during the uh, sorry, just before that, during the riots, the 1992, the Babri Masjid riots, that road was not badly hit at all, right? Tells you that you know India has an ancient tradition of tolerance and coexistence. Anyway, you walk a little more on that road, you cross the Jai Temple, and it's a Marathi area. There's a Marathi school there. A little more, and you enter into the Bandra Bazaar, which is heavily Catholic. and um, you know these are middle class catholics but they have permanent structures permanent buildings right and the thing that used to strike me is that unlike any other community hindu muslim whatever caste whatever region the catholic areas the public space was clean you know and so it wasn't just that you know that the house was clean and the kachra would fall on the street the the street itself was clean right and it has always stayed with me that you know sometimes you know there are certain religious or intellectual traditions that make a public sphere more possible than others right that how you treat strangers you know whether you're able to keep not just your house clean but the road in front of you clean is not just randomly distributed right and anyway the catholic area would end and then there would be a bangladeshi slum which you would you would walk across and and then you would be there would be a set of middle class maharashtrian buildings where we lived and around reclamation and many of the labor for those middle class maharashtrian buildings would come from the bangladeshis right who lived in those slums um and it still struck me that the uh, you know if i again you know this is just anecdotal i haven't done survey data but most of the people who lived in those buildings would be sympathetic to the shiv sena right uh, and they lived cheek by jowl with the other right bangladeshi muslims who you know bal thakre would rail against but there was coexistence i mean i must have walked thousands of times on that street up and down to bandra station and reclamation and back um and I, you know i would you know on 
at the time i i didn't like it i was like i wish i you know i could take an auto or a car to go to the station but on hindsight i think that journey taught me more than a lot of books i've read that's so resonant i mean you should write an essay about that walk perhaps i mean there's so much in it what went wrong because you know i once in an episode with jp nara an episode 149 which i'll link from the show notes uh, was on one of my usual rants about hey india is so illiberal and look at uh, communalism look at caste look at gender and he said that if you look at it another way if you look at the lived realities of people there's also a deep liberalism here because it is also so assimilative you look at our food you look at our clothes you look at the street that you just described right it's uh, in its lived reality it it can also be incredibly assimilative and it would seem that the majority of people in the concrete live their lives that way so what went wrong because one of the things that i felt while uh, you know reading uh, akshay mukul's book which also we discussed when we last spoke and i know you have some disagreements with it um, was that there was always this intolerant illiberal strain this bigoted strain so to say running through indian society it was always there it was not a political creation and the politics that we see today is a, is the supply side of the political marketplace responding to a demand that was already there like i had an episode with veer sangvi about his memoir and in that he speaks about how rajiv gandhi's big win in 1984 was partly the hindu vote turnout because uh, you know the anti sikh stuff and all of that and that was what made the bjp in a sense shift direction from that's you exactly know, right their sort of uh, the, the socialism that they claimed to propound in uh, 1980 gandhian socialism that's right to, ba- back to integral humanism back to back to integral humanism and quoting this in the world so it was yeah. supply responding to demand and then a race to the bottom from that's there that's exactly right so what's your take from your road which goes from station to reclamation yeah. and where all of india lives yeah. how have we come here well firstly you know the the data backs up my analysis of that road so if you know i would urge your readers to read the 2022 pure survey on religions which shows you that most indians live segregated lives in that you know their best friends um their neighbors tend to be people who are from their religious group but it's also a deeply tolerant life so in india segregation and tolerance go hand in hand and we will live amongst ourselves we will marry amongst ourselves but you too will achieve liberation through your sect or your religion and you have as much right to live here as i do right so in india you know it's really communities living cheek by jowl they're not individuals living it's not western style cosmopolitanism it is groups living but groups living side by side and having some interactions like economic interactions but not others for example eating food together or marrying together right the other way of saying this is that you know if you see this segregation as bigotry you'll say the bigotry goes hand in hand in tolerance right um that has always been the the nature of india that you know that it it's not that this has always been spurred there's been riots you know for a very long time there's been hindu muslim conflict it wasn't invented by the british right as marxist in, in historians like to say it's a it's an age old issue but that has gone hand in hand with hindus and muslims living together right and in the book we we'll, we'll talk about it but in narsimha rao book around 1993 narsimha rao was prime minister and then he um, samuel huntingdon has written this article called clash of civilizations which then became a book clash of civilizations and the remaking of the world order in foreign affairs and narsimha rao has friends in the us who send him the latest academic articles and he's reading it and in his archives i found and if you if you see in my book i have a photo of narsimha rao's version of clash of civilizations with his note notes and the notes are very telling and these these notes that narsimha rao writes on clash of civilization was written just a few months after the end of babri masjid right december 6 1992 just a few months after that and also keep in mind that narsimha rao grew up in a part of india that had a very strong muslim influence it was nizam's hyderabad state many of his childhood friends were muslims right and he writes there in the margin that if samuel huntingdon is trying to explain why islam is in conflict with other religions why does he not explain the moments in which islam is not in conflict in other words you have a theory there sam huntington provides a theory for why there is a clash of civilizations between from time immemorable f- between islam and its neighbors right 
and he provides a theory for that based on the nature of Islam. But then you should also have a theory for when Islam coexists with its neighbors, as Nasim Rao says happened through his childhood, right? And then you should equally say what is it about Islam that allows you to live in coexistence with Islam, right? Um, and that definitely, you know, when I was reading that, I was remembering my own childhood and walking up and down this road for you know you know for for so long and this element of coexistence but you know amit that experience of walking down that road taught me very early to be suspicious of a cosmopolitan individual right centric narrative of india it just doesn't exist right and you know given that i have some sense of where your economics is headed i think some of india's economic tragedies can also be put down to the fact that we don't treat individuals um, with any dignity in this country it's all about groups yeah that's a fantastic insight and i'll think aloud and i'll just kind of ask you a question because it strikes me that when you live like this segregated but tolerant right where you have groups living side by side and not a cosmopolitan individualistic kind of uh, and sorry to interrupt hmm. you you know since you know we both are have our bones in bombay mm. you know if you live in bombay what everybody ends up talking about is real estate <laughs> and look at the politics of buildings in bombay yeah jain only buildings no vegetarians allowed so we are reproducing in the most visually cosmopolitan thing you can have which is an apartment complex yeah we are reproducing old communities living together you know no garlic in this building no onion in that building this is only a bo- this is not just a muslim building this is a bora build- building only this particular hospital has been built by boris only we are reproducing exactly that right yeah exactly you you have a ton of individual choices which individuals have the right to make leading to what is a bad collective outcome a bad social outcome so my musing is this and i'm strictly thinking aloud based on what you just said that uh, consider two scenarios uh, and one scenario is that you live as we do where you have people living in groups segregated but tolerant and they're living in peace like in that lane you mentioned and as in india for for you know uh, 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 m- most of our history in most places and in the other scenario you have a cosmopolitan atomized existence individuals living in flats and apartments and all of that my sense is that the first situation where the uh, where you think in terms of groups is likely to break down at some point or the other simply because what you are really doing by living in groups is saying that this is my in group and those are the other and at one point you say i will be tolerant to the other but wherever you are hit by say extreme scarcity or all kind you know uh, there can be other triggers you you can hit the other as well whereas if you're living an individual atomized uh, existence that kind of hatred against a particular group of people is less likely so in the second scenario where your cosmopolitan and individual rights matter you'll have serial killers perhaps those are the outliers but in the first scenario you could have a genocide at some point or the other in fact given a large enough sample size it's inevitable well let me push back against that you know and i'm happy you said this because i was you know with you amit i'm worried will we ever have even four hours if we chat will we have a disagreement <laughs> yeah. so i'm happy that you said this because i would push back to say that to defend india's segregation but tolerance right to defend it firstly it's all we have right so as a reality you know if you are thinking about changing india you got to work with the india you have so th- we don't we're not living in switzerland no i i meant in yeah. terms of a thought experiment i completely agree that uh, me certainly i don't know about you uh, i'm a complete misfit in this society because i think in terms of individuals i refuse to put labels on someone and say oh you know that person is this caste or this religion or whatever and i reject all those labels when applied to me as well you know so even if i'm born a hindu i'm an atheist you know i'm not going to accept any labels even a label of atheist you know you you know i am who i am and so but i completely recognize that in our society our society is always is pretty much destined for the foreseeable future to yeah. be group to i be- think the best we can hope for amit is that in the short term we make a distinction between the public and the private lives of indians and we say look in a private life you marry who you want if that means you marry somebody from your caste or your religion that's your choice if you want to have lunch or dinner with people only you know commensuality right that's the origin of jati whatever not origin a key feature of jati you eat interdining you don't want to do interdining you want to eat only your kind of food your particularities you have every right but there is this thing called public sphere it means voting it means employment right it means behavior of strangers in the street right in those things you have to behave like an individual 
right? So the best I think we can push for, right, is to say that there is this private life and private sphere. And if you want to be comfortable living a group life, go ahead. But insofar as we have these public spheres and public lives, please don't think about your caste, your religion, because you're all in it together. Because the, just the, the nature of the group is all 1.4 billion Indians, right? I would say that's a more achievable equilibrium than a Swiss society where everybody thinks as individuals in India, which, you know, I just don't see, at least in our lifetimes, um, that realistically happening, right? And one thing we've seen with you know, the old modernization theory was that with industrialization, right, with the move from farm to factory, um, groups would kind of atomize and you'd move from rural group based societies to individual urban societies. You just haven't seen that, right? And you, in, in that sense, Indian modernization looks more and more like Japanese modernization, where you're able to both keep old traditions as well as reinvent new traditions of groups um, rather than move towards what the United States or Europe looks like. Though even there, as we see now, group dynamics are playing a very big role. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the word atomization because people often use that to beat up on a straw man version of libertarianism where they say, oh, you see the world has atomized individuals, all our connections will be lost and blah, blah, blah. And my response to that is no, you know, the, the world that I see is based on a respect for, of consent and voluntary action. You know, I see myself as an individual, but I'm, I'm a part of different communities of choice. I keep trying to reach out, form different kinds of bonds. So that whole term atomization at some level goes to that straw man argument which people uh, often kind of throw but uh, that was a delightful sort of uh, uh, diversion you took into that street from Bandra station to Bandra reclamation we, we, I, I'll, take, I'll take you down that I'll take I mean, let's walk so and you, you'll see what I mean Done, done. See, I mean, if this was on YouTube, uh, the next shot would be we are in that lane. <laughs> and yeah. So, so tell me more about your childhood. So, you know, where are you going to school? What's your vision of yourself at this point? What, what are the, what do you read? What do you listen to? Give me a sense of the texture of your uh, days. So, you know, I, I used to go to school place till my 10th standard, a school called Aryavidya Mandir Bandra. Uh, um, yeah, that's where I spent seven to eight years of my life. Um, and, you know, the joke, uh, when, when my Nasimara book came back, the joke I used to say was, look, I went to a school where everybody knew Mahesh Bhatt's third or second wife. <laughs> Nobody had heard of Narasimha Rao, you know. <laughs> and I remember saying this uh, at, uh, you know, one particular event. And the person who spoke after me was Vikram Bhatt, you know, who is, my, if, again, if my memory serves, Mahesh Bhatt's uh, younger brother. And he, you know, he began by saying, you know what? I, I have to be honest with you, I didn't know who Nasimara was, but I sure knew Mahesh Bhatt's second wife, you know. <laughs> so that was the school I went to, right? It was a school in, uh, you know, where uh, it was an Arya Samaj school. So we had a disproportionate number of Hindus, mainly Sindhis and Punjabis, um, uh, ref, you know, ex-refugees or from ex-refugee families who'd kind of made it, you know, in Khar, Bandra area, uh, Santa Cruz, those, those areas. And we had a high proportion of Parsis because, you know, Arya Samaj worships uh, fire. And, you know, Parsi said, okay, we also are happy worshipping fires. We had a disproportionate number of Parsis, right? And it was an interesting school because, you know, my, my parents came from a professional background. My mother taught at Bombay University. She taught sociology. And my dad was an IIT engineer and he had his own consultancy. He had gone private. Um, but, you know, most of my students um, came from business backgrounds, right? Most of my, my fellow students. Um, so, for example, around Bandra Station, again, those of you who are familiar with Bandra, you have a series of uh, di of jewelry shops, uh, you know, where uh, Hill Road meets uh, Bandra Station. Lots of my classmates, you know, were, were uh, scions of those jewelry shops, you know. Uh, so, it's radically different world from those who come from a professional background, you know. And it gave me a very... Uh, an instinct that, look, I like to read books, but I'm very familiar with the fact that other people don't read books, you know, and I like that diversity, you know, that uh, I don't want to only seek out people like me who, you know, who like books and who, you know, who quote and, you know, like whatever, you know, intellect, the life of the mind. Many people are not like that and all power to them, right? And, you know, what does it look like? to grow up to inherit your father's jewelry business, you know? What does it look like to grow up to inherit your father's Skoda business, Skoda car dealership in Sakinaka? So I had a pretty strong instinct for that, you know? Um, and in that sense, I'm pretty happy I didn't go to Delhi and, you know, a certain world in Delhi where, you know, I'd only be hanging out with people like me. 
uh, I think this has given me a good instinct for people who are different. Of course, you know, the class background was not heterogeneous. You know, people were broadly wealthy and certainly most, most people were wealthier than my parents were. Um, but it, you know, it was certainly an interesting car, Bandra, you know, background. You know, for example, the school, we used to go swimming as a school every week to car gym, right? And I used to joke that car gym is the only place in the world where in the bar, Sindhi is the lingua franca, right? <laughs> that sing, you know, Sindhi is the language that is spoken. Um, so it's a very different uh, kind of deal. And then after my 11th and 12th, I think my parents thought I was getting out of hand. And I went to Rishi Valley School which is a Jindu Krishnamurti school. I mean, the stereotype of the school is, you know, you 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 uh, sit in on classes under a tree. And I think that that, that stereotype says a lot about the, the, the school. Uh, two of the happiest years of my life. I'm very happy that I didn't go there throughout. Because if I had gone there throughout, I wouldn't know how to cross a road with traffic, you know, because uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a rural school. You live, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a pretty sort of, uh, in, you know, inside baseball community. Um, and then I went to National Law School, Bangalore for five years. So I, you know, I, I studied law. And uh, um, after that, you know, I found that a lot of my students, a lot of my fellow students in National Law School, Bangalore were going to these fancy American universities for what we call an LLM or a master's in law and places like Harvard, Yale, which was be out of reach if I was even going to IIT. And I just I applied because I thought it would be a good sixth year. So I went to Harvard Law School, I spent one year and I think at that time I had an epiphany, Amit, which is that if after going to Harvard Law School, I can't do what I love, then who can do what they love, right? And uh, yeah. suddenly all that pressure, everything mounted, right? But who am I kidding, right? If, you know, after Harvard Law School, if I do something conventionally foolish, people think I'm eccentric, not crazy. And there's a world of a difference between both those those words, right? Eccentric people are, you know, people with options who choose to do funny things. Crazy people are just crazy, right? Um, and I asked myself a simple question saying, what do I like doing on weekends, right? And I liked, you know, I used to follow Indian politics. I had written a couple of pieces, pieces for Times of India and Hindu and just crafting, writing and crafting the narrative on politics is something that I found fun. And I said, look, this is what I clearly like doing when nobody's forcing me to do anything else. Let's see if I can make a career out of that. And at that stage, I was um, quite keen to do a PhD in political science. Um, I, I thought I would get into Harvard. I didn't eventually. But I decided to take a bit of a break because I didn't want to go degree from degree. So I came back to India and worked for some years with Indian Express. Again, fascinating time in Delhi. Um, I was on the editorial pages. So I was a sub editor uh, doing, you know, cleaning copy, but I was also writing edits and I would occasionally do reporting pieces. And that's when my, I, I would say my love for journalists, right? And, you know, people who really are in the trenches, especially reporters, uh, because you know, the thing with reporters is that, you know, you may spend a full day, right, uh, seeing a story that only takes up 100 words, right? But other than the 100 words, that entire experience you've had is within you. And so when I used to meet older journalists, the euphemism we use is senior journalists, I would find that them to be rich with anecdotes, rich with experiences. I was also very lucky to meet Shekhar Gupta at that time, who has, you know, definitely become a bit of a mentor. I, he may not know it, but, you know, at least from my end, um, because I, I mean, many of your readers may see his cut the clutter, your viewers may see uh, his cut the clutter. Um, that's how he was to us, that he would just walk to the journalist and then he would narrate incident after incident incident. And that's when I learned the power of being able to talk about politics through a story, right? And an emphasis on contemporary history. So I think I owe him a lot. I also, you know, was very grateful to get to know Raj Kamal Jha, who's also a very well-known author. Uh, but he brought a certain aesthetic and discipline to writing that um, I've learned a lot from. And, you know, again, maybe I'm just ranting here, Amit, but, you know, my time in Delhi is a bit of Alice in Wonderland, right? And I completely agree with the criticism of Latians Delhi that they're a bunch of privileged, you know, ex-IS officers, kids, right? That's a correct, I mean, like all stereotypes, of course, there are many people not like that, but that stereotype, the Arnab stereotype has a kernel of truth to it, right? Um, and amidst that, people like Shekhar Gupta and Raj Kamal Jha, who are genuinely talented, 
right it's very rare to find and when i found them i was like i used to stick to them right and that's the one thing i learned that it's important to pick your mentors right and raj just the aesthetics of writing raj told me never use the word i when you write because it's very powerful so use it sparingly only when that i is going the word i is going to make a difference i follow that in both my books no i right it's third person because you know what i'm a boring person here you, because you're asking me i'm telling you about the street etc etc but quite honestly i came here prepared to talk about narsimha rao not myself because frankly the subject is much more important than you are and uh, yeah and after that i spent um, six years in princeton doing a phd in political science i learned how to write uh, a book a book length project i learned how to research um, it was fascinating but i was always very sure i wanted to come back to india and i would have come back to frankly indian express and journalism at least that's what i told them but luckily you know this ashoka university was opening up and now that i'm there i don't want to be anywhere else i mean i get 5 months a year off uh, to do my own research it's an unbeatable proposition so you know many uh, stands i uh, want to follow but before all of them uh, you know you mentioned being in uh, that school surrounded by kids or business people and filmy people who yes. know the bhats more than narsimha rao yeah one of the bhats was uh, uh, close to my age group there you go pooja's brother yeah uh, okay rahul bhat the friend of uh, headley rahul yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah he uh, he was my physical trainer at a gym i went to for a brief while that's right while. he was also david headley's physical trainer that's how they got to know yeah, each other yeah so that's what david headley and i have in common <laughs> though i i have to i have to clarify i never knew david headley yeah. but yeah i think circa 2001 2002 i used to go to the gym in marine drive where right. uh, rahul was my trainer so i just finished reading this fascinating book that i'd recommend to all my listeners called wanting by luke burgess abhijit bhaduri had recommended it to me Uh, in the episode we did together and i picked it up subsequently and it's a superb book and the central thesis of the book is that most of what we want is not some inner desire it is imitative yeah it is mimetic in a sense we look at what the people around us want and in a sense we adopt their desires to become our desires burgess's sort of realization was based on um, like this line of thinking about wanting and desire came from a, a philosopher called rene girard and G- rene girard i think a few decades ago was asked to teach a class on literature and he wasn't a literature guy but he agreed to teach the class because he needed the money and then as he read all these books he found in them a thread that uh, had not uh, that he, that you know other people who taught literature hadn't uh, spoken about which was basically that in all these novels and books and all that he read all the characters seem to want something not intrinsically but because some someone around them wanted it or they were expected to want it and so on and so forth and that's where the great tragedies took place and, and the concept i was left with from from burgess's book was one about reflecting why we want what we want and two about the distinction between thick desires and thin desires right and thin desires being sort of relatively superficial desires which may be really intense but which are which you still picked up from somewhere else and they're not intrinsic to you that oh i want a mercedes c class or i want this or i want that i want to go on a holiday there and so on and so forth and you think you want that but you probably want that because of a bunch of other factors and intrinsically you don't really want that and thick desires on the other hand would be what you intrinsically want that's who you really are and i found this a very good frame to just examine my own life and my own choices and think about the things that i wanted and why did i want that like i was reading this book sort of on vacation this is a bit of a digression but there is a sport called match poker not quite like poker but something like it and um, i won the national championship there with my team a couple of times i was part of team india we went and we won the asian championship and then recently uh, last month we went uh, to the world championship uh, where all the teams that we had thrashed in the asian championship finished ahead of us it was pretty devastating for various reasons like regular team members had visas rejected and all kinds of shit happened and i was while reading this book thinking about okay why was i so upset and that you know the, the reason like the first reason i got drawn to that particular form of poker as it were is because it was so different from poker that you had to work it out from first principles and there was an intellectual challenge so the intellectual challenge drew me in but most of the devastation that i felt was because i wanted the glory of winning a world championship with team india 
even though i've already won an asian championship with them right and why did i want that is it something so intrinsic you know it's part of uh, most of our desire for validation is completely unnecessary and pointless most and most of them are thin and, not thick uh, yeah most of them are thin not thick and this was a thin desire and i have thicker desires and it 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 strikes me that you avoided a trap here because when you went to that school it is quite possible that you could have uh you know picked up desires or things that you wanted to do which were thin desires from the people around you from the milieu around you yeah and uh, you know even when you did law perhaps you yeah. go down certain paths because yeah. they are great paths everybody wants yeah. them yeah. howard law school like who yeah. would yeah. who would turn that down but luckily you said you had that epiphany and i'm presuming that what happened next that process of seeking truth by doing the reporter's job by engaging with the world and yeah. everything that you've been doing that's a thick desire yeah. so if you sort of reflect on this journey of yours yeah. uh you know uh, does any of this make sense were there thin desires before you found it your thick desire it makes a lot of sense of course there were thin makes a lot of sense that is very uh, clarifying amit uh, so that definitely there are thin desires of course the 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 problem with thin desires is you realize them too late right that you think they are thick desires right you think that there's something intrinsic and later you say nahi this is not what i really wanted or i was i was influenced um so you know so so i definitely see that but i think that at harvard law school was an epiphany in that it told me that i didn't have to play the thin desire game you know that you know i should ask myself what's the thick desire and to me the thick desire is what you do on weekends you know and is there a way to monetize that i mean look i'm not crazy i mean you know i i, I you know I, i have to make my own way in the world and i have to you know pay for myself so you know what what can i do which is which links my thick desire what i like to do on saturday sunday into you know being able to provide a you know a good livelihood for myself and my family right that you know but but so i think that gave me the epiphany until then i definitely back of the mind i have this thing that you know i have to you know i have to succeed in the way society defines success and after studying in national law school bangalore and harvard law school that way was actually pretty simple which was uh, to get a corporate law job and work on wall street there was actually very and i did interview for some of them but i had a second epiphany while i at harvard law school i took this course called it was i think introduction to corporate law or 101 corporate law by this professor called guhan subramaniam uh, who was a joint appointment between harvard business school and harvard law school and he was superb he was absolutely brilliant and i worked my ass off and i still got i think a b or a b plus and i think that was another epiphany because it told me that corporate law is not meant for me that you know if i have the best teacher in the world and i work really hard i'm still not good at it so why should i waste a career doing that you know i think that and by the way i you know a lot of my students um, who i teach and who i give a b or a b minus i tell this story to saying that look it's a signal it means that if you didn't work hard it's a signal to work hard if you worked hard it means that perhaps this kind of course is not meant for you and that's a good thing because there are a million courses out there the million things you can do right so actually knowing what you're not good at um is a good thing so yeah so i i think that but thanks for clarifying that amit you put it better than i could look burgess put it better <laughs> than either of us could i guess no and i i was thinking of the same thing when i read your book on narsimha rao and we'll talk about the book uh, in detail later but this strand about what do you want and why do you want it also struck me because in many ways it seems to me that well, narsimha rao was a puppet of circumstance you know getting married at the age of 10 and uh, uh, you know you you've written here quote rao would later describe his arranged marriage as an act beyond his control as so much of his later life would be he was quote within quotes disappointed but not shocked his inner self remained unaffected stop quote and later you talk about how he became an uh, how uh, you know there was a pull to academics and he had once said that had he not been a politician he would have been an academic in oxford or cambridge at another point you write about um, uh, choosing politics where you write quote his choice of a career in politics was not an affirmation merely the preclusion of other alternatives uh, in other words he was a hopeless midfit but a mundane existence would have driven him mad stop quote which is again resonant and i so so, so you look at rao's life and he's a product of circumstance and serendipity in so many ways rising in power as a compromise candidate because he hadn't chosen a tribe for example you know whether it's his becoming chief minister or later prime minister and all of that but at a deeper level on the subject of wanting it kind of 
made me think that there is an inner mystery there and perhaps what he wanted was the life of scholarship of reading and writing and uh, of course he did write that semi autobiographical novel and you know he was trying to write it in the 70s but politics called him back when you know indira gandhi got him to delhi as a yeah. general secretary yeah. Yeah. and uh you know and and one thing that is fairly obvious in almost a banal observation is we are of course all creatures of circumstance you know whether it's a circumstance of the genes we happen to have or the things that happen to us that's right but in, in terms of wanting is our wanting what we want also perhaps a matter of circumstance like the other thing that you point out with narsimha rao was that he did want political power that he did in a way pull strings and maneuver and try to you know and lie and bribe all of that you know to become prime minister when he did to become president in 82 when uh, you know uh, zayal singh was chosen instead and again later when venkatraman was chosen instead so he did want that power even though he was in a sense an accidental politician so just i i i think one way of looking at lives and reading lives is also as a web of desires and trying to figure out where they come from and what they do to you and i'm just thinking aloud this is a bit of a ramble but what about what are your thoughts no i think that's that, you know that's quite illuminating i i hope by the way you didn't structure just to say that my musings are equivalent to narsimha rao's musings as he grows up you know um because <laughs> i mean, i have i certainly haven't thought of it that way the way i thought of narsimha rao is as follows you know i mean an uncle of mine who you know has had a huge influence on my life has always tells me this which is that god gives you a certain set of cards right some of them are aces some of them are not the question is how well you play those cards and as a as a poker player that, that you know must resonate with you right i think narsimha rao had a very early epiphany that he can't control the cards dealt to him right he's married at the age of 10 he's married at the age of 10 right um you know he you know his family around him is illiterate semi literate the family around him is semi literate right what he can control is what he can do with those cards right so yes the family around him is semi literate but he's a precocious student he loves learning so his father sees that and sends him to a school in a different village even if it means that narsimha rao is cut off from the rest of his family right um and by the way this is a learning that is hugely helpful to him when he becomes prime minister you know look at the cards that are dealt to him right one is india is facing the biggest economic crisis you know it has ever faced arguably right um the berlin wall has collapsed so india's best friend in the global stage soviet union is uh, is kind of withdrawing right um india has secession issues in assam kashmir and punjab in fact i think in kashmir and punjab if my memory serves elections couldn't even be held when narsimha rao became prime minister right uh, he and his congress predecessor has been murdered by the ltt that's rajiv gandhi these are the cards that he's been dealt with right and look at the other set of cards dealt with him right he is not popular in his own party his party is not a majority in parliament right he lacks individual charisma god has not given him charisma and he has to in some sense report to sonia gandhi these are the cards dealt to him right the question is how do you play it and the argument of the book is he played it better than anyone could have played it in those 5 years right so i think that realization he has from a very early age that there are tons and tons of thing outside his control and he is not you know he is not going to die on that hill he is not going to complain god why did you do this to me he is not going to do that given the situation he is going to make the best of the cards that have been given to him and i think that's an early childhood realization that narsimha rao inherits and i would argue that that's his core skill set to know when to lose to know when to win and to know when to cheat you know yeah and there's also sort of a poignancy to the metaphor you made with poker and the cards you're dealt because i you know in poker what happens is that you know that uh, even though it's a game of skill luck plays a huge part the quantum of luck is much more than in other sports you know i play 100 points of tennis with nadal i will lose all 100 but if uh, you know you take the best poker player in the world and he plays a newcomer who just knows the rules it's going to be more like 52 48 so what you need to for skill to express itself is volume so you don't play one hand you play hundreds and thousands and really a sample size a good, decent sample size in poker would perhaps be 100000 or more That's than that That's interesting i didn't think and, of that and in life you don't have that 
you don't have a sample size in life you can't put in volume uh, as a phrase goes you get that one hand you do with it what you can and it's interesting through the course of the book to see how that worked out how that worked out with his marriage where they did stay together in a way for 40 years have kids and all of that but also had independent lives out, outside of that or rather he did she uh, you know uh, couldn't so much because just the privilege of being male i guess and then even later like i i completely agree with you know what he achieved uh, during his five years like you've mentioned in the book that quote in terms of the quantum of transformation brought about rao ranks with other 20th century rev- revolutionary figures such as nehru deng xiaoping fdr reagan thatcher and shal de gaulle but the difference you point out is that none of them faced all of these obstacles which you just outlined and he alone faced them and he made the most of the cards and another way of looking at that is that uh, you know when he was home minister when the sikh riots happened you outline it in your book in, in detail that it's fashionable now to blame him and say he was a home minister the riots happened but as you say what really happened was that he was given a message at a point in time that now all reports of this and the control of the police will be with the pmo with the prime minister's office and those are the cards he's dealt that but by the way i do say that i think he played it badly right hmm. in the sense i call it his vilest hour you do that's what i call it because those were, so he was held a bad set of cards he was given a direct order by the pmo to stand down and that even though he was home minister and in delhi the uh, delhi police report to the home minister he was told on the day that indira gandhi died that there would be riots the next day and the police will report directly to the pmo so he was held a bad he was dealt a bad set of cards if he had protested he would have had to resign and his career would have been over in the congress but he could have done that right he chose to protect his career over preventing genocide of of innocent sikhs right and i would i would judge him harshly but yes he was dealt a bad set of cards there no doubt about it i would i i agree with you in terms of it being his wildest hours and one has to judge him harshly but what he did there was consistent with what you point out he did in all the other situations where rather than argue against the cards dealt to him he just accepted it and ensured his own survival within the system you know uh, in that sense he was being as rational at that moment as he was after 91 where he did everything he did where he was completely right. masterful i think that's right uh, yeah so it's it, it's an example of how you know people contain multitudes it is so easy to praise uh, praise narsimha rao as india's best prime minister and as you point out in your book arun jetli does uh, yeah, arun jetli says india's best congress prime minister Oh, that's what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he has to say that, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and at the same time, condemn him for his inaction in eighty four, for example. Uh, in the same way, you know, I think Vajpayee was a damn good prime minister, and there are other things that you can condemn him for as well. So people contain multitudes, and 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 Nehru as well did too. There are things you can condemn him for, and there are things you have to praise him for. We will come back to Narasimha Rao later, uh, but in that personal journey, there were other strands I wanted to pick up on, and. one was uh, you spoke about gaining a particular aesthetic and an approach from rajkamal jha who by the way also contains multitudes because i absolutely hated his first book the blue bed spread i thought it was purple ornate prose and uh, uh, you know uh, maybe the mimetic desire to uh, write like arundhati roy who was you know who wrote similar ornate purple prose except that his seemed almost a parody but obviously a great journalist and editor from everything that i've heard i've never met him so tell me a little bit about the influence he had on you like uh, the, the 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 bit about the i i completely get in journalism there has to be no i i focus a lot on getting my guests to use the i because that that personal journey is really for me what brings the show alive and what uh, makes each of my guests more than an expert on a subject but an actual human being on a journey so i aim for the personal uh, but in the journalistic context um, uh, you know i i i i can i you know i totally agree with raj there but tell me a little bit about uh, you know figuring out in terms of aesthetic in terms of approach in terms of ethic how he influenced you and how you changed well i firstly definitely the i right and the i is also deeper in the sense that what he constantly instilled in me was that the subject is greater than the observer you know and he's in, in in doing so he's rebelling against the recent fashion which says that because the observer cannot be detached from the observed 
let's talk about the observer instead right that, that's what happens right and i look academia is full of this stuff right because you need to be sort of self reflective or felt self reflexive um it just becomes like a you know a, a sort of an ego massage that actually you should be writing about tribals in jharkhand but you know you're talking about your caste privilege class privilege gender privilege but actually that you know there's a way in which that becomes talking about yourself i, I don't want to know about you i want to know about the tribals in jharkhand right um so he so i think he really pushed me into you know take realize that the subject that what you're seeing what you're reporting is much more important than you are of course you have bias and be a little aware of it but don't be so aware of it that that becomes the center of the story rather than what you are seeing you know i think the second thing that raj has instilled in me um um you know you know look uh, you know he won't consciously call himself a mentor but you know i i would say that it's a one way i've learned a lot from him uh, is that um, the art of telling a story you know that what it means to tell a story what it means to talk about the interiority of people right to give you one example um in the bjp book which is what we talked about in the last episode the book you know consciously ends with modi's ascension on the national stage and uh, it's about you know vajpayee and advani's life and through them we get to know hindu nationalism before modi but raj you know when i was talking to him while researching the book had a very interesting point he said look everybody reading the book will be reading the book backwards in the sense they will be reading the book knowing that modi is in power today that hindu nationalism is hegemonic today and knowing this they are looking at the at the past so you can't like go ahead and write the story of the past pretending that there's no modi right so it has to lead up to modi it it shouldn't be about modi it has to lead up to modi but it should be well aware and sensitive to the fact that the story only makes sense for people reading today given that they're obsessed about modi they're obsessed about hindu nationalism right and he gave me this example of this book that he had liked a lot which is by lawrence wright um called i think it's called the looming tower the looming, right super book yeah so i sorry i'm i'm sorry i haven't read the book but i'm i'll paraphrase what he told me and he told me that look it's the story of al qaeda until 911 right so that is isn't that right that's right that's right but everybody reading it is reading the story of al qaeda given 911 so how do you you know and, and you know it's it's a bit of a balancing act because you know everything that osama does you know in the 1990s shouldn't be you know saying that ah this is see this is what he did and therefore this this helps 911 make sense because that's a bit too reductionist on the other hand that's what the reader cares about so how do you make that balancing act right and it's and his and his answer to that by the way raj's answer and i really appreciate that is often more aesthetic than it is analytical so it's a treatment of a story rather than the facts or the narration of the story right um i've learned a lot from him about that the third thing i've learned which is i think the most important thing is that you know i mean in in express under him he's now the editor in chief makes a conscious effort to not be left wing or right wing right because it feels that the complex story is actually in the middle so it's you know it's very critical of modi it uh, indian express houses um pratap bhanu mehta who is i would say the arguably the most famous modi critic in india um and it has got him into enormous trouble not least in my own university which is shameful but it's certainly not right wing it's not a left wing paper either it gives plenty of space to ram madhav you know it it it's quite critical of cancel culture etc etc and even when it comes to modi it's critical of modi it also says that there's you know tons of thing that modi does right like the welfare schemes for example and it you know and and i think that has to do in part with raj's aesthetic of focusing on the middle and on the complexities in the middle right and i've certainly for both my books um have taken some of that aesthetic which is that look it's a really boring question to say i want to write a book which says that modi is the son of god right or i want to write a book saying modi is the son of hitler i mean those are terrible books to read right the the complexity of the story is somewhere in between and being able to tell that story right and being able to draw people from the left and the right to engage with you regardless of their ideological beliefs by saying that look i have my own sensibility right but 
the facts that I'm telling you and the story that I'm telling you is honestly done and adds value to you even if you don't agree with my ideological position. And I think, you know, looking back, some of that comes from both, you know, what Raj is doing with Indian Express and frankly, what Shekhar Gupta is doing with the print, right? Which is, it infuriates people on the left, it infuriates people on the right, uh, but it tries its best to do what you said, which is to resist categorization. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And in fact, like one of the small tips I give my uh, writing students in one of my webinars is about how when you're writing an op-ed or an opinion piece, you want to engage with the opposite argument and not a straw man, but the best version of the opposite argument. That's right. And what it does, and there's a tactical reason for this, what it does is that today what has happened on social media is you have vocal minorities consisting of tribes and within these tribes you have people raising their stature by attacking the people in other tribes by attacking people in their own tribes for not being pure enough and never addressing arguments and these are extremely vocal so it seems like everybody is like this but these are minorities That's right. and the vast silent majority of people realize that everything is complicated and they are confused and they want to figure shit out so if you go there with the attitude that everything is complicated here's what I think and here's why and and here's why I think the other point of view is wrong. And you take that intellectually honest approach, you get a lot more credibility and you have a lot, you have a much better chance of convincing readers because immediate, they haven't immediately pegged you as partisan. I mean, it's so easy to tell who's preaching to the choir yeah. and who's not in a sense. I want to sort of go back. No, I'm sorry hmm. to add to that. You know, I want to add to that that, you know, it's not just that readers are getting irritated when people are partisan. Readers get and viewers and in your case listeners get irritated with moral preachiness, yeah. which is that you know somebody beginning with the moral high ground and telling you you have to agree with me, otherwise you're a bad person. Yeah. You know, and it irritates the shit out of readers and and viewers and listeners, right? And but they just feel so bullied that they can't even say it, right? And I think that you confront a viewer or a listener or a reader with saying, look, this is a point of view. These are the facts, right? But hey, no pressure, man. Make up your own mind. Look at it your own way and come to your own conclusion. And you know what? You presume I'm a good person. I presume you're a good person, you know? And I find that a much more refreshing attitude and frankly, a much more honest attitude. And, and a much more healthy attitude. Uh, and uh, so sort of going back to the second of the three point, uh, three learnings that you said you had from Raj Kamal Jain, one of them was that people who read your book, the, which is about the BJP before Modi, will read it knowing the ending. And therefore, in some way, the narrative has to play to that play to the ending. And I'm not sure I'm and again, I'm just thinking aloud, no doubt you've thought this through more. I'm not sure that that's always uh, the best approach to take in the sense that if you think about the world in probabilistic ways, there can be many outcomes. Today, from where we are, it seems that Modi was inevitable. But in 1980 or in 1988 or in 1992, and Modi wasn't necessarily inevitable at any of those points in time. Like if you think of the world in probabilistic way, like how I explain it is that imagine you're flipping a coin and there's a 50% probability. And as you flip it, there are two parallel universes which form. And in one universe, it's heads in, in the other universe's tails. And so on down the line for infinite parallel universes, of which we occupy only one. And with the benefit of hindsight, we behave that whatever happened was inevitable. But actually, it wasn't, you know. And I wonder if thinking of what has happened as inevitable can uh, lead you to the trap of sort of then framing history in a way that it leads to this and exactly this. Like, for example, Keshava Guha has made the point earlier and that, you know, if Pramod Mahajan hadn't uh, died, for example, you know, within the BJP or if within the Congress, people like Madhavra Shindia and Jitendra Prasad and Rajesh yeah, Pilot yeah, hadn't died, yeah. maybe politics would be completely yeah. different today. Maybe Mahajan would be PM and maybe there'd be a real opposition yeah. in the Congress instead of uh, yeah. uh, what we have now. Yeah. Uh, so all of those possibilities are open. Yeah. But if you, you know, keep the reader in mind that the reader knows the end, I mean, isn't that a danger? No, I, firstly, I completely agree with you, right? Which is that it's deeply wrong to think about the present as inevitable, right? In fact, both my books on Narsimha Rao and on the BJP, the central point of both books is that these were contingent affairs, that these were demand side, they were the journey shaped the destination, that we have to know the hundred years of the BJP to get to, to today, right? Because each of those years shaped 
you know the way we came to today right and it wasn't inevitable i focus a lot you know critics say a bit too much on personalities right but to me personalities are important because they are full of like what you the example you just gave by keshav goa on you know pramod mahajan dying or madhav rao sindhya dying what effect it has on the congress so i completely hear hear you on that i think what raj meant and what i took from him was not that the reader should 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 first be told that the present today this is the only journey that could have happened it is that that's there in the back of their mind while they are reading your book so you have to address it right again i haven't read looming tower but my impression is that uh, lawrence right is not arguing that it was inevitable that the towers would fall it is that the reader reading me about the various contingent events that leading up to the fall of the of uh, 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 the the twin towers is having both the towers in the back of her mind or back of his mind and i have to be respectful of that i can't pretend that that didn't happen because that's what the you know the the readers and the the viewers the listeners are are seeing that's what i've taken you know i i've I, i've kept in mind like for the narsimha rao book um you know a very important fact that you know i didn't want to hide away from was that nasimha rao has been shamefully treated today right that's the reality of today that he's been erased and i wanted you to you know i, I wanted to keep the reader uh, the, the one thing in the mind of the reader that when i you know the reader is is probably asking hey why do you want to write 300 pages on this guy right nobody is going to say that on vajpay advani but plenty of people would have said that about narsimha rao and i have to be sensitive to that right i think that's what i took from that that you know the reader is looking at the present and then reading your book right so be respectful for that but don't pander to the prejudice that the present is an inevitable consequence of the past very well said and uh, you know if if you're listening to this in india then i think you you know no matter who you are or where you are you owe a debt to narsimha rao in some way i mean oh, yeah. what he did in those 5 years is uh, uh, just apart from the bare facts of lifting hundreds I mean, of millions of people if you have a mobile people. phone thank narsimha rao like forget like any complicated thing right <laughs> yeah. you know if you drive on a road with a public private partnership a lot of high quality you know toll roads are like that thank narsimha rao right uh, but sorry go no, i could and, go on and on and on and for many people if you have food on the plate because he got hundreds of millions of people literally it sounds like just a number right but hundreds of millions of people out of poverty i mean it's 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 just uh, such a profound consequence and it's not necessarily the case that it would have happened anyway no so you know as uh, your book also kind of makes clear so, which is hmm. why i'm totally with you that i don't want to give the impression that there's a straight line between the past and the present yeah yeah it could have gone in various different directions as you pointed out in your book and uh, i hadn't realized this but i was so alarmed when i read that little bit about how pranam mukherjee was trying to angle for the finance minister position uh, when manmohan became the singh yeah, because can you imagine it would have been a catastrophe it would have been a catastrophe we, we, you know because he was a catastrophe eventually when he got to the post in 2009 no, no, and no no he was a, there's, there there's a straight line before his finance ministership in the 80s yeah where he encouraged you know reliance style crony capital ism and his finance ministership you know in uh, in the waning years of the upa where uh, once again you know it was old style crony capitalism i mean your uh, listeners would resem- uh, would remember what he did to vodafone yeah. for example uh, it's absolute catastrophe yeah yeah and i but, but by the way that's not the only catastrophe imagine if so pranam mukherjee was a long shot right as even as finance minister he was a long shot uh, because you know he had been sort of expelled or he had left the congress under rajiv and had, and had come back and was being rehabilitated by narsimha rao but imagine if nd tiwari remember him right had been prime minister uh, yeah i mean you know that frankly that you know he was the more likely candidate right or sharad pawar right it would have been crony capitalism um these are you know th- this and it 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 was within a whisker of happening yeah yeah that that's just such a fascinating period of time let's go back to your getting to history for example i'm curious about that shift now from journalism to history because part of that epiphany that you had in harvard law school was you like reporting you like that kind of life you 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 like writing about stuff and all that where does the shift to actually writing history happen from there and what does it mean that you have taken this unconventional route to writing history in the sense that you know whenever i talk to academic historians i get this little sense of 
resentment against the likes of even Ram Guha and Manu Pillai, oh, yeah. who are not traditional historians, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. They kind of come from outside. Yeah. And it's most, like, by the way, most uh, or many academic historians resent Ram Guha, and 99% of that is just sheer envy. It's envy. Because he sells, sells more than them. And when they tell ordinary people, you know, people who are not academics, I'm a, hist- a historian on India or South Asia, they say, oh, like Ram Guha, and, yeah. and, they, and they burn when they burn when they heard that sentence. And not only, <laughs> yeah, and not only does he sell more than them, he also writes better than them. So frankly, it's it's just a, you know plain causality uh, happening there. No, so, I have one gripe, you know, as mm. a, with, with Ram, and I've told him this um, m- many times, which is that you know his books are rich in primary sources. Uh, which is the most important thing, but they lack uh, respect for secondary sources. Look on Gandhi, lots of people have written about, right? And what Ram has done is dived into the archives, focused on primary material. But I just wish he could have also, you know, told us what others have written about about um, uh, Gandhi, because look, there's a long tradition of that. That's also one reason why academic historians are hurt. Because they're like, look, this guy is writing on stuff that we have written about too. And of course, he has original material, original research. They're fantastic. But why doesn't he acknowledge us? And I think that, you know, that is a legitimate criticism. Look, I'm a big Ram Goa fan, but I would say that, you know, if he, you know, he should inform the reader a little more on others who have written about the similar subject. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And uh, I'm also a big Ram Guha fan. I, I got attacked on Twitter recently because I defended him against someone who called him a Sanghi uncle, quote unquote, a Sanghi uncle, Ram Guha of all people. And then uh, Ram saw the Twitter fracas and he wrote to me and he said that, no, no, listen, don't defend me. Just just stay out of this. Uh, so uh, it can get a, a little ugly. But just sort of speaking about those secondary sources and just a question that occurs to me that at one level, of course, that you don't just want to go to the prime primary sources and see Gandhi's letters and Gandhi's writings and what others wrote on him at the time, but also how other historians have interpreted that and looked at that. But, you know, there's a term George Soros uh, coined in his book, The Alchemy of Finance, called reflexivity. And his point was that the way people think of the world changes the world. So if you think uh, uh, the reality is X and reality is actually Y, reality will actually start moving from Y to X if enough people think that is the case. Does this have an effect on historical figures whose careers play out over a long period of time that they pay attention to what others are writing about them or that what others are writing about them can (laughs) shape a public mood and then change the way they behave? And uh, therefore, for that reason, also you need to take account of this. That's a good question, actually. Look, um uh, you know, my first book, Nasimara, are dead, so he's not going to listen to me, right? My book. But during his lifetime, because if you're looking at secondary sources, you might also be looking at what, say, question. a newspaper said about him in 1967, yeah. which can change the way he reacts. It's, look, it's a good question, right? I'm not going to give you a flippant reply, which is that, uh, you know, do writers about history help shape history through this causal pathway, namely that leaders and people of influence are being influenced by that history? It's a good question, you know, but just one uh, uh, pushback a little bit. I don't, I'm not a historian, so I call myself a political scientist. My PhD is in political science. Um, I'm an associate professor of political science at Ashoka. Um, Where I have some similarity with historians is that I use archives, but I use interviews. Historians don't use interviews, right? So I use a ton. So that's what I have in similarity with reporters. So to me, the two primary sources that I use are newspaper archives, um, documents, um, you know, private papers, etc. And as well as interviews. And frankly, the interviews are what I love the best, right? Um, But the big difference I have with historians is that I'm interested in causation. Historians don't like to think of, you know, the world in that way. So, for example, when it comes to the rise of the BJP, I'm interested in what helped the BJP rise, right? Uh, when it comes to Nasimha Rao, I'm interested in making the causal argument that Nasimha Rao caused liberalization, right? Or certainly caused the success of liberalization. So I'm making a causal claim. And thirdly, unlike historians, most of the secondary sources I refer to tend to be political scientists, right? So certainly, so I would call myself a political scientist who uses historical methods, as well as journalistic methods, right? Um, But again, maybe it's the Harvard Law School syndrome, Amit. I don't feel insecure as having to prove that I'm one amongst them. I mean, whatever, man, I'm like a tenured professor in a university, right? I teach students. Um, You know, I just spent a semester teaching at Princeton. So, you know, I I don't have that insecurity at that level. And B, and at a deeper level, Amit, 
having spent lots of time with academics i don't think academics are any smarter than non academics right just like it's like saying are doctors smarter than non doctors no it's just that doctors have gone through a certain training and know some methods that non doctors don't know but they, their iq may not be better than the patient right and so similarly i have i am under no illusion that academics are you know put the smartest people in the room no they're not they just have done a phd most of them and they have you know some kind of methodological training that gives them certain advantages and doesn't give them many other advantages so this idea of having to write for academics i don't think that they're the smartest people in the room i mean i'm not disrespecting academics but i think that they're just the, the, you know as smart as bankers or as smart as journalists on average there's no particular difference right yeah absolutely i mean uh, sturgeon's law would apply here as well which is you know 95% of everything is crud and is everything is what crud is the term he uses oh. but it's a synonym of crap so you know <laughs> like one difference we'll often make is that we listen to some music today and then we'll say are 60s mein itna acha tha beatles were there rolling stones was there but that's a selection bias you're yeah. looking at the survivors yeah. uh, you know the survivorship bias coming yeah. into play yeah. uh, you but 95% of music was crap then and it's crap now and yeah. if you you have to compare the outliers to the outliers yeah, yeah. this can often give a romantic tinge to the way yeah. that you sort of look at the past but staying with academics uh, for for a while like uh, in another context uh, the context of economics uh, ajay shah had once uh, uh, you know lamented on the show that so many talented economists prefer to play that whole academic game the circle jerk as it were and circle jerk is a word i'm using ajay is too polite to use such term Yeah. but that whole academic circle jerk where yeah. they're writing for fellow academics and they're getting plaudits yeah. there and so on and so forth it's a yeah. reflexive game and they're not really growing and the incentives of that seem terrible to me because uh, you know then you're sort of driven into directions to follow certain kinds of fashionable dogmas of the moment yes. and so on and so forth yes. and uh, ajay's deeper point uh, which i think would resonate with you as well given your book narsimha rao is that there are very few of these ec- economists therefore who are choosing to stay back and engage with the real world and one of the points and one of the themes he speaks about to give context to this is how there was actually a community of economists in the government at one point in time economists and wonks and bureaucrats who believed in reform who right from the 80s were doing the groundwork for reform so right when that moment came That's right. you know even before narsimha rao asked manmohan singh to be That's finance right. minister naresh chandra his cabinet secretary had yeah, given yeah. him a paper outlining all the reforms That's that right. uh, uh, should happen because that community of wonks and bureaucrats had prepared it and and he says that that's dying out there that it was it was vibrant through the 90s it yeah. would, it was vibrant in vajpayee's time yeah. he doesn't see that anymore in the younger yeah. generation who are playing the academic circle jerk game no i think there are two reasons for that there are two reasons for that the first reason is that you know the government is less receptive right let's be honest in the 1980s you had people like lk jha abed hussain manmohan singh montek singh uh, aluwalia um you know rakesh mohan you know these are all fine intellects right rakesh mohan did his phd in princeton manmohan singh you know you know uh, was at oxford and cambridge montek singh aluwalia you know was in the world bank and you know people like lk jha abed hussain were first rate intellects right and they were not just persuaded about the importance of liberalization they knew how to work the system and these two are not the same thing right uh, so that as you mentioned when you had a determined prime minister or a talented prime minister like narsimha rao you have a note available to him saying do x right and hire y which is hire manmohan singh right um i worry that this government and now i'm straying away from my research into you know speculations on the present i worry that this government under narendra modi has contempt for you know economists as an as intellectuals and and that's a problem right because in a country like india a developing country we don't have left wing intellectuals right wing intellectuals left wing economists of high quality we have what we have and we have to use those few resources for national development you can't just say that everyone with a foreign degree and you know who speaks english should be junked the rss is not pro- is not producing world quality economists so you you should go to war with the army you have and so i think that one reason for what you mention is that this government is less receptive they're less receptive for people of the quality of arvind subramaniam they're less receptive for people like raghuram rajan and that's a problem right but the second thing you said which is that part of the reason is that 
academia itself is being so professionalized that you're not finding a people who work on the on real issues and b people who are willing to engage with policy and government um i i think unfortunately that's true too i can't speak so much on economics only through friends who are in you know who are economists it's certainly true of political science right um it's certainly true of the humanities i can see that and that is a it is a larger tragedy um there's a third thing uh, and i i think i should have mentioned this earlier when i was talking about my life history which is that when i finished my phd in princeton i was determined to come back to india no matter what i didn't want to look for a job in the us and part of that was i mean it was a deep seated feeling that the creation of knowledge has jurisdictional issues right or to put it differently if you're an economist whose aim is to get tenure in a us university you won't focus or it's much harder for you to focus on on issues of economics in india it's just much harder for you you look at you know what is happening in american economics you'll try to find the analogy in india right like for example in political science so many of my friends in the us are obsessed with you know trump is the fascist you know, Mo- you know modi's india's trump right which is absolute rubbish um i think that's a third problem which is we are seeing a brain drain of high quality uh, scholars to the west and the incentives to produce in the west are very different from the incentives to produce in india and then i i would say the main reason i came back to india was that i felt i would be stifled in the us i would have to produce things that help me get tenure there um, even if it meant lying about india or exaggerating about india or more likely focusing on topics that are not hot in india right um, and that's not something i wanted to do and i think that's a third problem that you know explains what you're just saying which is that we're seeing a brain drain now we have institutions like ashoka kriya and you know hopefully state and central universities also revive some of them like iisc are excellent right uh, we need to push that and you know when i me- met senior bjp leaders for for this book uh for the bjp book my second book they were constantly complaining saying aap ashoka se ho wo naya jnu hai it's an anti national institution i'm like do you want the anti nationals to be in india or do you want them to be abroad you know don't you want them to be in india because at least they're focusing on indian issues right don't you want to create when you say make in india don't you want institutions of higher learning also to be made in india i think that matters hugely you know and you know at an in, in, in an interview elsewhere i've said that self knowledge is a sovereign asset and i would say i believe that very strongly right i mean amit if you were doing this podcast you know sitting in the us or the uk right about india but with half an american audience or half a uk audience the questions you would ask me or the questions you would ask others the kind of people you would pick would be vastly different wouldn't it yeah so you know this uh, what you said about uh, you know your argument uh, to these bjp leaders about wouldn't you rather have your anti national people within the country reminds me of this famous quote i think it's by lyndon johnson where he got someone in his government and they asked him that you know why have you got this person in your government he's your enemy and he said quote is probably better to have him inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in <laughs> and funny. here it seems that how the bjp leaders would look at uh, uh, people in ashoka would be that they inside the tent pissing in <laughs> so that's <laughs> how i think that look at it a quick anecdote before i go to my follow up question you you sort of mentioned uh, you know people in the us who might think that you know talk about trump and modi and this and that i was once told by steve bannon that uh, modi is india's reagan this really happened so i'd i'd won this prize called the bastia prize yeah twice to, you're the only person I'm to win the, it twice uh, no tim halford won it a second time after my uh, oh, second okay. time so i was the first person to win it twice right. but so so the second time when i went uh, i there was a ceremony i gave a speech and the next day the organizer of the ceremony called me and said there is a particular lady i won't take her name but a very influential person in republican party circles and the daughter of a very um, the influential tech magnate uh, and uh, he said that she wants to speak to you she really loved you speech so i said okay i mean why not i'm open to meeting people and then i googled her and all of that and i found that there are a bunch of people who are supporting um, ted cruz at the time this was 2015 uh, the primaries had just kind of uh, kicked off so the next day i go and uh, into this fancy building and there is this lady and with her there is steve bannon who i hadn't heard of before right i had no idea what the alt right is or any of that so they introduced themselves and he said i do a magazine called brightbart and we heard your speech and your speech was great and 
and would you like to start India's version of Breitbart? <laughs> uh, and I, I, that's kind of how I reacted. I kind of laughed because I didn't know the term alt right then. This is 2015, yeah. but I knew that they were broadly conservative, and of course, I'm not conservative. You know, I would not agree with most I of the views. I wouldn't even call so. Breitbart conservative. I would just say they're right wing. No, na- no, exactly. They're exactly. nativist, protectionist. Yeah, they're beyond the pale. But at that time, I hadn't read Breitbart. Right yeah. in my mind, it's something vaguely conservative. Yeah. And why yeah. are they talking to me? You know, right. at at most, if you have to put a label, yeah. you could yeah. say I'm libertarian. So I said, no, no, I don't think it's a fate. For example, uh, you know, I believe in immigration. You guys are against that, right. and I believe in gay rights, and you guys have issues with that, and so on and so forth. And but and then we just chatted quietly, and they were very nice. And at one point, Steve Bannon looks at me, and he said, "Don't you think Modi is just like Reagan?" <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's exactly how I reacted. And I yeah. kind of said, "Are you like kidding me? Like <laughs> I'm sure you know Reagan, so clearly you don't know Modi. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's yeah. absolutely the opposite. Yeah. If uh, anything, but." interesting anecdote aside and i wrote a post on that encounter which i will um, right. uh, link from the show notes uh, my follow up question He's is this somebody you should do seen and the unseen with see vanan yes i i don't think i would i mean why not I, yeah, it's because you know what because and we were discussing this before the thing yeah. that my show works best when people come here without a filter when they speak honestly from the heart and the problem with people in politics uh, is that there'll be an agenda there'll be a narrative there'll be a particular way they want to present themselves which is also why i don't have i don't even invite politicians on this show uh, except you know someone like shashi tharoor wrote no, a book no i see and, your point yeah. I see. and you know the, the the whole logic of a 4 hour podcast is you yeah. know is premised on honesty right? honesty and trust yeah that you know you can have that mutually respectful conversation and uh, polite to each other and it isn't someone trying to peddle a narrative which won't work but so to get back to my follow up question the reason i mentioned academia and both of us went off on uh, you know talking about that is tell me a little bit about history the way history is studied and pursued in academia because uh, someone who is not related to academics or to history their impression of history would be that history is an inquiry into what happened in the past and it is a presentation of the results of that that there are facts about the past you turn it into a story you present it and that's history that's how normal people think of history but within academia that's not it that's not the thing alone within academia and uh, academic history there are prisms that you have to look through ideologies that you have to superimpose on history you have to look at it in a particular way anything that falls outside that prism and is not useful to you you have to cast it aside and that pollutes the field and that perhaps is one more reason why a lot of good history actually comes from people outside uh, you know that that academic uh, line like people like ram guha and manu pillai and so many great western historians as well in fact uh, who are castigated for being popular historians so tell me a little bit about this because you know many of my listeners would have heard phrases like marxist historian and so on and so forth kind of g- give me a sense of what are the different schools of uh, history what are the approaches to history and when a newcomer like you comes in how do you make sense of all this and set that path for yourself well you know first up i don't think i'm qualified to answer that question because i'm a political scientist right so history is a distinct field i'm not a historian i don't teach courses in history um i'm i have some amateur interest in history especially ancient india so i'm reading up quite a bit about it i mean a sh- you know shout out to those who haven't read upinder singh's work i just finished reading her ancient india culture of contradictions i could not recommend it more um it has an ideological point of view uh it's also very 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 good right and it She's tells incredible, yeah. and it tells you that you know that the two things may go hand in hand that you know a, um a historian has a perspective but within the perspective you can be good or bad right or to give you the example of rumila thapar who i broadly disagree with i not even broadly i specifically disagree with right she's a marxist historian um or i would say her guru dd kosambi who i would say is even more of a marxist historian a uh, absolutely brilliant man both of them are very good while i can't answer the question of different ways of thinking of history because i'm not a trained historian you know i i use historical sources but i am a political scientist i'm interested in power and politics um i would only um, push your listeners that don't reject someone because of ideology i mean you know the you know to call romila thapar a marxist historian and should not be a conversation ender it should be a spur for you to pick up her books read it and if you disagree with it you disagree with it so for ex- to give you just one example she's written an absolutely brilliant book 
on Somnath, right? The many voices of Somnath, the many stories of Somnath, where her argument is that the destruction of Somnath in, I think, the 11th century by Muhammad of Ghazni, she doesn't dispute that it happened, right? But what she disputes it is that this narrative that it's a historical wound in Hindu civilization, she says was not the case until the 19th century when the British made it the case, right? And Hindus did not see it in quite this way. And most of the sources we have, which talk about the barbarity of Muhammad of Ghazni in destroying Somnath are Muslim sources and Persian sources, right, who had an incentive to exaggerate, to make Muhammad of Ghazni seem like the uh, protector of the faith, rather than somebody who wanted to make money and came to India to loot, right? Now, I happen to disagree with the book, right, because she's going somewhere with the argument, it isn't just an argument, and I disagree with it. But it's a very, very good book, right? And it's, you know, something that you mentioned earlier, whether you agree or disagree, let's see whether we can pick the best person who argues on either side. And certainly Certainly, Romila is one of them, right? A critique of Romila Thapar, if people are interested, um, there's this writer in Swarajya magazine, which is a center-right magazine called Arvindan Neelkantan, who I quite admire, who's written like a detailed critique of various things Romila Thapar has done. And what I liked about him, and I told him that is, you know, I, I think he comes from an RSS tradition. And I told him that, look, you treat her with respect, right? You disagree with her. And in the few sentences where he's uh, a bit disrespectful, I, I told him, please don't write that, you know, because the power of an argument is that, you know, Romila Thapar is excellent, right? She's serious. I have no uh, need to question her bona fides, right? But these are the ways in which her interpretation has made errors, right? And so for those who are non-academics, um, who are attacking historians, um, this is what I would, I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I, I agree with many of the criticisms. As I said, I'm not uh, in agreement with Romila Thapa's project at all, right? Um, but she's very, very good, right? And to attack her, you have to treat her respectfully and be as good, right? Uh, there, there's this uh, American show called The Wire. Uh, some of your listeners may have heard about it. And there's this man there called Omar. And Omar's famous line is that if you, you know, if you're trying to shoot the king, if you're, you bet, you better not miss, right? So if you're trying to go after someone like Romila Thapar or Didi Kosambi, these are great scholars, right? So make the effort to kind of rise to the occasion. Does that make sense? No, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, uh, the Wire, of course, is you know one of the great TV series of all time. I mean, the Wire and Decalogue are for me the gold standard. You which really is the other one I have Decalogue, uh, which oh, is I haven't seen it. Which is pre OTT times. It was made in 1989 or 1990. It's a series of ten short films for Polish television oh, wow. by the director Krzysztof Kieślowski. Yeah, yeah. And uh, each episode is loosely inspired by one of the Ten Commandments. Oh wow! Uh, even though I don't think they were. I should write but, this down after the show i want to see this oh it's a masterpiece it is for me the pinnacle of cinema and i've spoken about it on the show before and i kind of go on and on about it so i won't uh, kind of repeat that bit but i want to get a little specific here like um, uh, when you say you disagree with uh, romila thapar's project what is the specific disagreement for example with that book what would have been your specific disagreement and also uh, and it the, the, these two might even have the same answer that because the term goes around a lot, Marxist historian, what does it really mean? What is a lens you're looking at? And I accept that you're not a historian and you've clarified that you're a political scientist. But, uh, you know, as someone who's read much more of this stuff than I have, certainly enough to have disagreements with uh, with uh, Romila Thapar. I've read her a little bit, but I don't know enough to have disagreements. So, uh, but just expand a little bit on that. So I'm not a, I'm, I, you know, I, I, neither am I a Marxist or a scholar of Marx, nor am I a historian. But loosely put, I would say, you know, Ir Irfan Habib, um, uh, Romila Thapar, D.D. Kosami. D.D. Kosami is really the great scholar, you know. So if anyone, you know, if, as I said, you know, if, if you want to aim for the king, you best not miss first aim for D.D. Kosambi, you know. <laughs> uh, and, you know, for those of you who don't want to read his work, there's an excellent talk um, that Pratap Bhanu Mehta, the political theorist Pratap Bhanu Mehta gave um, on D.D. Kosambi in a D.D. Kosambi lecture, a named lecture on him on YouTube, right, which sort of, you know, lays out D.D. Kosambi's view of history. And it gives you a good sense of what the Marxist lens as applied in India is, which is a different, slightly different from the European and American Marxists, right? So the Indian Marxists, you know, are a little different breed. 
one thing they all have in common is the emphasis on class right and uh, and material dialectal uh, dialecticism as applied to class and class analysis and a belief that the real struggle or the story of history is class struggle everything else is an epiphenomena right so for to, to, you know to 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 take that to the specifics of romila thapa's book on somnath her argument is that uh, it, the motivation of mohammad of ghazni was not religious right and the insult and the humiliation that the hindus felt was not religious right and it was invented much later on by the british right who had their own kind of agenda uh, so that would be one very strong emphasis that other axes of motivation are considered to use marx's phrase as epiphenomena right the other so, so i would say that's a that's a very important element that the the you know that their peasant struggles that you're looking at different modes of production and during these different modes of production feudalism capitalism what is the underlying class struggle that is going on and that forms the basis of history right so that's a, so f- for example a lot of marxist historians would see the failure of the national movement as not looking at class revolution and focusing on nationalism instead right and scholars like bipin chandra uh, aditya mukherjee mridula mukherjee who are again historians um, but they are kind of they are off the left but they are congress historians who are critiquing marxism or marxist historians by saying that actually the national movement was a class revolution right so that's sort of you know defeating the marxists on their own terrain right so i would say that you know broadly put that becomes the the way of analysis it's not the only school of 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 indian scholarship so for example two other scholars that i admire greatly uh, on ancient india also happen to be my colleagues in ashoka university that is upinder singh uh, who we have mentioned and nayanjot lahiri who's written really a classic on ashoka uh, another scholar who is not a marxist but who uh, understood marxist ways of writing is airavadan mahadevan um, who dedicate who was a former is officer who dedicated his life to decode the indus valley script um again he was not a marxist so so by no means is the indian tradition on studying ancient india and this is my you know this is all i'm focusing on is a marxist tradition right but you know you have high quality scholars that come out of india who also happen to be marxist but um, not all of them are and when you set about to writing first the book on narsimha rao and then the book on the bjp what were sort of your models for this like what are you looking back at like when you uh, say that you were writing uh, about history but it wasn't history per se quote and quote um, and uh, you know it was more using historical facts to talk about political yeah, science yeah so I mean, i'm just answering you know so i'm saying i'm not a historian in a disciplinary sense so most of your listeners who are not academics or not in a university would say that what is vinay talking about he is right? a historian right he's writing yeah, history yeah he's writing history he's writing you know he's writing about the past like narsimha rao existed in the past he's writing about the past right but the reason i'm pushing back is that over time the discipline of history across the world and the discipline of political science have moved in that history is considered firmly in the humanities along with anthropology comparative literature english etc and political science has moved closer to social science like economics social science one is of course the use of data and numbers right but that's not the only thing i mean i would say in political science the big difference is that our focus is on causality causal mechanisms causal influence why did something happen historians will say look you can't put a finger on it there are multiple reasons for why it happened right whereas i am interested that's very much my training you know and as i said um uh historians the main method they use is archives right they u- don't use survey data for example historians don't do that they don't do interviews no i don't do survey data but i do a ton of interviews which is some you know or what we now fashionably call oral history but that's what journalists have been doing for 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 a very long time right so it's just a i mean again if you're i'm answering this presuming that at least 1% of your listenership are academics to to make that distinction but if you're not an academic it's not a it's not a substantive difference it's basically a disciplinary difference you know so when you talk about methodology you know and a lot of it is based on interviews now th- it seems to me that it must be especially tricky 
to write books like what you've done i was about to say history but uh, <laughs> you know, i'll just say to to uh, write the two sort of biographies that you've done uh, right. at least in the narsimha rao book to a certain extent it's not exactly a biography biography but it encompasses elements of that that one when you're writing about events from a historical perspective but that still that you know many of the characters are alive and kicking and interested in how the world will view them or how the world will view events and all of that there then comes a trap of how much do you rely on interviews and how much do you rely on oral history from people who were participants and who will want to push one side of the story now what you've done scrupulously in both books is that wherever there are multiple versions of something you've pointed out what those multiple versions uh, uh, sort of are you know uh, but you know how careful do you then have to be like when you're covering a particular event do you then tell yourself that if this is likely to be something that is contentious i should get a larger sample size of people to speak to from different points of view how how do you how do you handle that academics wrestle with this question a lot this is that when it comes to interviews this is the all the problems that you listed but reporters do it on an everyday basis and they have found a solution right you have good reporters you have bad reporters any story you do right any story you do a reporter will speak to various interested participants by definition because the interested participants are also the sources right and then the question is the question you just asked which is how do you balance the fact that the source has an interest in the story and is spinning something to do right and this is what the skill of a reporter is which is you get the source to speak but you're very very cognizant that the reporter comes from a the the, the source comes from a certain position so one way to do it is to try to balance it search for the other side so that at least you have multiple voices there right two is do a preliminary fact check for the source is the source you know lying you know is the source reliable um and ultimately look this comes down to human judgment right why is bob woodward bob, bob woodward right same issues all the people he he interviews have in, you know when he interviews trump trump has an interest in trump right now how do you you know how, so how do you balance it out and so i found myself amit in answering this question not relying on academia i think for historical sources uh, like archives and for uh, secondary sources and for research design academia was excellent my phd training helped me it didn't help me for interviews i had to go back to my indian express days um, i was actually a, not a great reporter i was an edit you know an editor copy editor pretending to be a reporter but i knew tons of high quality reporters how do you do that how do you answer the questions that you just asked me right and i think this is what it is that if you if you find it's a a contentious issue get multiple points of view right you know but you shouldn't you know strive for balance when there is none you know you shouldn't say you know some you know x believe that you know the uh, final solution happened y believed it didn't happen that's ridiculous there are facts in the middle so do your own research right and frankly amit i found that doing my own research was hugely helpful when i interviewed people right so for example when i interviewed manmohan singh for the narsimha rao book i had done enough research you know i read some of the things he had written some of his reviews from the 70s etc etc when i was asking him questions and i could see that he was impressed and and that was important for me because i was in my early 30s and here i was you know interviewing an ex prime minister about economics right and about liberalization and i have to prepare because that's when they take me seriously right but preparing also means that i can call out when somebody is saying something that is factually untrue um the third thing is what you said that when you have a very contentious issue rely on multiple people when you have like a like for example suppose you know what manmohan singh was wearing at a particular point of time or what narsimha rao was wearing or what was narsimha rao's health i'm happy only relying on his doctor because it's relatively uncontentious now this requires human judgment there's just no way to run away from that right and at some level i am asking the reader to trust me but what i'm trying to do while asking the reader to trust me is also to be as transparent as i possibly can in most cases tell them the sources right give the page number if i'm using a book or an article so that they can read it themselves right and i realized amit that you know all of this which is the process by which you get interviews the process by which you look at documents is all about building trust with the reader right and readers know that immediately i'm sure you you know you have the same experience with your podcast listeners very quickly they know 
whether you're lying to them or not, whether you're selling them something or not, right? And that changes who you are. You know, you're very careful in asking questions to your your own interviewees because you know that the podcast listener is trusting you, right? Uh, and I was very conscious of that burden that, you know, I was, you know, in some sense, I felt I was an agent of the reader. And, you know, when I was interviewing Manmohan Singh or anybody or Nasima Rao's doctor or his cook, I was there on behalf of the reader, right? And as I said, a lot of this I learned from reporting rather than academia. So just thinking aloud, I think the one difference between what I do and what you do is that a podcast, essentially a conversation like this, is a work in progress. It's not finely edited. A lot of the stuff is just thinking aloud and so on and so forth. So my listeners, because of the intimacy of the medium, they'll know that I'm acting in good faith, that I'm making the best honest effort I, I can. But am I always right? Or will I always say something today that, uh, you know, that I will agree with tomorrow also? No, I mean, I've changed my mind uh, on the show. No, but it's a on various with me, different Amit. dimensions. Um, uh, you have to come up with a finished product. That's what uh, they say. But yes, maybe more finished because I have the luxury of doing many edits. Right. And I, I you hardly edit you can't, this. You, yeah. uh, you can't rewrite, right? You can edit, but you can't rewrite. Right? Exactly. But, you know, the, the issue remains the same, which is, you know, I look back at the books and I've made mistakes, you know. Like each book has, you know, more than thousand, you know, I would say, I mean, I, I'm just flipping maybe 2000 footnotes each roughly, right? Some of them are er erroneous, right? I, you know, in later editions, I've made an attempt to change. Sometimes somebody, you know, something as simple as the spelling of a person, I've, I've sometimes got it wrong. I try to change it, right? Readers are okay with that, right? Saying that, look, on margin, you make a product like this, some errors are inevitable as long as you're honest and you self-correct and the error is not massive. It's okay, Right? It's like a relationship, yeah? No relationship is perfect. You know, husband and wife are constantly fighting. Both are imperfect. The relationship with the reader and the writer also presumes that the writer is imperfect. And by the way, I also presume the reader is imperfect, yeah? Which is why I, I take so much effort to make the bitter medicine in the book palatable to the reader by putting some honey. Because I know that, you know, the reader is saying, Main Facebook, mein kya ho hai, WhatsApp, mein kya ho hai. I have to constantly bring the reader from that to focus on the book, right? So it's, like, it's a relationship like anything else. Elaborate on that with a concrete example, like what is a bitter medicine? What is a honey? So the bitter medicine is the facts of the book, right? So to give you an example in the Narsimha Rao book, I have two chapters on Narsimha Rao's economics, right? The economic liberalization reform. Now, other than Amit Verma and economists, everybody else finds this instinctively boring. What is fiscal deficit? What is monetary deficit? What is fiscal policy? Monetary policy is something that is sleep inducing. This is a fact. I'm not blind to that, right? I would have loved to be in a world in which readers love it with as much passion as I do. I know they don't, which is why I began that chapter with gold leaving South Bombay, right? From the RBI headquarters and going to Sahar airport and being loaded, you know, and in being doing that, India is, you know, is uh, selling, is pawning its family silver. Why do I do that visual, right? I do that visual because that's the honey, right? Which is entrapping the reader to read the rest of the book, right? Or the next chapter, which is the Nasimha Rao's economics from 92 to 96, where he, you know, where he plays the middle overs, not just as an opening batsman. I begin by talking about Chanakya and Chanakya's various ways in which the king should deal with enemies, right? Samadana, Bheda, Danda, etc, etc. Why do I do that, right? It's to basically give the honey, right? That entraps, you know, or that makes it palatable to read about, you know, Jet Airways opening or this, op you know, or, you know, licenses to banks, etc, etc, which I know that the reader may not like. And look, in doing so, it's like anything else. It's any other relationship, Amit. You've had this conversation with me, right? Now, imagine a friend of yours who has no interest in your podcast, right? I hope you have some like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to explain this conversation or this book on Nassim Rao to them. You in your mind are want to be honest to the book, but at the same time, you know that your friend's attention is limited and you want to pick out something juicy to tell the friend to capture the friend's attention so that they get the core argument what you're trying to say, right? It's no different. You know, I, I, for me, it's like a grandmother text test or my, you know, I, I, I have a daughter, a daughter test. Can you tell the story to capture their attention? That doesn't mean you lie. That doesn't mean you needlessly simplify, but it's incumbent on you to make it interesting to somebody who, you know, who for whom it's not otherwise interesting. 
Yeah, that's well said. And, and speaking speaking of friends who don't listen to the podcast, that's almost all of them in the sense that for a long time I did not know the kind of following this podcast have because none of my friends listen to podcasts at all, leave alone mine. So you know, it, it it's only serendipitously that in the last couple of years, I it kind of hit me that uh, the the show does mean a lot to many people, and some of them are now my friends. So, <laughs> but I have I have retained the friends uh, who don't listen to podcasts. And just think back if you can just tell me. I know this is. is the other way but you know think of a book you recently read right uh, and you know to a friend who doesn't read books you want to tell wow i i really had a good time how do you do it I told you about wanting by Luke Burgess a little while back. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I even uh, sort of ironically made you want to read the book yes. because of uh, you know mimetically, which is what the book is about. Yes, but you know how you did it? You did it by saying there's something called thick and thin description. look back into your life yeah, namely my head, life yeah, and what part is thick and thin and you know what the most interesting thing to anybody is that person yeah, yeah. you got to make it relatable you made it relatable you got to make that's it that's the honey yeah that's a honey and and what you say about economics being boring for most people is sadly true which is why you know the most famous hayek in the world sadly is salma hayek and not <laughs> frederick hayek so uh, what are you going to do about no, that no but it's your job to change that it's my job to ch- or I, at I, least to move the needle a little bit towards you know the one hayek over the other hayek right no no I totally do that to the extent that there might be friends who you know see me coming and say oh no he's going to talk about Hayek again but uh so here's the next question I would imagine that when you start writing the book you have a broad sense of a frame of what the book is you know That's the questions right. that you're asking That's right. uh, and you you may not know the exact answers and then you get into the book and then structure reveals itself and so on and it begins to form now what happens here is that on the one extreme you can have the approach that you just know the conclusion you want to reach and once you've got enough facts to kind of make a case for that you end the book uh, which is which you've completely avoided obviously uh, and there's far more rigor and depth in that the other approach which you're closer to but which you also kind of avoided is that you just go endlessly into rabbit holes forever like one of my favorite biographers is robert caro you of must course, have read him of course lyndon johnson man. yeah and even before the lyndon johnson like in the mid 60s i read power broker is that the one you're talking the about the masterpiece Yeah. yeah so in the mid 60s he started writing a book called the power broker which uh, he thought he'd write in a year yeah. it took him 8 9 years and it's a masterpiece it's uh, i think it's a it's a million words and was cut down to 900000 and the 100000 i think it's 1200 pages right something yeah, like that yeah it's huge on robert and moses yeah on robert moses and it's not just a biography of moses uh, as a a person therefore a, you know a biography it's also a study of power and what power does to human that's beings right. That's right. and therefore a work of political science and it's also the biography of a city the city of, of new, new york, york yeah. and it works at so many different levels and after that he in the late 70s he began this biography of uh, lyndon johnson which is supposed to be five volumes four are out he's in his 70s at some point hopefully the fifth will be out but like 40 years have gone by 45 years have gone by and in fact it took him longer to write the fourth volume uh than it took uh, Lyndon Johnson to live nah. you know the, the periods that are That's being described right. there so incredibly meticulous and just yeah. you know uh, remarkable and thank god he exists yeah. but everybody can't afford to be like that yeah. so how do you like kind of find that balance that it must be so seductive certainly it would be for me like so often when i read a book like yours in fact you know i'll find myself going to the footnotes and then i'll just enter rabbit holes and that just goes on and on when you're actually writing you're doing the research how how do you get yourself to a point where you say that this is enough i have got it i move on to the next thing a very good question right so to um by the way somebody you must interview is patrick french have you i haven't yet so patrick that. french has written the best biography i've read of anyone which is a biography of vs naipaul called the world is what it is so i find it the best biography it's a, and it's astonishingly deeply critical of naipaul yet an authorized biography it's unbelievable how he pulled it off and he gave me this advice he said look some version of perfection is the enemy of production right so when should you stop research and start writing and he said you sh- you know you'll always have four books you should read three people you should interview two archives you should go to uh, before you start writing right so don't don't stop D- don't 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 wait stop and write and leave things blank 
right so i've i've learned that which is that research and writing is not a linear process it's an iterative process so you do some research and then you start writing and you leave blanks and then you go for one other step of research where your job is only to fill the blanks up right because otherwise you're waiting for this mythic sense of completion before you begin to write and that's a mythic sense and frankly i learned that while doing a phd in the wrong way i think i wasted an entire year looking for something that was a delta 10% right so the question is the following that you keep doing research right at some point you have to say that look if i spend another one year doing research it's only going to improve the book 5% that's when you should stop so when you're on 80% or 90% there you should stop and start writing and then use the research phase post starting the writing to actually do a little more focused research right i don't know whether that that makes sense because too many people i know especially those who do phds or writing books are like you know they're spending years and years and years yaar ek aur book mujhe padhni hai ek aur ye kitab padhni hai ek aur ye it's wrong you know so you should stop when you're even 70% and you should start writing and leave holes and then do a second round of research on the larger question that you asked on you know structure how do i go about the book i am quite a structured guy right so for both the books there were historical there was a historical fact element nasimar was born a certain time died a certain time so what i did was for both of them i had done about a years of general soaking and poking not focused research generally should i do the book what should it be about nasimar book of course start to finish took a year but i'm saying for the second book right very early on in the process i wrote a mock table of contents right saying that it'll be a 350 page book there'll be an introduction there'll be a conclusion and then there are 30 page chapters and i think ram told me that don't have chapters more than 20 to 25 pages it gets too boring right so if you have a 250 page book uh, you know you should have at least like 15 chapters you know so keep sh- small short chapters so very early on i write a mock table of contents and in both books i've realized that at the end when i look back at the original table of contents it was actually 50% there right once i write a table of contents right then every book and archive i'm writing i'm putting into one of the chapters and i also divide the chapters into sub chapters so when i'm ri- reading a book secondary literature which is meant for say my narsimara book or the bjp book i'm instinctively saying ah this is a nice paragraph you know what it should be in chapter 6 uh, section 4 so i write the ch6 section 4 and then i go back and i and, and in my uh, word document i say this is what you you have to do right and of course once you read what your table of contents is changes a little bit so you know one of my favorite phrases it's a unfortunate phrase is you should be prepared to kill your babies so if you have a great idea for a book early on and you have a great theory for your book early on while doing research you know that theory may be wrong you should be honest enough to change your view so don't be wedded to an original idea right you may have even spent a month doing research to realize actually that's a total waste right but be honest enough and make the changes so what happens is then i tinker with the chapters i change the headings i increase the size i move it up and down i do that but as i said even at the end 60% is what i began with right but it really helps in focused research because every time i'm doing research i'm telling myself acha maine isse baat ki hai you know i'm let's say i'm talking to nasima rao's cook as he's speaking i'm saying oh man that was a nice sentence that is chapter 6 section 2 oh man that's a nice section that was chapter 1 you know and and then i i you know as he's speaking i i i write down and then i immediately go and move it to that particular word document where it is which means that when i'm about to write right a 25 page chapter i have 40 pages of notes for those chapters broken up into sections and each section says where that primary material is right um so it that's you know everybody has their way of doing it this is my way of doing it the big con of this way of doing it which is a structured way is that i might very early get committed to an idea rather than inductively making your way through an idea right and so the one way to solve that is not to be too wedded to the original table of contents but that's the con so the but the pro of what i'm doing is you can finish things quickly and wastage is less so to put it differently uh, and tell me when i'm getting boring on this huh? because i can speak endlessly on this process um which is that when i was doing my phd i used to ask around ki yaar tumne itna research kiya hai to other people doing phd how much of that actually made it to your dissertation which is the same question as asking that anybody writing a book how much of the research you did made it to the actual book actual pages right and i found that for phd students it was you know 
30 to 40 percent can you believe it 60 percent is wasted 60 percent is you're going down rabbit holes that don't make it to the book now some of that is inevitable in a process where you're doing original work but my argument is can you make it from 30 to 40 percent to 60 to 70 percent you've doubled your productivity still there will be 30 percent wastage and that's what it means to do original work but it's not going to be 60 percent wastage was that too detailed an answer? No, I'm, it's a fantastic I'm answer. I'm hugely passionate about this stuff uh, and I want to spread the word. But, you know, I'm deeply aware that it may be too bitter a medicine without enough honey. No, no, it's a fantastic answer and you correctly spoke about the pros and the cons. And for listeners who are enjoying this, let me tell you that we spoke for almost at least 45 minutes about the writing process itself in our earlier episode. That's right. So they should kind of go and uh, listen to that. And Joan Didion once said, I don't know what I think until I write it down. So the process of writing as, uh, you know, part of a process of thinking about something, of, uh, you know, improving your own understanding of the material is something that... Um, uh, I, 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 I totally get and and what like fiction writers will often talk of an approach to structuring a novel as you know they'll talk of the architect and the gardener so the architect is someone who's making a map where this is a house this is a land it occupies these are all the rooms you do all of that and the gardener is just pottering around messing around with stuff and uh, there isn't a right or a wrong different approaches work for different people it kind of depends on who you are and I think in a sense what you're saying is that you're more of an architect and of course with Within each room, within each unit, you are still doing gardening. You are still leaving that space open. I'd but, say that's right. Yeah. But, but but I think that's okay as long as you're aware of the flaws of an of being an only an architect. And if your approach is a gardening approach, all power to you. But be aware that there are problems with, because then if you're gardening to you're gardening everywhere without knowing where the house layout is here. You know. Yeah, yeah. So when you started in the Narsimha Rao book, were you aware of the answer that you eventually arrived no, at? No, no. I knew the structure of the book. I kept pushing to say, why should I care? And you know, the answer I, I, you know, and for even for the new books I'm thinking about, I'm always asking this question, Amit. Which is why should someone who doesn't care one ounce about politics, who doesn't visit Bari Sons in Delhi, who doesn't listen to Seen and the Unseen, what should they get from this book, right? So is there something larger that Narsimha Rao's life could hold? But I didn't find an answer until I was midway. And the answer is one sentence was Narsimha Rao tells us, how do you bring about change without power? How do you first gather power and influence and then wield it? Because he didn't have a mandate. Right? He had only constraints. So under tremendous constraints, without power, how do you then bring about change? That's the central question. right? And the central answer was he did it because he knew how to be a lion, a fox and a mouse, which we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, um, I had so many people outside of politics, policy, the world of Amit Verma coming to me and telling me this book resonated with me. You know, startup founders would come and say, you know, people think that startup founders have all the power. I don't. I can't fire my design person, right? Uh, I want to come into the room and I think it's a lousy website, but I can't, I have to suck up to them. I have to like, you know, because there's shortage of labor, right? Um, I had, you know, a top bank, uh, a country head of a top bank, MNC, telling me, you know what, this book totally resonated with me because people think I'm the CEO or the MD of the, of the India version of MNC, but I have two people in London breathing down my neck and all my deputies in India are, are, are reporting to their line counterparts in London, not me. And so I have to first construct power. I don't have power given to me on a plate. I don't have a mandate given to me on a plate. I have to first construct that power and then use it to bring about change in my bank, right? Which is frankly the Narsimha Rao story, which is you don't, you know, it's so easy to say that if you have power and mandate, you should do ABCD to transform India. First, how do you get that power? How do you get that mandate? How do you make sure that you're operating within the constraints? Every person is dealt with a bunch of cards, right? Some of those cards are strong. Some of them are weak. It varies from person to person. But how do you play with the cards that you're given? Fabulous. And uh, so, you know, before we go for a break, after which we'll discuss uh, uh, sort of uh, your book on Narsimha Rao, quick final sort of questions about your personal journey. And I'm curious about your teaching. You know, what is teaching like for you? Do you enjoy it? And of course, you're teaching political science and not history. And <laughs> as you have been at pains to uh, point out, in fact, the title of the episode could be Vinesi Tapati, political scientist, not Vinesi historian. Vinesi is not a historian. Not historian. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, no, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. 
that to you. But uh, uh, so what is sort of teaching like and what does it mean to teach in a place like uh, Ashoka, for example, because I've heard very good things about the place. And uh, I've had many episodes with different uh, uh, people right. who faculty teach, members, with yeah. different faculty members of Ashoka. I've heard some of that. At yeah. the same time, I've heard complaints from people saying, oh, Ashoka is becoming so woke and so this and so yeah. that. So w w what is it like uh, teaching young people, um, uh, you know, and um, how much does that change the person you are and the writer you are, the act of teaching? Because just as the act of writing makes you a better thinker, yeah. I would imagine that the act of teaching makes you, you know, much more knowledgeable about the subject you're teaching because after all, you have to explain it to, to Naniji and to dozens of curious teenagers yeah. who are challenging you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So first off, again, I'm addressing to the non-academics who are he hearing this. Most people who do PhDs and, wa and want to be an academic don't do this for teaching, right? Nobody says, I have to do PhD because I have to teach my <laughs> Nobody does that, right? Then you're a school teacher. If you're a university professor, you're, the main focus is research. It's not teaching. And I was under this illusion too, that look, I've done my PhD. I want to write my books. I want to do research. But for Roti, ke liye, I have to do some teaching because, you know, Teaching is a revenue center, right? Research is a cost center. So I have to, in a university, learn to teach. So I reluctantly said, look, let me do some teaching and let me be half decent at it. But Ashoka kids uh, make demands, right? They work hard. They expect you to work hard. And it has been transformative. I've grown to love teaching, right? My student evaluations are good. Uh, I don't think students like me very much. I think they respect me, right? I, I try to be a tough teacher. Um, what I try when I teach is to tell students that, look, I'm not going to waste your time by massaging your ego. You know, your parents have paid good money to come here. Ashoka is an expensive education. And instead, I'm going to try to add value to this, to you. So that at the end of this course, you said, okay, I, you know, paisa vasool to hua hai. And what does that look like? It doesn't look like pandering, right? But I'm going to tell you a bunch of things. I'm also going to sort of focus on a ways to think about things. So... I've grown to like it and I've grown to enjoy it hugely. I just spent a semester as a visiting uh, associate professor at Princeton, teaching Princeton undergrads on Indian politics. I like that too. It's a totally different cultural context. It has certainly helped my research in the sense that it has allowed me to ask questions and demand answers that non-students will not have the guts to ask. You know, one of the beauties of being a 17 or 18 year old and let me give you this example. When I was at Harvard Law School, I attended a talk where Amartya Sen was speaking. And after he finished during the question answers, some undergrad got up and said, Professor Sen, I don't think you understand the concept of supply and demand. And he went <laughs> on, right? And you know what? When he finished, there was some giggling in the back of the audience, but you know, Amartya Sen didn't giggle and he answered the question, right? That's powerful because sometimes you ask foolish supply and demand questions, but sometimes 17, 18 year olds ask the nub of the questions, right? And I think in the um, in the New Testament, if my memory serves, there's a line from the Cornethian called to be a fool for the sake of Christ, right? Say foolish things, say stupid things because out of those four, five, one will be a brilliant idea. And undergrads really exemplify that. You know, they will often ask, you know, we, you know, something about the BJP or something about Narsimha Rao that is the correct question to ask, but everybody else is too afraid to ask it because it sounds simple, right? So undergrads really push you on that. So, you know, um, the BJP book, for example, um, before I wrote it, I took a course called Right Wing Politics in India and Right Wing Politics more generally, where I was looking at other political parties also like AKP in Turkey, Likud in Israel, uh, Christian, uh, Christian Democrats in Europe, who are also kind of center-right parties to kind of nestle the BJP story. Very, very helpful, you know. So I've, you know, the teaching has been something that um, is not something that I imagined I would like, but I like it and it gives me a lot of joy and frankly, it helps my work. And there's a last thing, Amit, which is the researchers, right? And people of the mind like you. One of the things we suffer a lot is loneliness because, you know, you're, you know, who, you know, it's not a, in, in, in an odd way, thinking is not a group activity. It's a solitary, solitary pursuit. And if you're sitting in some library or you're reading up, you know, when you're reading a book in preparing, preparing for this, it's a lonely activity. You know, now if you want to put a spin on it, you call it solitude. So which is why for the world of research, the world of teaching is great because, you know, you're as a researcher, you're selfish, you know, self-motivated. 
as a teacher you have to give more than you take right and if a student you know shows you to be foolish i actually enjoy it it means that the, you know i've trained my student to be smarter than me right it also keeps you grounded amit i remember that you know i had gone for an interview with uh, dr manmohan singh soon after he uh, he uh, stepped down as prime minister for the nasimara book and he was you know elegance personified you know he spoke to me he sat on the same ch- you know sofa that i did was reading he saw me off you know he was in advance years he saw me off outside you know outside his house to the car and then i went from there to ashoka university right and as it was a first or second day of class and as i was entering in the mess there was a bunch of students you know in a circle and they didn't know who i was so i overheard them and one of them says you know my teacher's name is sitapati and the other kid shouted are he should have been called ram and then all of them laughed right <laughs> uh, and uh, it brought me down to earth immediately right and for all the criticisms you have of cocky 17 18 19 year olds um they have the ability to bring you to earth very quickly <laughs> that's such a fantastic story about how you end up being called ram and ram guha will be wondering at this and thinking that is there some <laughs> place sitapati, where sitapati right husband yeah, of sita he would be sitapati guha <laughs> somewhere <laughs> else does being a tenured professor yeah. change your perception of time and how quickly you need to do things and so on and so forth because i would imagine if you're a salaried person writing a book on the side yeah. it's one kind of project that's right if you are um, you know just a freelancer or or a journalist writing a book on the side yeah. it's another kind of project if you're a professor you know you've got more time yes. like you mentioned in your job you get 5 months of the year when yes. you can do whatever you want yes. right so how does that then play into um the kind of books that you want yeah. to write or that you think about yeah no it's look it's an enormous luxury enormous right like as i said i have no illusions that academia are the smartest people on earth i certainly don't think academics are the most curious people on earth right like most you know a lot of people outside of academia many of them listening to your podcast are more curious than academics maybe smarter than most academics it's just that they have a regular job and they want to earn and they want to you know uh, support their family and these are all honorable things to do right i'm deeply aware of that privilege right which is why i'm like you know if i you know if i'm not working on a book or an article i'm like yaar agar main nahi kar sakta hu to kon karega who should be you know because i i've got a struck sure i've got time i've got you know for for this kind of thing all power to those who hold regular jobs and who want to write you know this you know I, i read a book on panipat uh, written amateur book on pani i mean not amateur book it's a very good book but it's a uh, historical book on panipat written by a eye doctor who's doing this on the side all power to him you know uh i wish there were mechanisms in which people like that who are outside academia formally but who are brighter than most academics and more important more curious and harder working than most academics who are able to engage with academia academics can read the early drafts give back feedback i hope that there's a mechanism in which the synergy happens um because i am very very aware that i'm i'm far luckier than they are and those you know the I'm, and i don't use the word amateur in a negative way at all i would just mean that non academic historians or non academic writers i am deeply aware of how passionate they must be because they are fighting the demons at home the demons at work and yet producing Yeah, I mean, even Narsimha Rao finally finished his book in That's his own right. age. That's right. That's yeah. right. So right. let's let's go. take a quick commercial break, and then we'll get to uh, the crux of the matter, which is uh, life and times of Narsimha Rao. Thank you. Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've taught 20 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing. An online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, a lovely and lively community at the end of it. The course costs rupees 10,000 per GST or about one fifty dollars, and is a monthly thing. So if you're interested, head on over to register at IndiaUncut.com/clearwriting. That's IndiaUncut.com/clearwriting. Being a good writer doesn't require God-given talent; just the willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. 
वेलकम बैक टू द सीन इन द अनसीन आई एम चैटिंग विद विनय सीतापति ऑन हिज एक्सेलेंट बुक हाफ लायन ऑन पी वी नरसिम्हा राव वन फाइनल मेटर क्वेश्चन बिफोर वी एक्चुअली गेट टू द बुक इट सेल्फ एंड टू नरसिम्हा राव इट सेल्फ डैट आउट ऑफ ऑल द पॉसिबल सब्जेक्ट्स डैट यू कुड हैव पिक्ड यू नो वाई दिस स्पेसिफिक सब्जेक्ट यू ऑलरेडी स्पोकन अबाउट हाउ यू वंडर्ड वुड दिस बी इंटरेस्टिंग टू पीपल एंड सो वन एंड सो फोर्थ एंड आई अग्रीड विद यू डैट इट्स 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 अ क्रूशल पीरियड ऑफ आर हिस्ट्री बट वाई narsimha rao itself and uh, what did you think at the first was a core question behind uh, the book because one of the core questions that you've articulated is understanding how narsimha rao achieved so much despite having so little power but at the start of this did you have a sense of how little power he actually had no i didn't i actually didn't know much more about narsimha rao than what was there in the wikipedia entry and in that sense it was actually quite lucky because i didn't come in with baggage i didn't come in with having to prove that i want to give narsimha rao his you know his space in the spotlight i didn't have any of that i'm not telugu you know i have you know no particular interest in narsimha rao's like legacy you know in any personal sense but as i told you right in the beginning of this uh, conversation you know my own family's fortunes and lives have changed in the early 90s and i intuitively knew that the early 90s was a period of change in india and while i was doing my PhD at Princeton I had even organized a, a co-organized a conference called the um the political consequences of economic growth saying that when you have economic growth in the 90s jump start what are the political consequences and we had a panel there saying what are the political predeterminants of economic growth so what are the kind of politics you need for economic growth so i was thinking a little bit at that time about look what were the political conditions and nasimara of course was prime minister in the early 90s when liberalization happened and then i read a book which transformed me which was a book by ezra vogel who's i think a yale historian on deng xiaoping and it was called deng xiaoping and the transformation of china and it was a two biographies it was a biography of china changing in the 80s and it was a parallel biography of deng xiaoping who was instrumental in that change and i finished reading that book and i said you know a book like this needs to be written about india and it's about india changing in the 90s and the deng xiaoping figure was this man called narsimha rao who i didn't know much about but that's what piqued my interest because even then and maybe as a political scientist i was like look change in india doesn't happen because of a blueprint or because of ideas or because of a technocrat there also needs to be a political will how did that political story unfold and so that pushed me to narsimha rao i still didn't know much and then um i was did some background research i read up the secondary literature on the debates on foreign policy changing in the 90s economic policy welfare schemes and i said ah it's not just that the first mcdonalds came in the early 90s a lot else changed in india and then i was lucky enough uh, you know by talking to people one of them introduced me to um, to narsimha rao's son prabhakar rao and i went all the way to hyderabad to visit him and and i was as i was going to visit him i just thought you know i was going to hyderabad hometown of narsimha rao everybody would know who he is and i got into this cab from the airport and i was driving to narsimha rao's son's house uh for the first time and i asked the cab driver have you heard of nasima rao and the guy thought for a second and said yeah he's the guy on whom the flyover is named and so nobody knew about him even in his hometown that was a catastrophe right and so i met prabhakar rao and we got chatting and then i met him a couple of times i met somebody else others in his family and then he told me look vinay i've spoken to other members of my family we've decided to trust you until then he was still kg come with me and i went with him to his um a, the in his office i went to a attic of his office where there were about 45 cartons and he said you can access it right wow. if if there's anything sensitive i trust that you'll run it through me uh, but otherwise you can access it and i told myself at that time itself that i'm so lucky to have to deal with an air who's not like breathing down my neck and not trying to you know uh, censor everything i'm i'm doing and then as i began to access the papers i was mind blown i was like this has never happened to any politician in india you know narsimha rao we had government documents with file notings on the left um, there were narsimha rao's private diaries even his books in various languages marathi hindi english i opened it and i could see his notings right and so you had you know his letters right he narsimha rao was a was a fan of computers so on a dot matrix printer he used to print out his diary he used to 
write down his diary so for example when uh, rajiv gandhi denies him a ticket in april 91 to contest the lok sabha elections in and so he is forced to retire he writes that this is one of the saddest days of my life so you have that level of intimacy right or another noting so the day after rajiv has been murdered by the ltt and his body has been brought to 10 janpath and all the congressmen are hovering around the body pretending to cry but actually maneuvering to see who will succeed him and nasima rao as he is there pranam mukherjee sides by nasima rao and said look you should be the heir you should be the next person and nasima rao writes in his diary i kept quiet saying it shouldn't be me it should be nd tiwari knowing full well that nd tiwari was unacceptable because i knew the kind of person pranam mukherjee is right think about it right he you know you're getting that level of detail so you know i'll be honest with you amit the book success is primarily because i got you know i you know I, I got my hands on this incredible resource, which is the private archives of Nasima Rao. I, of course, did about a hundred interviews to supplement it, but it's really those private archives. You know, if I had blown this up, I, you know, it it would have been unforgivable because after being given this kind of access, um, you know, it would have been unforgivable had it been a bad book. That's such a fantastic story, and uh, you know. I- I love the way you write about his early years as well like uh, for example um, uh, early on in your book you write quote living on the edge of five linguistic cultures villagers here spoke telugu hindi marathi kannada and even some oriya and in this the land of the nizam the language of power was urdu while the language of courtly life was persian narsimha rao would go on to speak 10 languages these were the tongues he inherited at birth and you know he taught himself tamil as you mentioned at a later point in the book because he went to some felicitation of his Tamil Nadu and couldn't understand what was being said. So uh, you know he learned three computer languages when he was in his sixties. You know when Rajiv Gandhi was saying that you know we need to enter the computer age or such like right. and our older politicians can't do it. And he That's called right. up his son and said, "Send me a computer." That's right. And before you know it, not just send me a computer. He's not doing Google search. He's programming in three languages. Yeah, COBOL, BASIC, and then you could write code in Unix. And here's sort of my question: He's born in June twenty ninth, nineteen twenty one, in in this village called Wangara, uh, and this is twenty six years before India becomes independent, right? This is you know at to think that till the age of 26 his conception of india was not what our conception of india is his conception of society was not what our conception kind of is most of the people around him were semi literate you speak about at one point when he's growing up his father realizes that this little boy of mine already knows more than the village teacher so he has to be sent to another village where he is all alone at the age of 7 right. just for education that's right and in a sense i can imagine that 7 year old saying to himself what you said to yourself when you got his papers that i can't waste this opportunity yeah and a 7 year old must be thinking the same thing so it's not as if you are figuring out thick desires and thin desires or you know what does a kid want the kid has an opportunity it is the only opportunity he's got to get the job done and that's kind of where he is and as a person writing about history i'm being very careful not to use the word historian you will note as <laughs> as a person telling stories about the past do you make that mental effort of forgetting everything that we know now and just putting yourself in the shoes of that little boy and tracing the journey that he is taking yeah i try to do that you know um it's hard right because i'm also keenly aware of the context and i think that's also important so to give you one example Nasima was a bright kid, right? And that's his all him. I mean, I don't want to sound rude here, but the rest of his family are no patch on him. And as I mentioned, there it was a wealthy family. They were um, in- revenue intermediaries for the Nizam, but um, it was not an educated family, right? And part of that reason is structural, which you should know, which is that in Nizam's Hyderabad state, uh, most of the uh, officials. and bureaucrats were muslim so for a hindu uh, um uh, like narsimha rao the family there was no particular government service at the end of education so why you know you know why take to education right you need to know this right but you also need to know that that he is a bright man so there is both going together so you have to have the internal world of narsimha rao he is a man who has a felicity for languages but you should also know that he comes from a part of india which is kind of you know northern telangana right very very close to the maharashtra border where within a few hours you could find people who spoke kannada 
who spoke odia who spoke marathi and of course who spoke telugu right and that matters because when i went to his village vangara uh there were people there who knew a smattering of kannada who knew some odia who knew marathi so both matter right so this, you know, as a biographer i can't only look at the internal world of narsimha rao kind of the triumph of the will here is this bright man beating the odds because the odds are determined by the circumstance and that is a larger theme that you know for runs through this book which is this tension between structure and agency i got to focus on narsimha rao but i got to look at the cards handed to him and the cards handed to him on language were actually a good set of cards because he was in the geographic absolute center of 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 india very close to nagpur but still in telangana in what is today's telangana and so he had access to all these languages but you know what he he played those cards very well so i mentioned that between 77 and 1980 when the moraji government is in power the congress is out of power narsimha rao is general secretary in delhi and has very little to do so you know what what he does he goes to jnu and enrolls in a spanish language class and learns spanish right and he drives his own car parks his car in jawaharlal nehru university and learns spanish right nobody else in his village does that and that's a good example of how agency and structure both matter in understanding narsimha rao does that make sense amit that makes a lot of sense and i'm also sort of like i sometimes wonder that at one level we are creatures of circumstance like we discussed earlier you know combination of your genes and the things that happen to you and the life that you have and like you said the structure and in many ways you could say structure even determines the agency to some extent but uh, they're but, separate you hmm. know they're separate like as i said right that you know there are lots of people who speak lang- many languages exactly, in asmara village all... nobody spoke 10 yeah, yeah you know so that yeah. so, so 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 and i don't want to I, see the marxists reduce all possible agency to structure yeah yeah right is, i don't want to do that yeah. you know whereas hollywood re- reduces all structure to agency you know yeah, i don't yeah. do that either so uh, but the question i was coming at is this that one view is that we are creatures of circumstance to a large extent the other view is that there is nevertheless something essential about people that survives through them like when i look back on myself as a young person on the one hand i don't know how anyone could have been friends with me when i was 20 because i was an absolute asshole right and hopefully one has changed and one, uh, i i would think i've changed enough to almost be a different person but at the same time there are some essential things right. that remain like if you go on right. facebook and you look at your school friends right and you might notice that they're all pretty much the same right. you know they might be chubby or they might look completely yeah. different but the characteristics yeah. are basically the same yeah. and in trying to get to the essential in narsimha rao i was struck by this paragraph you wrote about that separation at 7 when you wrote quote the separation of 7 year old rao from his family would haunt him for the rest of his life shaken from the settled rhythms that centuries of cultivation had given his family he was now on his own visiting his parents only once every 5 months education would propel rao from village to town to city into politics and into power it would make him prime minister of india but it would also cut him off from clan and community it would make him remote squirreled away among ideas and words from which he could never be sent away he would develop a distant relationship with his children children a beleaguered one with his elder son ranga stop quote and uh, about his marriage uh, married at 10 and the, he resented that marriage and he resented that that lasted 40 years but he was at a distance from it most of the time he was somewhere else he had other uh, fulfilling relationships as you uh, point out and everybody involved kind of goes through the motions that's right and and that sense of him always being a perennial outsider the, yes. you know sort of disaffected never having close confidants or at least That's not right. uh, not a multiplicity of them not having someone whom he could think of as his clan or his community perhaps that's, right. that's a sense he gets that that's right he's a loner this is a path he's on he's maneuvering his way through it and eventually history places him at this point in time and he does what he ha- has to do like so when you read his papers is you know that's one sense and am i correct in thinking that this seems essential to me this para seems essential to me apart from that what else do you sense about him like we have spoken of his sort of almost fatalistic tendency to uh, accept the cards given to him and then do whatever is rational yeah. whether it is in the wildness of not acting before the 84 riots right. or whether it is in uh, the enormous will that he did show uh, in uh, 91 when he took over with the country in a mess and acted to kind of resolve it so if you had to say give an elevator speech description of narsimha rao the person you know uh, to someone who doesn't know anything about him a man from mars what w- what would you say 
So I would say that the description you gave of an introvert, lonely introvert, is is a core feature, but it's half the story. The other half is that he's curious and action oriented. So he has a bit of Hamlet, which is what you just described, and he has a bit of Don Quixote, <laughs> which is an actor, right? So you know the, the the sort of I think it was Dostoevsky, but I could be wrong. Who said that the two great Western fictional figures is Hamlet and Don Quixote, one who thinks but doesn't act, and the other who acts without thinking. And Nasimara exemplified both, and I think that's important because what you just described and the paragraph you just read gives gives rise to an introvert who loves books, who is a theoretician. And that is a well-known feature of Nasima Rao, right? It, even a negative feature, the joke about him is analysis until uh, paralysis, that he used to pout without spouting, right? And that gives rise to kind of the stereotype of a distant intellectual who is like Nero, you know, when the Rome is burning. And that's absolutely not true. That's half the story. The other half is he was curious. Uh, he was action oriented. You know, I spent some time talking about how he brings about agricultural reforms in his own village, how he makes modification to the cotton plant to push people from growing rice. You get less money from rice into growing cotton. He goes to Gujarat, he gets the cotton seed. How as Prime Minister of India, I give so many examples of how he's rolling his leaves and is at the center of economic reforms. He's not just a theoretician in the background. His genius was that to pretend to be a theoretician so that he did not get the blame for liberalization, right? But the heart of the book is to show you the other end of the or, or the reverse of the para that you quoted, that here was an action-oriented, curious guy who knew how to get the job done, right? And so the duality of Narsimha Rao, which is why the title of the book is Half Lion, is that he was half a thinker, but he was half a doer. And at his best, this synergy between an intellectual with deep analytical skills and a man who understood every inch of the state and how to bring about transformation in India is a central feature of the man. So he had a bit the best of Don Quixote and the best of Hamlet, right? I would say that duality at its best gives rise to Narsimha Rao. And that is really the central feature of this book. If he was only a thinker, he would not have been able to transform India. And if he was a doer, he wouldn't know what to transform and how to go about it. This is such a fascinating way to think about the man. And, you know, just thinking of your book, for example, his period as chief minister, I think he was more Don Quixote than That's Hamlet. Right. That's acting exactly without, right. Uh, That's exactly sort of thinking right. And we'll sort of uh, get to that. Now, here's my other question. And a key way in which, say, Narsimha Rao is different from so many people before and after him in Indian politics. You know, I'd once written a column on uh, Narendra Modi based on something a friend of his told me. This person was friendly with him in um, the Aughties. She worked with him in Gujarat. And uh, she described how she was once uh, at his home and it was a gathering of personal friends and people he knew personally. And uh, Mr. Modi started telling a story about how his mother had been very ill once. And he went to switch on the fan and he switched it on and the fan didn't turn on because there was no electricity. City. And, and as he said, uh, narrated the story, he started crying. And my friend's point in telling me the story about uh, Modi was that he is an experiential prime minister, what I would call an Akhodeki prime minister, an Akhodeki politician. So when he comes to power in Gujarat as chief minister, what are his priorities? It's electricity because he's That's experienced right. it himself. Yeah. It's roads because he's walked on them, he's That's experienced right. it himself. But his great failing as a prime minister is that uh, his knowledge is limited to that. He is not expanding his knowledge and there are some concepts That's which right. are beyond experience. Uh, spont right. uh, spontaneous order, positive sum game, so on and so forth. And that becomes his failing because then he cannot possibly get a handle on the economy or on the larger currents in society and so on. And the point of my column was read more because we form pictures of the world by joining dots. Our experience only gives us so many dots. You have to read more. You can't blame Modi for not being a reader as a kid because circumstances, humble background, not his fault at all. But then what you should do is try to cultivate a reading habit and at least surround yourself with experts, people who know and, uh, you know, not try to imagine that your folksy instincts will be right in every particular. And it seems that Narsimha Rao is not just the opposite of this, but 
that is in fact an outlier among politicians in the sense that one of the threads that struck me through your book is how this guy is constantly reading 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 learning 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 even that example in his 60s he gets a computer he doesn't learn how to surf google uh, i mean there wasn't google then he learns three computer languages you've described in another incident that he goes to his village and there is some fancy machine which isn't working yeah. and he actually opens it up himself figures out yeah. that the steel is dry and that might be one reason the motor is yeah. not rotating yeah. and he has it lubricated That's with right. kerosene and the next day it works. That's right. So, and again, a man of action here and this is really a combination in a sense of the introspective Hamlet thinking about That's stuff right. and Don Quixote actually acting on it. Uh, this I find remarkable because I, you know, I can't think of other figures in Indian society. Definitely Nehru, obviously a very well-read man and also a man of action, but also a man closed in certain ways yeah. to reconsidering his yeah. priors. Yeah. Whereas Narsema Rao till the end of his life was always reconsidering his priors most notably for uh, liberalization because he was a socialist until then yeah. so uh, tell me about this sort of aspect of the man and how this played into what his trajectory was that like at one level it is a bunch of accidents which take him to the top at another level it is the fact that he wasn't tribal and therefore he was uh, uh, always a convenient compromise candidate whether when he became chief minister or prime minister or whatever but was this urge also uh, a big factor and does it not make doubly tragic that the elites of Delhi, uh, you know, look down on him almost as a country bumpkin kind yeah. of person, you know, yeah. you, there's a story where Rajiv Gandhi is sitting with a friend and Narsimha Rao, you know, just puts his foot on his lap and he's scratching his foot, which is like a common... His foot as in puts Narsimha Rao's foot. Yeah, he puts his, <laughs> his own, own foot, foot on his lap <laughs> and he's uh, scratching it as in fact, I'm practically doing yeah, now. My yeah, foot is on my lap as we yeah. speak right now on my green soul chair. Uh, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi's friend whispers in his ear and then with great disgust, you know, grabs a foot and puts it back down. That's right. And, you know, they're treating him like a country bumpkin, but they are the well-educated, English-speaking, sophisticated yeah. country bumpkins. And he's a man of learning and knowledge. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, that, that, that story is Rajiv Gandhi is, you know, sitting opposite Narsim Rao. And, you know, in the villages, sometimes you find somebody, people sitting cross-legged or with, with, with the foot you know, on your on your other thigh, and you're massaging your foot while talking. You know, in elite, in sort of urban settings, you don't do that. But Nasimara was doing that, and, and Rajiv Gandhi's friend whispers into Rajiv Gandhi, and then you know puts Nasimara's foot down, which is quite humiliating, right? Uh, but it it brings to a different sort of insecurity that Nasimara had, which is that he was a man of enormous learning, right? Yet it was a learning unmediated by the West. So he, you know, I think English was the fifth language he learned. So he was already a cosmopolitan, right? He goes to, uh, if my memory serves, he goes to the uh, abroad to the US for the first time only in 1952, right? To when uh, to visit his uh, uh, his daughter Saraswati, who's having her first child. He goes to New York, and that's a transformative experience. But you know, that's the first time he goes there. He was a accomplished translator from Marathi to Telugu from Hindi to Telugu. Um, he could campaign, you know, he, like in India, we know of people campaigning in two different constituencies. But when was the last time you heard of people campaigning simultaneously in Marathi and in Telugu, right? When when he was campaigning in Hanam Konda, because he contested two two seats, Hanam Konda and Ramtek. Ramtek is near Nagpur in Maharashtra. He's contesting in two languages. And then he contests later on in Bairampur in Odisha and campaigns in Odia, right? So here was a man under whom, you know, to be honest with you, uh, Rajiv Gandhi is an intellectual pygmy, right? I mean, no disrespect to Rajiv Gandhi, but where and where are we talking about? And yet, look at the stereotypes we build for ourselves that somebody who goes to Cambridge University um, and somebody who may have gone, you know, to an elite school, Doon school or whatever is uh, I'm not sure Raji went there I think he did I think he went to he Doon went school, to Doon yeah, school right yeah. he's just considered to be you know modern and intellectual cosmopolitan and uh, and Nasimha Rao was seen as a country bumpkin as Natwar Singh told me and I quote it in the book Natwar Singh was for, former foreign minister of India unlike Nehru Nasimha Rao did not have to discover India he already knew it he had a deep sense of the local indigenous culture of India and cultures of India. You know, he, his Urdu was so good that when the president of Pakistan, Farooq Lagari, comes to Delhi, uh, uh, Narsimha Rao talks to him and his Urdu is better than Farooq Lagari's Urdu, right? As a student, his Persian was excellent, right? So this is a man who was an unusual cosmopolitan. But Amit, I have to emphasize this, that a lot 
of people see this aspect to Narsimha Rao to the exclusion of his action-oriented side, right? They see this as the Hamlet side of Narsimha Rao, not the Don Quixote side. Narsimha Rao had held every single position in India, you know, from a local position to state minister, chief minister, union minister, before he became prime minister. He had a ton of conventional experience. In that sense, when Rajiv Gandhi died, he was a conventional candidate because he was the most experienced candidate in government. Um, you know, there was talk of him, as you mentioned earlier in this, uh, in, in this episode, of him becoming president of India in, I think, 1982 and again 1987. So he was almost up there, right? Um, and so in some sense, he was an uncommon intellect. He had uncommon experience and a man of action. That combination is very, very, very hard to find, you know? Um, and I think India was, and I, you know, this is one of the central points of the book that India was very lucky to have a man with this kind of intellect, this kind of experience, and this kind of action oriented self when India had this kind of crisis in 1991. So it was a, it, India, you know, should thank its stars that the confluence uh, of events that took place in 1991 was. Luckily, in India's favor, it could, you know, ima just imagine in a similar situ situation, N.D. Tiwari, who's not a man of action, who's not particularly learned, and who has experience. So I give him that, right? He has been chief minister of, uh, several times he has been chief minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh. Then he became chief minister of Uttarakhand. But he lacks the other two. He's not a man of action. And he certainly is not an intellectual. But he was enormously virile. Apparently, he was bonking people well into his 80s, right? There were uh, there was a video. I think he was uh, Andhra Pradesh governor. Yeah. And yeah. there was a video. Uh, he had to step down as a consequence. Yeah, yeah. And he, he could have bonked India as well if he was prime minister. What am I saying? Have I ever used a word like this on my show? But uh, so uh, to kind of uh, continue. And what also struck me is that it's almost as if the rest of his life in different ways was preparation for the role that he played in 91. Like, uh, uh, you know, the Don Quixote side of him in 1972 when he becomes uh, chief minister of AP would have been a complete disaster in 92. I, I was, you know, looking at just immediately post-independence, the alliance against the Nizam. And uh, you write about it, quote, the ensuing struggle against the Nizam brought together the unlikeliest of allies. The Indian National Congress wanted to dethrone him and integrate Hyderabad straight into secular democratic India. The Hindu Mahasabha and Arya Samaj disliked the Islamic ruler. And in Telangana region, an armed insurrection against landlords had morphed into a communist rebellion. These three elements gave rise to an anti-Nizam movement that was secular, religious and radical all at once. Stop quote. And so th there is this cauldron where there are all these different forces coming together. And Narsimha Rao is a young man. He's in his late 20s at this point, kind of watching all of this. He has, you know, one mentor in Ramana Tirtha, who is more of a radical kind of leader. Another uh, leader is um, sort of Burgulla Ramakrishna Rao, as you describe, much becomes more moderate. Who becomes the first chief minister of Hyderabad state. Who becomes the first chief minister and much more moderate and all that. And this is the point you write about how Narsimha Rao decides not to choose sides. Like his daughter, Eswani Devi, described him as an Ajat Shatru, someone with no enemies. Right. And to me, this also seems like a really fundamental quality in what he achieved in 1990. Uh, 91 onwards because you know just building that consensus bringing people together making it happen sort of all of that tell me a little bit about his, those early years what kind of politician was he was he an ambitious politician did he want to rise to the top what's your sense of those uh, sort of years like your first chapter is this chapter is titled Andhra Socialist 1921 to 71 it's 50 years big span of time what's happening as he gets from uh, here to there so Two things, uh, Amit. One is that to understand what Narsimha was up to in this period, you know, 51 to 71, you have to understand the structure of the Congress Party. The Congress Party is India at that time. Some of your younger listeners may find that hard to believe when they see today's Congress Party, but the Congress was India. And the Congress structure was built around different factions, right? So there was no opposition party of, of any any worth. So the opposition parties of India were within the Congress. So there was a left wing, there was a right wing, there was a Dalit wing, there was a Brahmin wing, there was a pro-landlord wing, there was a pro-tenant wing, there was a pro-farmer wing, there was a pro-consumer wing. That's the nature of Congress party. And at another level, there was a Burgul Ramakrishna Rao wing, there was a Ramanan Tirtha wing, 
thing. In other words, there were factions which are based on ideo personalities as much as ideology, something that you see in India even today. So you and I, Amit, are in Maharashtra. And if you look at the Congress today in Maharashtra, well, it may be very small, but even so, there's a, a Prithviraj Chavan wing, there's a Ashok Chavan wing, um, et cetera, et cetera. That's just the structure of the Congress, right? And when all these different wings and faction leaders are fighting about who should become chief minister, no one of them can become chief minister because the others threaten to leave. And what you end up with is a consensus candidate, right? That's what you end up with. Nasimha, genius was, he was always a consensus candidate because he never had a faction behind him. He never sought to cultivate people. He never sought to build a power base. Now, this might sound foolish. It may, you know, in politics, you should have chamchas, you should have cronies. Nasimha Rao lacked this. That's why he was seen as safe by everybody around him. That's why in 1971, he becomes chief minister of Andhra Pradesh. And I must emphasize here for those of you who haven't read the book Half Line, that that period, 1971 to 73, is very important in understanding Nasimha Rao. Because that's when he is Don Quixote. You know, Indira Gandhi selects him because she wants to push for a left-wing reform, which is land reform in Andhra Pradesh. Um, she wants to uh, move, uh, land has already moved from the zamindars uh, to the revenue intermediaries, the Deshmukhs or the Doras, who are the spine of the Congress party. These are the Reddies, the Brahmins, the Kammas. And Indira Gandhi wants to move the next level to give land to the tiller and to the landless Dalits. And that's what Narasimha Rao decides to do. He gives provocative speeches. This antagonizes landlords. This antagonizes other castes such as Kammas and Reddies. They protest against him. And Narasimha Rao, who feels he's in an honorable cause, he's a rebel, he's a revolutionary, he, you know, goes all out. He goes on the forefront. Uh, the protests he gets are so strong, in, Nasimha Rao has to step down. Indira Gandhi asks him to step down and he feels his career is over. The big lesson he learns from this is that if you want to bring about reform, you have to do it through the back door. You have to do it subtly. Otherwise, the enemies to reform will gang up against you and you will have you will be destroyed. You'll have to step down. It's the single biggest learning he takes as prime minister. There's no doubt in his mind that India has to change on economics, on welfare schemes, on foreign policy. But he has to do it in a way that doesn't antagonize his enemies, that doesn't antagonize those who be, who are upholding the older order. For that, you need subterfuge. You need to pretend to not do anything while doing something. That is Nasimha Rao's great genius. And he learns that by being a failure as chief minister. Now, look, many chief ministers in India fail. Many politicians fail. What makes Nasimha Rao unique is he converts his own failure into a learning experience. And he realizes what not to do. And when he comes back to power, he's a chastened man, which means you must reform, you must change, India has to change, but you have to do it in a way in which you pretend to continuity. And that is the genius of Narsimha Rao. Yeah, and the other lesson in this, and I wonder if you would say that as an early example of the Congress's centralizing impulse is in that concept of the nominated chief minister. That basically Indira Gandhi took over power at the center, started centralizing power and decided that she wanted a chief minister who would do her bidding, not necessarily someone who has roots and who has independent power of her own. And in a sense, she's kind of ga trying to gather weak men who cannot threaten her around herself. And uh, Narsimha Rao being an early version of this. And this then leads to the dilemma that while he is politically weak, the reason he is there is he doesn't have backing of his own. He's not a, you know, mass leader in that sense. So he always won the elections he uh, contested, but except the very first one, but he's not a mass leader in that sense. Uh, and he's politically weak, but he's been put in a position of strength, but he can't really do much in that position of strength as he as he finds out when he's in his uh, Don Quixote phase. And is there something broader also happening here that what happened to him in the microcosm is also happening at a larger level where Indira Gandhi, by strengthening herself, actually weakens the Congress? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would look upon that period, which is 1967, 68, 69, 70, all the way to 71, as uh, I would say the worst four years in India's first republic. Because by deinstitutionalizing the Congress, by doing exactly what you said, Indira Gandhi sets the tone for other political parties. So all the regional parties, caste-based parties that are growing in India post-1967, they are looking at the Indira Gandhi model of the Congress, not the Nehru model of the Congress. And even today, if you look at the state we are in, right, Shiv Sena is completely deinstitutionalized. 
uh you know the the father headed the shiv sena now the son heads it and is chief minister and you know soon the grandson will head it right aditya thakre would head it and in doing so you know older leaders leaders who want to rise will will go you know will, will be furious right the same deinstitutionalized story you are seeing in the dmk to some extent right the father has given way to stalin and lot of the regional bosses are like when will our turn come right so that's so the tragedy that you mention that is going on during this period 67 to 71 is not just something indira gandhi inflicts on the congress it's something that by mimicking right uh, all other political parties by the communists and the bjp are mimicking are taking from indira gandhi and i think that's a serious tragedy and i think one of the big problems in indian politics is how deinstitutionalized and hollowed out parties have become in india and i worry that that period set the template for it and did that then also make feudalism inevitable for example i was telling you just before this that i read this delightful um, uh, uh, sort of essay on leela naidu by one of her uh, uh, friends where leela naidu he mentions at one point that when she grew older older she would constantly share gossip with him and one of the pieces of gossip that she shared is that she had heard that indira gandhi's daughters in law kept the fridge locked so that the servants could not access the food because they were worried the servants would steal the food so they didn't care if the food went to waste but they kept the fridge locked because they wanted control of it and that feels like what the gandhis have actually done to the congress party uh, today um, uh, though of course you uh, when i mentioned this before the recording you uh, gave the counterpoint to that that in 2009 one would not have said this but that is kind of where we are but then does that centralizing impulse yeah. inevitably mean that there will be feudalism because if there aren't alternative leaders around a leader to challenge yeah. them then the family or the people you know in in the greatest proximity to power will eventually make sure they hold the power and their popular leaders simply therefore aren't allowed to uh, emerge in any way yeah and i think it's it's yeah i i completely agree with you and it it goes one step further which is over time family control of political parties become a self fulfilling pro- prophecy right which is that the family says that look unless we have a family the second rung leaders are so corrupt and so self serving that they will split the party and destroy the party that unfortunately also happens to be true so today if you say that sonia gandhi and rahul gandhi and priyanka gandhi should leave the party i don't quite trust the others in the political party right so but that has is a consequence of now several decades of hauling out that began with indira gandhi indira gandhi is right to say that eventually there was nobody but indira gandhi who could hold the party together but that's a process that she started and so you know in sonia gandhi today is in this conundrum right which is that it is a feudal party in the sense that you know it or, or let's say it's a family based party but the alternative to a family based party might even be worse it may not be a democratic party right the instincts of the second tier congress leaders that we see today are not particularly non feudal right so, so so you are choosing between two suboptimal or two worse outcomes in one outcome you have the nehru gandhi is in power in the other outcome you don't have them in power and things are even worse in the congress right so i do feel that that period is a uh, terrible period uh, in in india and it could have gone differently i mean frankly indira gandhi had she not done this maybe in the 1971 elections the congress would have lost but you know they lost 6 years later in 1977 all that meant was indira gandhi 6 years earlier would have been in opposition she would have come back to power but she wouldn't have destroyed the party for just 3 4 extra years in power and is it inevitable in just the structure of parties and the nature of power uh, i mean the structure of parties in india but the nature of power is universal in that power corrupts always so is it then necessary that even a party like the bjp will eventually go down that road like at one point you could have said that institutionally is pretty decentralized you've got local leaders you've got shit happening uh, recently one hears about how you know modi and shah have centralized a lot of the power and uh, you have perhaps one rival power source coming up in adityanath as someone who studied the bjp really closely do you, do you feel that you know there is a move in that direction or are there safeguards within the party which will not allow it to happen and if so what are those safeguards that were not there in the congress so i actually i'll push back a little bit i don't think it's inevitable right i don't think what indira gandhi did in the early 19 uh, in the late 60s early 70s was inevitable um 
I think pa- power corrupts, but that doesn't follow that the cadre is destroyed and one individual seizes power. It doesn't follow, right? Um, I'll give you the DMK example that even though Stalin is in power, they still have somewhat of a cadre. The communists, of course, they don't have power, but they still have somewhat of a cadre. The BJP definitely has a strong cadre, right? And it remains so, and the RSS plays a big role in keeping that happening. I won't... I would actually say the following, that given that Modi is so much more popular than his party, right? It is surprising that in the in the, in the the BJP, both Amit Shah and, and Modi follow the formal protocols of the party, even though they don't have to, right? And I would say that after Modi and after Amit Shah, the BJP's health will be immeasurably better than it was when they took the party. So I'm actually going to stick my neck out and say that both Amit Shah and Modi are institutional builders. It is the reality in India today that Modi, you know, is the number one leader in the BJP and the number two leader is actually number 10 because Modi is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And the next leader, you can call it Aditya Nath, Amit Shah, whoever, is actually the 10th most popular leader in, in the BJP. And that even though Modi is a centralizer, his instincts, he has not destroyed the party. The party still has autonomous centers. The RSS is still autonomous. The reason they go behind him is actually a pretty simple reason. He wins elections. If he stops winning elections, people in the BJP will complain, right? So I'll actually push back on that just to tell you that there is an alternate model that the Congress could have followed, which is, but it would have been a party would then would have had to focus on an ideological core and would have had to articulate an ideological, not just a catch-all party, but a certain clear ideology. Um, in the 1960s, that ideology sometimes wins you, sometimes loses. The BJP has had the same ideology for 100 years. And they have won elections, they have lost elections. The Congress's tragedy and Indra's ca- tragedy was she could not conceive of an India without the Congress. And she was willing to do what it takes to just give the Congress a little more power for a little more years. And that came at the cost of the destruction of the party. So I'm, I'm going to push back and look, many people disagree with me on this, saying that, look, in India, the deinstitutionalization of a party is the norm, is inevitable, um, and that power corrupts, right? And an individual in power will always try to, you know, make it a mom and pop show. I don't think it was inevitable. That's certainly not the party that Nehru ran. There was no reason that that would be the party that Indira Gandhi ran. I think, you know, as a former poker player, I can commit it from, uh, I can cite uh, the law of truly large numbers. And the law of truly da- large numbers basically is that given enough iterations, everything is inevitable. The most unlikely event is inevitable. And here I would say given enough iterations, power will corrupt, even if it doesn't corrupt a particular set of people on top. Because, but what you are saying is that no, within, but, but the, wha- within the BJP, there are institutional safeguards. No, why that- should the word sentence power corrupts mean that a party becomes personality centric. That doesn't follow because frankly, carders expand the power of the party. Expand like Modi likes having a committed carder because he wins elections. If he destroys the carder, he may lose elections, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I think what you're saying is that uh, the BJP has enough institutional safeguards, such as the very presence of the RSS behind it, that makes sure that that personality cult cannot form even if... Uh, power was to corrupt. Also, I don't, you know, let me stick my neck out a second time. I don't think Modi believes in his personality cult. I think Modi fully recognizes that you need a party, you need social media, you need money. You know, it's not that, you know, the the old story where, you know, Indira Gandhi would, you know, put a, you know, the joke was if Indira Gandhi even puts a lamppost as a candidate, the lamppost will win. Modi well realizes that's not the case. Yeah, but my point is that it's not about Modi. Forget Modi. Tomorrow it could be Adityana, day after it could be Yati, it could be anybody else. Yeah. And inevitably, if you have a large enough sample size, there will be someone corrupted enough to try to centralize power. And your point is that's not possible within the BJP because there are enough safeguards which they want in the Congress. Is that correct? Yeah. And, you know, they may centralize power, but it may not be in the cost of having a coherent cadre. What Indra does is, you know, destroys any, you you can still have ultimate power with the prime minister, but give chief ministers with some, like today, you know, 
the chief ministers of the BJP, whether Shivraj Singh Chauhan, um, you name it, right? Aditya Nath are not puppets of Modi. I don't think that's the right sentence, right? You, in fact, if anything, Shivraj Singh Chauhan was a competitor of Modi, right, for prime ministership. Yet he's prime, he's chief minister. This would be unthinkable in the Congress Party. And I, the reason I'm sort of jostling with you on this, uh, Amit, is not just to create a rare point of disagreement between us, because I think that's important too. I love the disagreement. People think I don't disagree because we are so polite on the show. But, so they don't know, you know, disagreement for them is Twitter screaming. No, 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 no. But, but you know, I, I, because we seem, seem to agree on a lot, I want to at least have one or two differences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to em emphasize here as a political scientist with all my heart that the tragedy of the Congress, especially the tragedy of the Congress party organization was not inevitable. And it was a series of choices that began with Indira Gandhi and then became a self-fulfilling prophecy because she handed out down to her, you know, to Rajiv Gandhi, she handed down a, such a corrupt party that Rajiv said, I have to further centralize, otherwise am I going to give these jokers decentralized power? But that was not inevitable. It was something that uh, Indira Gandhi created. Yeah, I mean, that's an open question, I guess. We are actually talking past each other because I'm not even talking about the current BJP. I'm just saying in the larger scheme of things, you know, given enough leaders, somebody or the other is going to try the same thing that Indira tried in the BJP as well. But uh, uh, maybe not in the... Maybe the question is moot because the sample size you need for that is uh, too large. Let's get back to Narsimha Rao. Sure. And, um, you know, you speak about how that period as chief minister ended disastrously even though he was well intentioned he was trying to do things like reduce land holdings to such an extent that his own land holdings would be decimated That's right. right but he's and despite opposition within uh, you know half the cabinet because they are of course you know uh, of landlords they're landlords so you know and, and he did that and uh, you uh, write at one point and this is a lovely sentence quote Narsimha Rao the chief minister was pouring kerosene all over himself all that was needed was a mastic stop quote and so okay eventually the chief ministership is set on fire he's sacked game is over now he's in exile for a couple of years where he's uh, uh, you know act, uh, not in a political position anymore how did that exile change him that's an important question amit because and just just take a step back to a, for a second most politicians don't know what to do with exiles because they are 24 7 politicians right Exile means that you've lost an election, you've stepped down as chief minister, all the hundreds of people waiting to meet you have disappeared. There's nobody willing to meet you. If you don't have hobbies, what else do you do, right? Nasimara was very good at exile because he had hobbies. You know, he could even paint, he could, you know, he could read books, right? He could learn languages, you know, he could, you know, when uh, the first exile between 1973 and 75 or 74, he begins to write the book that would eventually become The Insider, right? Um, so he knew he had things to occupy himself during exile. This is very rare for politicians, which is why politicians, when they, when they are in exile, and all politicians will be in exile at some point or other, make foolish mistakes like leaving the party, making state statements, making compromises to get back to power, to get something, to get a Rajya Sabha ticket. Nasimha Rao didn't have to do that. And I think that's what made him unique. The other person, by the way, who had this is Atal Bihari Vajpayee, who was a man with a lot of interest, poetry, uh, he loved the good life. Uh, he had, like Nasimha Rao, he had a philosophical attitude to life. So when he was not in power, right, he had things to occupy himself. When he was sidelined, in my first book, I point out that from roughly 1985 all the way to 1995, for 10 years, he had been exiled uh, from, 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 from his party functionally. But, you know, he knew things to occupy himself. He didn't do anything foolish as leaving the party, splitting the party, etc., etc. So, Nasimha Rao was both used to exile and B, did not do anything foolish during exile, which meant that when the stars realigned, Indira Gandhi got him back as general secretary. Right. Uh, again, in 1991, a few months before the elections, when Rajiv Gandhi basically kicked him out of politics, Nasimha Rao said, fine, I'm going to use this exile. I'm going to become a monk in the Kotralam monastery um, and I'm going to become a Hindu monk. I'm going to close my bank accounts. Right. Somebody else could have said, who does Rajiv Gandhi think he is? Put a press conference, etc., etc. And you know what? If he had done that and Rajiv Gandhi had been assassinated, the Congress wouldn't have gone to him to become prime minister. They went to him to become prime minister because he accepted his exile with grace. And I want to give you the contrary picture of N.D. Tiwari, also 
also who was in his last legs in the 1991 elections and rajiv had told him don't contest the lok sabha elections but nd tiwari was worried that his chance to become chief minister in 91 was was ending in up and as you know as your readers know the samajwadi party etc comes to power the congress has been finished since then has never come back in up so nd tiwari knew this so he disobeyed an order of rajiv gandhi and stood for lok sabha elections in up and lost and that's one of the main reasons why he could not become prime minister when rajiv died because he had disobeyed an order of rajiv gandhi right so this is an example of narsimha rao who doesn't make foolish decisions during his exile i'll give you a third example amit which is in 1977 to 1980 another period of exile for narsimha rao as all of you know um that's when the janta government is in power indira gandhi is uh, cases have been filed against indira gandhi many of indira gandhi's close supporters like yb chavan leave the congress during this period narsimha rao doesn't leave the congress what does he do he goes to jnu to learn spanish he doesn't make a foolish mistake right he bides his time so in 1980 when the when indira gandhi comes back to power in narsimha rao is one of the few people to have remained loyal to indira gandhi during the three years in which he had been hounded by everybody else so how does indira gandhi reward him he, she makes him foreign minister of india which is one of the top four ministries in the union cabinet it tells you that narsimha rao's big talent was that he knew how to occupy himself during exile and he did not make foolish short term decisions to come back to power during exile he knew that look he had a philosophical turn what goes down comes up you know and that's exactly what happens to him i know that's a long answer to your question but does that make sense makes a lot of sense and long answers are the best answers because they have the best chance of carrying complexity and at this time like you said earlier he also made an american trip he visited his daughter and uh, so on and so forth and uh, Th- this time being uh, 1973 74 7374 right? yeah, yeah. 7374 so he is this a significant trip is this something that we look at as changing his outlook in any way in the sense that he was a classic uh, socialist all the time before that you know even when he was a modernizer as you as you pointed out in the 60s it was a modernizer from a point of view of the state doing modernizing things and not you know liberalizing and enabling uh, people and markets to do what they do so did this uh sort of and and he had a love for technology you point out how on another trip he brought back a texas calculator for his son and all of that he was into that so you know he's in india all his life he goes to the us he sees how life there is uh, so much better and all that does that you know change his outlook you you also mention at one point that he uh, realizes when he's spending time in his village with villagers that the land reforms alone haven't changed anything that they are still poor and that therefore the handouts don't solve the problem you also need to connect them to markets where they can flourish through voluntary uh, trade with others and uh, in some cases he manages to do that where he moves them from rice which is an unprofitable crop to other cash crops and you know they enter markets and start making money so is there some kind of discernible metamorphosis happening in ideological terms because initially why he was socialist in his 60s what else could you be back then you know i can't it's easy to sit here in 2022 and talk about economic freedom and this and that at that point in time he there was no exposure to those ideas there wasn't widespread understanding of the failures of socialism as we have today so that's completely understandable but over time do we see a sort of a gradual shift and also in general, general through uh, reading his papers writing this um, biography w- w- what comment would you have on his openness to new ideas which is also a, a remarkably important quality a quality which for example nehru didn't have yeah. right much to uh, our nation's detriment uh, you know and no politician i mean i can't think of uh, any politicians who really have as much of that as narsimha rao clearly did so so what's your sense of his intellectual journey So I think to answer the first part of your question that trip he makes in 73 74 to the US is transformative right um he, you know he travels quite a bit in the, I mean in, in within New York he's traveling he's ama- you know he buys calculators from Texas Instruments he goes to Wisconsin and he meets you know this famous Telugu scholar Velchiru Narayan Rao and in you know Madison Wisconsin he you know he's invited for dinner and he finds the best Telugu food and he's saying you know all these ingredients you're getting here in the midwest i can't even get in north india 
you know. So he sees the power of American capitalism and he sees the dynamism and entrepreneurship in America quite clearly, right? And the next time he's visiting the US, he's now an expert on the US. So his eldest daughter, uh, who's, who's accompanying him, who I think is semi-literate, she sees a washing machine. She doesn't use know how to use it. And says, I'll teach you how to use the washing machine. He's now the expert. He's been there, you know, a second time. So he definitely is very excited like a child about the, you know, entrepreneurship, technological improvement in the US. That directly manifests itself when he's foreign minister. So in 1982, you know, onwards, when he's foreign minister, you also see India moving away from the Soviet Union towards the US, right? That doesn't manifest itself in his economic policies. So Narsimara, one of the things I realized was that on economics, he was a cipher until 1991. It was the, you know, he had held so many positions from Hindu from Hindu Endowment Board, you know, industry, defense, foreign policy. He had held all this. He had never held economics, um, uh, or sorry, he had not held industry either. So he never held finance, economics. He never held these positions. There's nothing in his archives that showed that the either the US trip or his in the 80s, his economic thinking had changed. You know, he didn't have much to think about it. Whatever little he thought about it was still protectionist. It was really 1991 that transformed him. And he realized the crisis. He realized that we had to change. And I think it's amazing that he changes on, a, he just flips on a dime at that point, right? And I was actually looking in the 70s for this aha moment where he realizes the importance of liberalization and the importance of capitalism. I just couldn't find it, you know. There's a very famous story, possibly apocryphal, of Gorbachev, right, traveling in the United States. And I think his car breaks down somewhere. It's an apocryphal story. I haven't been able to find a footnote. And, he, you know, there's a Walmart nearby. He goes there to a Walmart, right, in rural America. And he's amazed at the range of things that Walmart carries. And suddenly he has a eureka moment that he, right, as the head of Soviet Union, as a Soviet elite, has less products he can buy in Moscow than a rural American farmer who goes to Walmart in rural America. And that's when he has this aha moment about the power of capitalism and actually giving consumers choice. So I, I had the story in the back of my mind and I kept looking to see whether there was this aha moment when Nasimara goes to US or after and I, I couldn't find it. I was unhappy I couldn't find it but you know I wanted to be or I had too much of a commitment to my reader to manufacture it and the answer has to be Amit that on economics he did not have a change until 1991. On other things, especially foreign policy, the ardent socialist had softened his position, but not on economics. Yeah, and as you pointed out, as as foreign minister, he would also have been watching Deng do what he did in China, and you, and you would have kind of seen those movements and uh, you know what's going on there. So you know, Pranab Mukherjee once mentioned um, no, as you said, not must have he did because I give a quote there also mm. where he's amazed at what Deng is doing, transforming the eco the economy, transforming China, but he notices something others don't, which is Deng is transforming China while pretending to be a Maoist. Hmm. Like Deng is making China capitalist while pretending to be a communist. And I have a quote here saying that, you know, where he, where Nasimarao says that Deng Joping reminds him of one of those Sanskrit shlokas or Sanskrit quotations, which the same sentence can be read one way or read the other way, right? And I mentioned here also that one of Nasimarao's favorite Telugu poems was this poem, which if you read it one way, it was the Ramayana. The same text, if you read a different way, it was the Mahabharata, right? And Nasimara loved that. And that's frankly exactly what he did as prime minister, that he said, I'm a Nehruvian, I'm a socialist. India believes in socialism while he's opening up India's economy, right? That's what he learned from Deng. So it's not so much the importance of the economy, but the how to bring about change in a system that is so one way, you cannot have radical changes. You have to pretend to continuity while bringing about change. And just to give you an example, um, after reading this book, you know, a CEO came to me and she told me that 
uh, she had just become CEO and the, her first instinct was to say that the previous CEO is a fool and I'm going to bring about changes and I'm going to make this change, that change. But she said, look, I read your book and I realized that if I do that, then all the people the old CEO has appointed who are still there in the system will resent her and will, will push back against her. So what she had to say was that, oh, the previous CEO was fantastic. All his choices was fantastic while she brought about changes which were radically different from the old CEO. And I said... Man, you understood this book much better than I have because that's exactly the point of Nasim Rao. And I can tell you, Amit, any of your listeners listening to this who work in organizations, right, realize that, you know, will agree with me that changing the DNA of organizations are really hard. And socialism was in the DNA of the Indian state, was in the DNA of the Congress Party, just like communism was in the DNA of the Chinese state. And the way to do it is the Deng Xiaoping and Narsim Rao way, which is to pretend to continuity in a system while simultaneously through your actions bringing about radical change. And this is pretty much as profound an insight from politics that can be applied to everything as, say, Doris Kean's Goodwin's team of rivals, right? How Lincoln put his cabinet together, where instead of just putting his supporters in his cabinet, he got his greatest rivals, including the guy he defeated in the presidential elections and put them in the cabinet. And that was one big reason for his success in winning the civil war. And and that's almost cliched. I mean, both of these could be uh, uh, LinkedIn posts, in a sense, which are... Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, you know, Pranam Mukherjee once told Narsimha Rao that during this period, he thought Narsimha Rao was invaluable to Indira Gandhi. She could not function without him. So tell me about what he's actually doing in government. Like, uh, one gets that when he's out of power, he's not creating a political fuss because there are other facets to his personality. He's learning Spanish, he's going abroad and buying calculator, he's doing all of these things. And he, the way that he gets to power is often by being inoffensive to everyone in the sense that this is not someone who threatens me, so let me give him an important ministry like foreign ministry or uh, uh, so on and so forth. But when he's actually in power, when he's in that position, one, in terms of governance in the ministry itself, what is his approach and what is the kind of work that he is doing and how do you rate him as a minister? And two, in a political sense, as Indira Gandhi's aide, what's his role there and what role is he playing for her? So I think that as in government, Nasimha Rao was good at three different things. Firstly, he was just a consummate draftsman. So I would say that, you know, from the 1970s, every piece of paper that would exit the Congress party would have his fingerprints on it. So he just knew, you know, in a cabinet meeting, he knew how to, you know, write what the minute looked like. He knew what to write the cabinet agenda. So, you know, now, look, Pranam Mukherjee was good at this. Jairam Ramesh is very good at this, right? So this was a talent that Nasimha Rao had, that he was a draftsman, right? The second talent he had is that in any ministry that he took charge of, he quickly understood the issues because he applied himself, right? So a lot of ministers think of a ministry as an ego trip, right? So Nasimha Rao didn't think that. So for example, he had been defense minister and foreign minister and, and Rajiv Gandhi made, made him education minister or HRD minister. Now, for most people, this is a demotion. But Nasimha is not a demotion. He quickly gets in. He understands the the, 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 the mechanics of the Navodaya school. You know, he, he knew all of that. So I think the second thing that he was very good at was in the ministry, he would very quickly get to the issues. And he was a good, he could brief the prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi or Indra Gandhi about the issues because he actually ad applied himself to the specifics of the ministry when it came to foreign policy he you know he you know he told his son if i'm uh, his grandson i think when he when nasim rao traveled to a country he first read up about the country the culture the people the politics can you think of any other foreign minister in india bar jay shankar doing that out of the question right again when he was defense minister i mentioned here he's quickly you know getting involved in the nuclear program this that and later on when arunachalam who was heading the nuclear program at that time comes to him and you know he says you please draw out what the nuclear react nuclear uh, process looks like he said okay this is where the chain reaction takes place so he's getting involved and then he's briefing indira gandhi and rajiv gandhi that's a skill ask yourself even today how many ministers actually have depth in their department or their subject expertise rather than looking at the at the ministry or being a minister as an ego trip which tells them their relative importance in the pecking order for most of people it's in the latter right the third skill narsimha rao had was that 
he could balance action and theory very well, right? So, for example, and these were skills that he came to as prime minister also, and this is outside his department. For example, he told Rajiv Gandhi that, you know, uh, getting involved in Sri Lanka is an error, right? Rajiv Gandhi didn't listen to him. But he said that, right? Um, on the other hand, he pushed for the Navodaya schooling system, which is residential schools for poor people, um, where the teacher actually lives in the place, right? So that to prevent teacher absenteeism, because the teacher is living in the school, the teacher is less likely to bunk. And Rajiv Gandhi, you know, took you know, took charge of that or agreed with that. So he had this ability, I think all three, right? He was a good draftsman. He had subject matter expertise. So he was as good as the bureaucrat. And to give you an example, Modi today, by all accounts, listens to the secretary in every department, uh, every ministry, rather than listening to the minister. Narsimha Rao knew as much about foreign politics, uh, foreign policy as the foreign secretary, right? I unearthed uh, a document here, which the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Indian ambassador to China China, writes to Narsimha Rao, right, about the Chinese situation and, and in Narsimha Rao is writing in the notes on the margins, highly detailed pushbacks. I don't know too many ministers who could second guess a foreign secretary or an ambassador, because an amb Indian ambassador to a country has subject matter expertise, right? So I would say Narsimha Rao had all these three. It's a unique skill. But you know, look, Pranam Mukherjee had these skills, right that he, she, he was invaluable too right where he what he lacked which narsimha rao had is the ability to act and to act decisively when he became prime minister during this the landscape changes in the sense indira gandhi is assassinated and uh, what you know the aftermath happens we've already sort of alluded uh, to the riots and then eventually rajiv gandhi uh, takes uh, uh, hold of uh, of the party and at this point you also in fact uh, quote uh, Tacitus, where uh, Tacitus, after whom I think the term taciturn comes, right? <laughs> uh, and Tacitus says, quote, the higher a man's rank, the more eager is hypocrisy, and his looks the more carefully studied, so as to neither betray joy at the decrees of one emperor, nor sorrow at the rise of another, while he mingled delight and lamentations with his flattery. Uh, stop quote. And, Isn't it uh, a wonderful quote? It's a remarkable quote. And, and so opposite, so, so, so correct to describe Narsimha Rao when Indira Gandhi has died and Rajiv Gandhi is rising and he's very, very careful that he knows that he was close to Indira Gandhi. Now he has to become close to Rajiv Gandhi. Yeah, and unlike Pranab Mukherjee, who, uh, you yeah, know, who makes a mess of it. lobbied for the position of prime minister and yeah. uh, eventually, and then, then when he was in exile, just left the party and That's threw a right. tantrum. Uh, you know, some, I think it was Pratap Mehta who told me that the difference between Narsimha Rao and Arjun Singh was Narsimha Rao was clever Arjun Singh was clever by half, <laughs> you know, and uh, Pranam Mukherjee was clever by half, and Nasimha Rao, as the, you know, given the quote that you mentioned, like was being clever. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think the kind of cleverness that you're alluding to is not just the cleverness to say the right thing, but also to shut up at the right time. That's right. Which, uh, you know, Narsimha Rao would perhaps have done. And I so, got to tell you, I, you know, I, I was just reading this book to prepare for this uh, conversation because, you know, I la last read the book six years ago when I had written the book. And I was just telling myself, I wish I had internalized this year, you know, that I should keep quiet at key moments. Um, I just don't do that. I say what I think. Uh, but Narsimha Rao uh, knew, you know, the importance of silence or when not to say something, when to step back, when not to die on that hill. Uh, something I think I should, having reread the book, I think I should learn now. No, I mean, I, I was thinking a little while earlier that Narsimha Rao with his learning and knowledge and experience would have made such a fantastic guest for this podcast. But now what you just said, I don't know how much he would have told me and if he, even if he... So uh, that's problem one. Problem two is, you know, I give this story about Narsimha Rao meeting Bill Clinton in 1994 and Bill Clinton really doesn't like the meeting because Nasim Arao is, you know, is nervous and his response to being nervous is to give a long lecture as an academic. Long academic lecture. He could do that too. So either he would be silent to your questions, Amit, or he would give long-winded, boring academic answers that would bore your listeners. I don't know which is worse. No, no, I would, I would get great masala out of him if he agreed to speak, but he would have to agree first. And now it's a problem because he's been dead for a long time. So what can one uh, do about that? But why did you say that you wish you had internalized that quality of knowing when to shut up? Are, are you someone who gets yourself into sports by speaking too much? I don't know. I haven't yet got myself into sports. But, you know, I normally, if somebody asks me a question, I try to give the straightforward answer. Even if it's politically incorrect, whatever, you know. Uh, 
maybe you know god knows but may, may, you know may, maybe it's a nasim marao is a more professionally astute way to go about it yeah i mean um, i hope you don't get cancelled from ashoka university for something <laughs> you say in future so watch your mouth as it were now we've already kind of discussed um, the aftermath of um, the assassination where uh, of of the murder when um, you know the riots happen and he's been told the police can't report to him and you've described him it as his wildest star and so on and so forth and so i won't go over that um, sort of area again but once the new cabinet sort of settles down and now he's made the defense minister you know what's the scene like because what rajiv gandhi does is he gets a whole bunch of his cronies people he's been to school with many of them at doon school so people like arun singh and satish sharma and arun nehru was there manishankar ayer all of these people so he gets his latians elite as it were and these are the latians elite i think we truly should look down upon and he gets uh, this latians elite of english speaking elite so have you know no sense of india per se and narsimha rao is in the cabinet as well so what's the deal how is he kind of jockeying uh, for a position within uh, this bunch of people and what do you think he wants at this point like he's already tried and failed to be nominated for the presidency when you know um, uh, indira gandhi chooses jail singh over him uh, what's happening uh, here well he wants to continue to be in power like all politicians i mean i hope i haven't given your listeners the view that narsimha rao is bait in milk he's not right so he's as ambitious as you know complexity is both ambitious and unambitious but he certainly wants to continue to be in power his single focus is to be as close and useful to rajiv gandhi as he was to indira gandhi the most important thing is he recognizes what you just said that he's an outsider in team rajiv right and he has to reinvent himself and i have this wonderful story here about how he overhears rajiv gandhi making some allusion to computers he's not heard the phrase before uh, you know this is the mid 80s right and nasim rao is in the 60s and he asks his son what is this computer send me a you know you know send me a sample and his son sends him a sample from hyderabad to delhi of a computer it comes by indian airlines and nasim rao doesn't you know uh, you know hire somebody to teach him does that a little bit and as i mentioned very soon learns cobol basic and unix right and it's just an example of how nasima rao is uh, using his skill at curiosity to refashion himself and retool himself to be as useful to rajiv gandhi as he is to indira gandhi and he successfully so he becomes foreign minister again for rajiv gandhi to give him the education ministry is not actually a demotion from defense but it's he's giving it to him because he feels that nasima rao has something to offer and something to add to it right um and he, for him education is a priority sector so nasima rao is retooling himself but you know by the time he nasima rao reaches 1991 he's old uh, rajiv gandhi decides that his career is over right uh he tries again to become president in 1987 but his close friend r venkatraman who was the same vintage at him becomes president himself but nasima rao could have become president he was well within the the realm of becoming president but the key thing here is that when rajiv gandhi asks him to step down doesn't give him a ticket nasima rao doesn't rebel as i mentioned earlier he accepts with equanimity his 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 fall most politician will create a ruckus give a press conference abuse nasima rao doesn't do that right and yet as i point out there's a key moment when nasima rao hears that rajiv gandhi has been murdered when at the time he hears it he's in shock a doctor has to come to kind of settle him down but very soon in just a few hours he realizes that by virtue of being one of the senior most leaders of the congress who stepped down when the nehru gandhis asked him to do it he is now best primed to become prime minister and within a few hours he's you know he's he's you know moving to delhi maneuvering trying to become prime minister that's that's amazing political instinct and it taught me that nasim rao's key skill was that when he realized that the cards he had been dealt with are not good and i'm sure there's a poker analogy amit i just don't know enough poker he you know he knows he has a bad hand so he plays it on defense and when suddenly those the hand turns for him he ends up with a good hand he plays aggressively is there a analogy in poker for that 
I mean, I'd have to think of one. There are various situations in which, I mean, you know, it's common in poker, of course, that a bad hand turns into a good hand, but often it is not in your control. But you can play even a bad hand in such a way that a better hand can fold because, you know, and uh, so I, I, I won't go too far with the poker, but certainly what he, the canniness he showed in suggesting Andy Tiwari's name, as you point out, yeah. it's just an example of the kind of mind games he's playing yeah. that uh, he is simultaneously by that signaling that, hey, I am not desperate for this position and therefore I'm not a threat to anyone and at the same time he's putting forward a candidate who he knows is unacceptable so they're going to come back to him yeah I, I'm going to just read out if you don't mind sure. because I have the book with me um, uh, the diary entry of Narsimha Rao this is uh, the day after Rajiv has been murdered The all the congressmen are around the body or shards of the body in 10 Janpad pretending to cry while maneuvering to become the next prime minister and while Nasima Rao is there, and uh, just, you know, just an advertisement to the reader, this book is being made into an OTT series directed by Prakash Jha. And I've requested Mr. Jha that they must have this visual, which is that the dead body is there. And then around them, all these congressmen in white wearing the Congress topi are all pretending to cry. But actually, they're doing guspus on who to su- succeed, right? And suddenly what happens is that Nasima writes in his diary that while we, and I'm quoting here, while we were hanging around the dead body in 10 Janpat, Pranab took me aside and told me that there was general agreement on me being elected Congress president. Rao doesn't say, yes, yes, I should become Congress president because if he does that, Pranab will tell everybody, look, Nasimara wants to become Congress president and then everybody would gun for him. So Nasimara, this is what Nasimara says. I knew that Pranab's report was too good to be true. Either he was himself a dupe or he was party to some kind of design and was trying to lull me. He had done this role many times in those crucial years of Indraji. I did not want to react. I mentioned about my health and said I was. I feel a bit dis- diffident. Nasimarao is, is pretending to Pranab. I suggested NDT, who is ND Tiwari, instead. Taking care to add that I was not refusing, yet it would be good if he came up after a consensus. I also knew that N.D. Tiwari would be unacceptable as or more so than myself in the scheme of things. This paragraph tells me everything you want to know about Narsimha Rao maneuvering. Just imagine that visual Pranab coming and whispering and look, this is written that night. It's his diary. So that this is happening in the day and in the night Narsimha Rao is writing this. And it just told me and it also told me how lucky I was as a biographer to get access to the innermost thoughts of Narsimha Rao in the day that he does it. Yeah, that, that's incredible. And I can think of a lesser man either enthusiastically saying yes, yes, or even putting his arm around Pranab's shoulder and saying that if I become PM, I'll make you FM, which would have been as big a disaster for India. a disaster because imagine what Pranab would have done. He would have gone and told Sonia Gandhi that, look, Nasimara wants to be prime minister and immediately they would have killed him. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is beautiful. Now, uh, before we get to the 1991 phase when he takes over as PM, uh, a final question I want to ask you about the earlier period, which comes from something really interesting where you point out that there were once a set of papers, you know, with the heading human resource development, and there were a bunch of papers and, and that happened to have an excerpt that happened to have something that uh, Rao had handwritten himself. And that included, uh, I'll, I'll read this bit out, quote, with human resource development as a heading, it contained an excerpt from an author Rao enjoyed. And Tuan, the, the, the Sa Exupery, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And the excerpt is, this is Exup- the, the Sa Exupery's words, quote, a rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man contemplates it bearing within him the image of a cathedral stop quote incredible quote right and now your words continue below this rao had written woman and child development health youth affairs slash sports culture labor question mark and and, and you continue the note was re- uh, returned to rao and he slipped it into the pocket of his kurta later that morning he went to see the prime minister which is rajiv gandhi he told rajiv quote and now rao's words we see a rock pile of this organized underutilized human resources you see a cathedral you see a cathedral we can fashion it but we need to go beyond just the ministry of education stop quote and now you continue rao persuaded rajiv to integrate the departments of culture youth affairs sports women and child development and later health with education into the new hrd ministry stop quote like first of all i just love this image of somebody sees a rock pile and somebody sees a cathedral a, a, a stunning image and also it seems to me that all of these 
you know, culture, youth affairs, sports, women and child development are amenable to scaling, right? You make a small difference here, it reverberates into something much bigger. It's not static, it scales massively. And that's exactly the thing about liberalization as well, that economic freedom also scales in a similar way, where the state is playing an enabling part, as it does in all of these subjects, you know. And um, this struck me as really interesting and kind of wise from Rao in getting, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if he chose this ministry or asked for it or whatever, but he was clearly reveling in it. But in these specific subjects, and labor was left out because it had more to do with take, taking care of the interests of labor currently and all of that, not so scalable. But uh, unless you change the labor laws, which of course hurt labor more than they help them, but that's a different story. But all of these are extremely scalable and liberalization in the end also proves to be that. So does this sort of indicate that his mindset is broader and thinking at, uh, you know, a different kind of level than the typical politician who, when in put in charge of a ministry, may have an engineering mindset that let us tinker, we will fix this, we will fix that, we will fix this. But is he perhaps showing a more of an enabling mindset here, which also might explain why he was more open to Narish Chandra's note as cabinet secretary so, uh, a few years well, later? That's a good question, Amit. I would say that when it came to welfare schemes, you're absolutely right, that he had an enabling mindset, he had a visionary mindset, he could think out of the box. Um, that's what we see, you know, throughout. And look, he knew what he was talking about. He was education minister and health minister in uh, Andhra Pradesh. He was education minister in Delhi. So he knew how the state education function, how the center education function. And he had imagination to say, let's transform. And he found in Rajiv Gandhi a willing prime minister because Rajiv was passionate about this too, right? I don't see this on in economics. I just don't see it. He was a same old stodgy protectionist, right? And, you know, again, I've thought about this many, many times that is there some, because there's so much from his life that tells you about how he was prime minister in other ways, like how he managed the politics of reform, how he managed welfare schemes, foreign policy. There isn't anything about economics, you know. And as a biographer, I have to go with the evidence. And all evidence points to the fact that he was a mild protectionist on economics. He hadn't really thought about it. But when Naresh Chandra shows him that note, he wakes up. He says India has to change. And once he decides to do that, he moves with remarkable alacrity. So, you know, I'll, I won't discuss uh, any more of that bit about how he becomes Prime Minister, but I recommend everyone read it because it's a racy read and these are going to be the best couple of episodes in the, the most fascinating episodes in the OTT. You know, uh, uh, the, the, the way he manoeuvres himself to the Congress presidency, the, the farmhouse meeting with Shankar Deyal Sharma, the way Sharad Pawar tries to get in the way and become the Prime Minister saying that no, on principle, the party president cannot be leader of the Lok Sabha and blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about actually coming to power and he comes to power and his cabinet secretary Naresh Chandra gives him this note and at this moment he's effectively still a man alone in the cabinet he hasn't chosen the people around him he certainly hasn't chosen the finance minister and all of these choices that he makes will now be influenced by this note tell me about the note what was the problem and what did the note say so just to give you a background before I answer that question since the early 1980s, there was a push within the Indian system to liberalize the economy in terms of ideas. So there was an LK Jha report, there was an Abid Hussain report, Montek Singh had, uh, Aluwalia had authored a famous M, M document, you know, and Rakesh Mohan had also authored a new industrial policy. What were all these pushing back against? These all these were pushing back against what we call the license quota permit Raj. What was this license quota permit Raj? It had three components. First was that it closed off large sections of the Indian economy to private entrepreneurs. Only the public sector could could uh, uh, enter. And where the where, for example, making watches, only HMT could do it. And HMT was used to making heavy tools, Hindustan machine tools, heavy industry. So the, so you ended up with terrible HMT watches that people still wore because they didn't have any options, right? And you had then a few sectors where the government, where the private sector could participate, but they needed all kinds of licenses. So that was the first thing the government did. The second thing as part of the license quota permit, Raj, was that the size of private companies was stymied by making 
capital difficult for them because of bank nationalization, right? By the Mon Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, for example. So many ways in which the size of private businesses was stymied. They couldn't actually uh, access the capital markets without permission from the what was called the CCI at that time. The third element was you were sealing off India from the world. So heavy tariffs when it entry barriers when it came to foreign goods, uh, heavy restrictions on foreign capital en entering India, uh, a rupee that was artificially valued, so it made exports very difficult, etc, 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 right? Since the 80s, many bureaucrats were making arguments that these three pillars had to be dismantled, right? The blueprint that Nasimharao got was essentially the, the, a dismantling of these three wings, right? To make most of the Indian economy accessible to the private sector to invest, right? To reduce restrictions on the growth of the private sector and three, to allow foreign capital and goods to enter India, right? This was what the blueprint talked about. The blueprint also said that unless you do it, the Indian foreign exchange was so low that we would default on an IMF loan. We didn't have enough money. I mentioned in the book reasons, short term reasons for why the Indian economy was suffering, why we lacked foreign capital. Listeners only have to look to Sri Lanka today to see that it was very, very similar a situation. Now, Hopefully, Sri Lanka learns from Nasim Arao and uses this for long-term reforms of the economy. Hopefully, they do that. Nasim Arao was able to do that. But I just want to give you that this is the background to that particular document. You know, it's a great background. And, uh, you know, and, and just speaking of what Indira did, like people castigate her for the emergency and all that, which she should be castigated for. But for me, her economic policies were as disastrous, if not more. I think they kept millions of uh, Indians in poverty for decades longer than uh, they should have. They were a crime on humanity. And people don't often think of economics as such a dry subject, you know, license Raj, this, that. But the point is, you have real consequences on real human beings. That's, you know, exactly what happened with her. But, you know, that rant aside, it's also... So, just to add to your rant, people unfairly criticize Nehru. I would yeah. be less... He had a mild antipathy towards the private sector. But look, he was obsessed with growth. Yeah. And when he looked around himself in the 40s, the country that was able to grow was the Soviet Union. It was the growth model, just like China is today. And so he adopted fire plans, etc., yeah, etc. Yeah. It's Indira Gandhi who turned this mild antipathy towards the private sector uh, into complete antipathy. And instead of favoring growth, she favored her political survival. So I would put the blame squarely on Indira Gandhi. I, I would put it squarely on her as well. And what makes her particularly evil, and I use that word advisedly, is that she didn't even believe that this was the right way for India to go. It was just a matter of political positioning. She wanted to position herself as different from the coterie then in charge of the I Congress. Think that's right. And therefore, this massive leftward tilt and, uh, you know, slogans like Garibi Hatao, when what she was actually doing was perpetuating Garibi. And there's even an amusing anecdote in your book where you talk about how P.V. Narsimharao at a conference of the Andhra Pradesh backward classes declares, quote, we will not tolerate capitalists even if he is a Harijan. <laughs> Stop, quote. You know, similar to, you know, Nehru's uh, when Nehru told J.R.D. Tata that do not speak to me of profit. It is a dirty word. Uh, Stop, quote. <laughs> so, I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 that's a, a pretty kind of uh, famous. So he also had not just a slight distrust, but a fair antipathy. But you're right that, you know... Uh, Look, he was he, obsessed his, with growth. Yeah. You yeah. have to give him that. His, yeah. his policies, much as they were wrong and they hurt us and didn't allow us to go the East Asian miracle way, at least you can understand where they came from. He was well-intentioned. He wanted the no, best. I, I would say more, and, you know, she, he set the template for East Asian growth because look, in the 50s, East Asia was not growing. What Nehru was able to do was move an economy that was growing negatively to a 3% growth rate. See, we call it Hindu rate of growth. It's a wrong phrase. But that rate of growth was much higher than what the British left India with. And so, frankly, by nineteen mid-1960s, the stage was set perfectly for Indira Gandhi to do what the East Asia was doing at that point. East Asian growth began yeah. in the 60s. That was the Indira Gandhi period. And, you know, N N Nehru had provided more of a base than, say, uh, Th Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia had at that point. So it was Indira Gandhi who completely blew it up. In Indira Gandhi, who completely blew it up in multiple ways. And the interesting thing is that 
टूडे पीपल ट्राई टू डू अ लिटिल रीराइटिंग ऑफ हिस्ट्री एंड से रेट ओ राजीव गांधी रैली स्टार्टेड द रिफॉर्म्स एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट बट एज यू सर्ट ऑफ शो इन योर बुक दैट initially there was you know the the talk of reforms did come from policy wonks and bureaucrats and so on within his administration but he showed absolutely no will from from it turned away from it and uh, well i just just pushing back a little bit he initially tried hmm. so you know in 1985 he gives a speech against power brokers in the congress um, you know he expands what was called the open general license so more and more sectors became av- available in the indian economy for the indian so- private sector to invest he was the most pro american prime minister since then so in that sense his instincts to liberalize were i would say more than narsimha rao what he lacked and this is the key argument of the book is the politics of reform he just didn't know how to do it so from 1986 87 when he was when he had strong headwinds bofors the growth of hindu nationalism and the bjp salman rushdie's satanic verses being ba- banned he completely lost balance you know and that's the point of the book which is that look the ideas were there in the 80s four prime ministers including rajiv gandhi had the ideas right prime ministers such as vp singh chandrashekhar especially chandrashekhar and even rajiv gandhi even had the instincts to liberalize if you remember vp singh was the liberalizing finance minister of of rajiv gandhi right what they lacked is the political ability to remain in power and push through reforms that's the core ingredient that narsimha rao book brings and i want to repeat this that liberalization in india is not about ideas good ideas are well known in india right it's not even about political will it's about political ability right that's the key ingredient uh, the political instincts or the political will to reform existed with rajiv gandhi initially but then he just couldn't manage the headwinds of actually running government and he retreated narsimha rao was able to manage parliament manage party manage sonia gandhi and bring about change that's the central point of the book when i when i think of rajiv gandhi as cm is just someone who is bumbling through governance who has no core convictions for example you use a fantastic phrase comparative communalism yes right in the context of first he does shabano then he overcompensates by opening the gates of the babri masjid then he overcompensates to that by you know with the satanic verses ban we we were the first country in the world to ban that book and uh, so on and so forth so he's just bumbling from one thing to the other you could say you know to go back to a thick and thin thing he has no thick convictions it's all thin convictions he's just following uh, sort of the winds of the moment or do you do you feel that he had thick con- convictions of any sort i think he had the you know i would be favorable to say he had a thick conviction to liberalize but he simply didn't have the chops to see it through and when that happened when he had pushed back it's not that he lacked conviction he lacked courage and there's a slight difference between the two right he had the beliefs were intact you know but he just lacked the you know when he was when the, there was push back he just lacked the ability to navigate that he was a child uh, that you know children have thick convictions right but you know no i think they are thin but intense i mean because i would the way I, you describe thin was that they came from other people you know i felt that again who knows i haven't gone to rajiv's mind and certainly the book is not on rajiv but yeah. i felt that his you know he was sincere and his belief in transforming india was deeply held but that's not all you need in politics yeah, that's the yeah. point i make again and again right yeah that thick conviction needs ability to actually transform that on the ground right i may deeply deeply believe that i want to end poverty right but unless i have the chops and the mechanisms to do it that deeply held thick conviction matters for not right and not just that is uh, you may believe you want to end poverty and you may even have the political chops to do whatever it takes but you may have a misunderstanding of the problem to begin with i don't think rajiv had a misunderstanding yeah yeah i'm not saying he did but uh, i think he had a correct I, I, understanding I, I, i'm just pointing out that these are all the qualities that would go into change that one you have to have the conviction two you have to have the understanding uh, of what requires to be done and three you would need the political chops to kind of um, pull it off so <laughs> moving away from rajiv because like you said your book isn't about rajiv and why are we even talking about but, him but you know Let's... for me the tragedy of rajiv is even the greater 
you know, just to end that, which is here's a man who had convictions, who had a mandate. I mean, he had the largest mandate, I think 404 or 405 seats in parliament, much more than Narendra Modi, almost, a, you know, more than 100 more than Narendra Modi, right? So imagine, right? Imagine somebody who is 25% stronger than Narendra Modi is at the moment, right? Or even 30% stronger. Just imagine what that looks like. And still he messed it up, right? It's unforgivable, really. It's it's unforgivable. Let's sort of now talk about, uh, you know, he sees that note from um, uh, Naresh Chandra. And there is a body of work which has gone on, Rakesh Mohan, like you said, there's in 1988. Decade, there's a decade of work yeah. that has gone on that precedes that note. Even Manmohan Singh played a key part in that preceding decade too. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And uh, so so what, what, what happens now? At this point, he sees the note. Uh, one which uh, the, something that impressed me a lot is is that you said he grasped the enormity of the crisis immediately, and that by itself is impressive because you know a, a lot of politicians when you're sort of told something about the economy and it's an abstract subject and you don't have prior understanding of it that in any way can be called deep like he had of so many other subjects. That's right. Uh, you know, for him to just figure out that this is a big deal and I need to do something and. Um, and this has to be the sole focus because it seems to me that after that from the events that you describe everything that he does politically seems to go towards solving the problem right down to choosing the finance minister where as you said Pranam Mukherjee supported his rise to the Congress presidency and the prime ministership and Pranab had been finance minister under uh, Indira as well, would have been a natural choice for him. But he didn't pick Pranab because he thought that I have to solve this problem and that is a wrong man for this problem. So tell me a little bit about how things start unfolding uh, now and how he comes to his choice of finance minister and so on. So Nasimara understands very clearly that these three pillars of the license permit Kota Raj has to be dismantled full stop, right? So what does he do? Firstly, he realizes that the key element is the first aspect, right? First and second aspects, which is that you have to reduce uh, restrictions on domestic entrepreneurs, what we call internal liberalization. Step two is external liberalization, which is you have to allow foreign capital and, for, and foreign services and goods to enter India. But the first step is industrial delicensing. So he keeps the industry ministry for himself. People forget this, right? That's a very key element, right? Second is he appoints a principal secretary who's a key bureaucrat for every prime minister who was a former industry secretary, Amarnath Varma, well-known liberalizer, right? Third is he tells PC Alexander, who's helping him at that time, that look, I need a finance minister who is open to the world, right? Who is able to assist with external liberalization. And there are two names given there. Um, the first name, I.G. Patel, who is the head of the London School of Economics at that time, says no. The second name is Manmohan Singh. So Manmohan Singh says yes. And he becomes the finance minister. And look, Manmohan Singh has many, many skills that Nasimara, who already knows him, appreciates. One is... Manmohan Singh is incorruptible, right? With an ethics of a different order from most people in politics and bureaucracy. And this is important because Nasimha Rao has an instinct even then that liberalization will give rise to allegations of corruption. And so as the economy is opening up to the private sector, it's very important for to have a finance minister who's insulated from the shenanigans of the private sector, right? You don't want to have somebody who's friends with Dhirubhai Ambani, friends with the Tatas, friends with the Birlas, and Manmohan Singh is that guy, right? Second is that while Manmohan Singh has also had multiple views on liberalization over the years, he's much more of a conviction liberalizer than Nasim Marao. And third is that Manmohan Singh has held every single position for of economic policy in the Indian government. I mean, there are five positions of economic policy in the Indian government, finance secretary, finance minister, deputy chairman, planning commission, uh, chief economic advisor of India and RBI governor. Manmohan Singh has had all of them until he becomes finance minister, right? So he knew every inch of the economic levers. He knew how to, while the political cover would be given by Narsimha Rao, actually implementing it on the ground would be the person, uh, you know, would be Manmohan Singh and Manmohan Singh was ripe for the idea. So his incorruptibility, you know, and his ability to understand every inch of economic policy in India was very important to, to Narsimha Rao. That's why he was selected, right? He also had other liberalizers. For example, he had P. Chidambaram as Minister of Commerce. He had Montek Singh Alwalia playing a key role. So he surrounded himself with advisors. And what I find noteworthy in this, Amit, is that 
Manmohan Singh, I mean, Narasimha Rao wasn't insecure that he knew nothing about economics. He understood that a job needed to be done. And he said, who are the best people for the job? He and Manmohan Singh didn't have a personal equation or personal chemistry that was not relevant to Narasimha Rao. And this goes back to his childhood that here's a man who's used to being lonely, who's not, used, you know, who's not looking for chamchas, cronies, you know, who will mouth what the master wants. He said, I want the best people for the job to be able to do what the job takes. I think that's a remarkable quality. There's an anecdote that also is interesting in this context. Like we are recording this on the day that episode 281 released. Uh, this episode will be 283. And 282, which we, you haven't heard yet, but is the episode that releases before yours is with Noshad Forbes. Oh, wow. And uh, Noshad told me that uh, in that episode, he speaks about how uh, he was at a meeting that Manmohan Singh had convened of the top industrialists to meet the top industrialists so the finance minister can kind of talk to them. Uh, so he went to that meeting and I think he was positioned between Ambani and Tata. So all the photographs the next day had Noshad Forbes in the middle because he was sitting between those two guys and Noshad gave his usual outspoken views on the importance of liberalization and all of that at that point and uh, after the meeting ended you know when Manmohan Singh was uh, shaking all the hands individually one by one he told Noshad that you know what you said in this meeting please say it outside and please say it again and again and please say it loud you know, and just sort of indicating again what you said about the conviction. Now, you know, you've laid out the different kind of obstacles that now existed over here. One, the Congress has a minority in Parliament. Two, there is a Bombay Club, which is basically your existing bunch of big industrialists who have benefited from the license Raj and who don't want competition coming from outside. You know, underscoring the point I keep making that what big business wants is not free markets. It's never that. They want to hold on to their position. So market friendly and business friendly are entirely entirely uh, different terms that's and right. what people like us should aim for is market friendly because that's where common people like you and me benefit and the third was the legacy of the party itself that this was a party that had built this edifice part of which uh, you know Narsimha Rao and Manmohan Singh were now going to start tearing down and there is this lovely sort of um, uh, passage you have which I'm going to read out which describes what Rao's strategy was towards dismantling the Congress uh, legacy. And before this one quick note of context that, you know, the, the, the Congress manifesto before this had nothing about liberalization. It was completely protectionist and it was a standard, the same old, same old. And your para reads, quote, that afternoon Rao convened a meeting of CWC at his house. He began by saying that all the new policy did was to reverse Indira Gandhi's sharp leftward tilt in 1969 and take the country back to the more flexible 1956 policy resolution of Nehru. The Congress, Rao added, continued to believe in the commanding heights of the public sector. Having played one Nehru Gandhi against another, Rao now let his finance minister speak. Learning from his political master, Manmohan invoked the 1991 manifesto to show that within it lay the seeds of the new industrial policy. This was far from the truth. But as Manmohan Singh came out of the meeting, Arjun Singh told him, quote, Dr. Singh, you have read the more manifesto more carefully than we have. Stop quote. And this just speaks to sort of so much sagacity to realize that what they are proposing is so incredibly radical. But everything came down to how do you frame it by framing it as a return to Nehru, which it wasn't by framing it as a continuation of the promises made in the manifesto, which it wasn't, they kind of manage to win the game. So tell me about these two games, the internal game within the Congress party to win everybody over, and then the external game because they are still a minority party in Parliament. So tell me a bit about these. So the internal story is quite fascinating because the party of Nehru and the party of Indira Gandhi saw liberalization as going against the core DNA of the Congress. So that was the, you know, the, the core issue here. The way he went about it, you know, I, I mentioned here, which is that, you know, every single liberalization document was presaged with, you know, homilies to Nehru, to Indira Gandhi, to, you know, to Rajiv, especially because Narasimha Rao's crafty approach, especially when it came to Sonia Gandhi, was to say that all that he's doing is what Rajiv Gandhi would have done had he not been cruelly interrupted. That was the kind of the argument, right? Um, he also unleashed the intelligence bureau on the on the Congress. I have here 
uh, I'm quite proud of it, an Intelligence Bureau document uh, showing who are the different uh, congressmen in, and congresswomen and what are their views when it comes to liberalization and how you should deal with them. Wow. Um, you know, so it's an actual intel Intelligence Bureau report. So Najib Marao, you know, the agencies that Modi unleashes, he's hardly the first person to unleash them, right? The Intelligence Bureau was unleashed by by Narsimara far, far earlier than that. When dealing with the parliament outside, Narsimha Rao survived three no-confidence motions, one confidence motion and I think one vote of thanks motion. He did it by ruthlessly splitting the... the, the, the con he always needed 20 or 30 votes to win because it was a minority in, in parliament and he did it by, by, let me put it bluntly, by corruption, right? And other allurements by splitting smaller parties and independent parties and getting them to vote for the Congress. But that's not all he did. So, for example, after the Babri Masjid demolition, when there was a no-confidence motion against the Congress, Narsimara went and told the left, look, you should stand with me because this is a fight about secularism. So don't talk about liberalization. Let's focus on secularism. And, you know, he won He won that handily. I think it was 300 to 100 or something like that. Uh, he won that no-confidence motion. So that's the second thing he employed uh, in parliament, which is to, at, at key moments, to basically tell the, the left that, uh, look, let's not talk about liberalization. This is a fight to death against secularism. In that battle, we are on the same side against the BJP, right? Um, he also reached out to many members, um, um, whether it was just one saying in the BJP, Vajpayee, who was a good friend of his, Chandrasekhar, VP Singh. So he was constantly trying to engage with other politicians in other political parties. I think that was another skill he had. But, you know, it's hard to answer this at a meta level, Amit, because really the way he managed the party and the way he managed Sonia Gandhi and the way he managed parliament is day-to-day -day kabaddi. It's not some meta question. Day-to-day -day he's maneuvering to get, you know. So really, in some sense, Nasimha Rao is, you know, they say you're living hand-to-mouth. He's living confidence motion from to no-confidence motion. Every day he's worried that somebody would bring a no-confidence motion and the government would fall. And look at his, his, his temporal circumstances, the two governments before him. Both minority governments collapse within a year, right? The three governments after him, also minority governments, collapse nearly within a year, right? He alone was able to last five years. And I think that is incredible. And that's a, you know, and again and again, I want to emphasize that unless you know that story, liberalization doesn't happen, right? Unless you know how power is, is uh, accumulated, power is stabilized and then power is expended for liberalization. Just understanding the economic policy is neither here nor there. Like in a sense, this is a very good companion episode and a companion book to the earlier episode I done with Shruti and Ajay on the importance of uh, 91 reforms, what a big deal they sort of um, were for India. And you also have a chapter on what you kind of call the middle overs, right? Now, initially, you can say that, okay, there was a crisis, they had to do something, you know, the IMF demanded some reforms as well, and all of that. And okay, so these reforms happen initially. But these guys kept the game going further than that. They didn't just stop. They continued with, uh, you know, a one reform at a time, continued kind of moving through, though I feel that as the years went on, the momentum got slower and slower, and I guess political imperatives play a part in that as well. So tell me a little bit about, you know, that period, which may be missed out by many people may... A lot of people miss it out because they assume that liberalization in India because happened because of IMF pressure. And IMF pressure was when India had a crisis, which is in 91-92, right? So the entire focus is on that. For example, Jairam Ramesh has written an excellent book called Back from the Brink, which focuses exclusively on this period, right? But the reality is that even after the crisis ended, which is in 1992, when India has stable foreign currency, foreign exchange, even after that, so many reforms were planned. Like to give you an example, the single biggest uh, reform that touches us today is telecom reform, right? That, you know, mobile telephony, that reform happened in 1994, 1995, much after the crisis had ended. Uh, opening licenses for new banks, HDFC, ICICI, a key ingredient in, uh, um, you know, allowing credit to reach entrepreneurs in India today happened much after that crisis ended, right? Um, opening up 
the eco- the uh, uh, airline sector to private airlines jet damania east west uh, some of you may remember these names happened after the crisis ended and i could go on and on so many you know uh, reforms happened look i'm also a critic i also point out that there were many reforms that nasim rao didn't do in agriculture for example exactly. on the labor markets for example nasim rao didn't touch that at all right um on education and health you know while his instincts were right he didn't go as far as the upa government and the today's uh, modi government have done right so the, you know the, the 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 policies were in the right direction but they weren't as carefully crafted and frankly they didn't have the use of technology that you have today so there was something he simply didn't have but so many reforms happened after that and the point of that chapter amit was to was to push against this view that it was the imf who did it and india only reforms under crisis there was no crisis in those 3 years right and yet so many changes so many reforms happened it was because both manmohan singh and nasim rao were conviction reformers i'll leave it to my listeners to actually go read uh, your excellent book in uh, you know uh, going to the weeds of all of this it's a fascinating story and i can understand why like i think prakash jha made a very smart choice this is going to be a big hit uh, but uh, so in the 20 minutes or so that we have left before you have to go some quick questions on uh, areas that we can't really leave untouched and one of them is the demolition of the babri masjid where it is common today to uh, you know to blame narsim rao for that and a lot of it of course comes from the Congress his desire to disown him and wipe out his legacy and uh, we'll talk about that as well because we can't not talk about that but the, the sort of common canard spread is that the he allowed the babri masjid uh, demolition willingly and uh, i think sonia gandhi has even said that if Raj, uh, i think rahul gandhi has said that That's if right. um, rajiv was alive it would never have happened if a nehru gandhi was in power uh, it the would babri be. masjid well so i've answered this question many times so let me put it in this manner which is In India the police come under the state. In June 1991 the state government of UP where Babri Masjid is located was won by Kalyan Singh of the BJP. He contested on the plank of demolishing the Babri Masjid and he won the election he is a duly elected chief minister the BJP enjoys a majority gov- uh, government in the state of Uttar Pradesh. They are in charge of protecting the Babri Masjid because the police state police have to do it right? This is a conundrum. So anyone who says that the Babri Masjid has to be protected, really, you have to go back not to December '92 but to June '91 to say that a party has come to power in UP which has the constitutional obligation to protect the Babri Masjid. Yet its political obligation is to destroy the Babri Masjid. Should you dismiss that government? I, I would like your listeners to answer that question. Should you dismiss that government? Right? What do you think, Amit? Can you dismiss a government? I don't think you can dismiss a government. No, I agree with you. It's a conundrum. Obvi- it's a conundrum. You yeah. can't. I mean, you can't. Even you if can't, you've been voted in to do something unconstitutional, you you, you punish them after the act. You can't. Or, you, yeah, yeah, you can't just dismiss them preemptively. The only way to do that, to protect the mosque under this circumstance, is to impose central rule, dismiss the Kalyan Singh government, take charge of the Babri Masjid, and protect it. There's nothing else you could have done. So the real question before Nasim Rao was, why did he trust Kalyan Singh? Why did he not? Not dismiss the government. That's a valid question. But that would have you're saying that would have been like punishing a thought crime because it hadn't been done yet. That's the first problem. As the law secretary to Nasim Rao said that look, this is a problem because there there can't be a potential for breakdown in law in order to impose Article three fifty six. There has to be an actual breakdown. You can't dismiss someone for a thought crime, right? Secondly. all those politicians who say that narsimha rao should have imposed article 356 why didn't they say that before the mosque fell right uh, why didn't mr chidambaram say before the mosque fell that we kalyan singh should be dismissed why didn't sonia gandhi say before the mosque fell that uh, uh, kalyan singh should be dismissed why didn't sharad pawar say that why didn't arjun singh of all people say that biggest critic of narsimha rao the fact is that nobody was willing to give narsimha rao the political cover to impose presence rule and the reason for that was half the game was demolishing the mosque the other half was demolishing narsimha rao right and everybody was hoping that which whatever happened on december 6 1992 narsimha rao would fall and narsimha rao was 
praying and hoping that somebody would give him political cover to impose article 356 impose president's rule dismiss kalyan singh nobody was willing to say that vp singh didn't say that jyoti basu didn't say that everyone was hemming and hawing and saying that we we are concerned we stand with the prime minister but nobody was actually saying that sentence right now nasima rao as prime minister was not nobody he was somebody who should have done it on hindsight he didn't it was an error but it was a very very difficult error to you know, decision to make had he imposed president stool definitely bjp would have brought about a no confidence motion saying murder of federalism congress is up to its old tricks and nasimara was not confident that his own cabinet would support him in fact after the demolition of babri masjid when uh, many of the cabinet ministers like arjun singh or ml fotedar were complaining saying nasimara you know behave badly this that pranab mukherjee says in his in his memoirs that he told them don't speak now all the while before babri masjid fell all of you were agreeing with nasima rao none of you were sticking your neck out and saying impose president's rule why are you doing it now right the real question here is not the demolition of babri masjid amit i think the mistake we make is that those secularists amongst us see the rise of the bjp right as as ending indian secularism and the and the standing of babri masjid as the standing of indian secularism but it isn't the real question is the rise of the bjp and is there any law in india that could have prevented it no because it's a it's a bottom up democratic rise and once that rise was 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 ordained the demolition of babri masjid was preordained once kalyan singh comes to power in up it becomes very difficult to protect the babri masjid if not then then a few months later if not a few months later then a few months later something like this could have happened and the only thing that could have prevented that nasima rao didn't do it's an error he didn't do but he was terrified if he did it nobody else would back him up and on this i think i agree with him Yeah, and I think this is a situation where he truly got bad cards, which he could do nothing with. Because had he, uh, like you correctly said, uh, you know, had he dismissed the Kalyan Singh government immediately, anti-federalism and authoritarianism and all of that comes into play, and yes, rightly sir. so. And he didn't dismiss them, and he got screwed anyway. So no, keep in no mind, winning. Amit, that. Immediately after the demolition of Babri Masjid, all the non-BJP parties rallied behind Narsimha Rao. So at that time, they were not paying for his blood. This canard that Narsimha Rao did Babri Masjid was spread by the Congress Party after Sonia Ji takes control of the of the Congress in 1998 as a way of destroying Narsimha Rao's legacy. So the the story that Narsimha Rao did Babri Masjid is not spread by the BJP or the opposition, spread by the Congress Party. And if the Congress Party is saying that their own pers their own Prime Minister did Babri Masjid, why will anyone else stand up for Narsimha Rao? The catastrophe for Narsimha. Rao is he's a man without a constituency. You can say anything about him and get away. And the Babri Masjid is a good example. Look, I'm very critical of him in his role in the Sikh riots, but in the Babri Masjid case, he's been unfairly maligned. Fair enough. Let's move on to our sort of second last topic on uh, the subject, which is going nuclear. You know, you uh, you have a fascinating chapter where you mention that Atal Bihari Vajpayee, when he took over from Narsimha Rao, they met, and Narsimha Rao apparently told Vajpayee, "Samagri tayar hai." So basically saying that I have set everything in place, and now it is in your hands. And so tell me a little bit about that because this is also not very well known in the sense that people give Vajpayee all the credit or the debit, as it were, for uh, India actually going uh, nuclear. But Narsimha Rao put it completely in place, and if not for circumstance and the main circumstance being losing that election, it would have happened under him, uh, so as Vajpayee himself recognized. Well, it's the my favorite chapter in the book, so I'm not going to tell you all. It's a there's a mystery. Mystery there, and I hope your listeners buy the book and read the mystery. But I'm proudest that I don't think anyone else has had access to the documents and the interviews that I have had on India's nuclear program. Um, nobody, right, has had access. I can't, unfortunately, on this show or on the record say how I got access to it. Um, but suffice to say that you know it gives you a sense on a on a minute by minute view of how India's nuclear program is run, who is in the nuclear committee. I talk about how Nasima Rao accelerated the nuclear program in 1991 onwards. He didn't just accelerate the nuclear program; he also accelerated the program for delivery of the nuclear bomb, which is both in terms. 
terms of having a missile that's where apj abdul kalam comes in as well as through planes right so that both of these are delivery mechanisms for the nuclear program and narsimha rao had brought the program to fruition by 1995 i talk about the cat and mouse game between his and the americans and look i know this chapter is not footnoted is deliberately not footnoted but it's the most fun chapter i had doing because it, there's a genuine mystery there and it's, there's a there's a thrill there in how narsimha rao outwits the americans and yet you know is sagacious enough to not take credit by exploding the nuclear bomb so close to an election if he had done it he would have won right but for him national interest was more important which is why an opposition leader from the bjp vajpay who we credit with testing nuclear weapons in 1998 actually said in his words that the true father of india's nuclear program was narsimha rao and he says this emotionally when narsimha rao dies in 2004 saying that this is the man whom we should thank and we haven't done it and uh, yeah i i don't want to say more i'd like your listeners to actually read that chapter yeah and and uh, statesmanship on the part of uh, vajpay to give credit or debit as it were uh, where it is due something that the congress uh did not do and and this is perhaps the most heartbreaking uh, element of this whole story that after doing all of this you think that okay he gets a he surely they'll give him the bharat ratna for whatever is worth surely he'll be a national hero forever he'll die a much loved man and so on and so forth but instead what happens is he dies in 2004 in delhi and the congress does not want him to be cremated there they insist that the body be taken to hyderabad because uh, sonia just doesn't want him to remain a major figure to have a samadhi in delhi or whatever or of that and then eventually he is uh, sort of uh, taken to hyderabad there's a cremation of sorts there and gradually people have paid their respects and they kind of move away and then there is a sentence from your book where you say that night television channels showed visuals of the half burnt body skull still visible lying abandoned stray dogs were pulling at the funeral pyre stop quote which is an amazing heartbreaking sentence that here is a man and his skull is you know still visible and stray dogs are pulling at his funeral pyre and that seems to me to be a metaphor for exactly what happened to him that's right that's why the chapter is called half burnt body um yeah i mean you know I, w- what more can i say i mean in any religious tradition the treatment of the body even the worst human being the body is treated you know in hinduism this is particularly important that the body is treated with respect and the fact that even that didn't happen for the man tells you that how far his legacy has been forgotten by us right and i just hope that the book and this this particular conversation we're having helps resurrect him um it has resurrected him but i hope it resurrects him even more because look there are plenty of things about him that are a problem right but he transformed india and he transformed india mostly for the good it wasn't fated to happen right it required tremendous skill uh and it's something that we can learn about not just in politics today but outside politics today yeah yeah and absolutely remarkable uh, leader and uh, you know before i read your book in fact i i, I already admired him and gave him credit for a lot of what happened but reading your book actually just just seeing that entire journey just made me go wow because we don't have a politician like that and it's it's uh, so tragic that you know that he should be treated like this by his own party for their own image building reasons and uh, you know the kind of narrative manipulation that goes on and and there's so much else in your book which I'll you know ask readers to go to uh, so let me kind of end with a final question as we just have like a uh, 5 minutes left what are you reading these days well um i just finished reading um uh, my colleague upinder singh's book ancient india culture of contradictions i would recommend it very strongly um it's a you know it summarizes several of the key issues when it comes to ancient india equality gender um liberation freedom etc etc she has a way of sticking to facts she has a way of being accessible uh, she's opinionated like you know the best scholars are but it doesn't interfere with with the way she tells the story so i really like that book and she also happens to be uh, the daughter of one of the protagonists of uh, one of the people who comes out looking really good in the story manmohan singh because even after the congress party turns their back on him he shows up every year at uh, narsimha rao's uh, you know birthday celebrations and all of that and he's kind of still sort of maintained that loyalty and that warm feeling oh, very much but i would say upinder singh is very much her own personality Absolutely. yeah yeah i didn't mean to and- And, I mean no one should be known as someone's daughter yeah, especially yeah and yeah. she's like you know she's one of the top absolutely top scholars uh, on uh, on indian history uh, so it's you know been quite enli- you know definitely been quite enlightening 
so it's an amateur uh, i mean mine is an amateur interest uh, in in history so it's nice to uh, you know to engage with the works of such a professional historian maybe you're the narsimha rao of political scientists so you're interested <laughs> in so much else <laughs> thank you very much well i i i i i think i take that as a compliment <laughs> it was meant as a compliment <laughs> Uh, what, what else? Anything you'd like to recommend to uh, listeners in terms of books, films, music? Well, you know, I I recently read this book called *Brideshead Revisited* um, by Evelyn Waugh. It's a phenomenal book. Phenomenal. Um, it's it. You know, it's been made into a film recently, but I would suggest you avoid that. I think it was ITV. There's a basically a um, a six part or six or seven part series. You know that came out in the mid 1990s, widely seen as the best uh, TV series ever made. Right? At least at that time, before the OTT explosion, it was seen as you know it was very expensive series to be made. Uh, around the same time, Pride and Prejudice was made by BBC. So I would recommend that strongly. It's a bit slow by today's OTT. T standards, but Brides had revisited the uh, six or seven part series. Um, I would recommend if you don't want to read the book. Fabulous! So, Vinay, thank you so much for coming on the show. May Vinay Ram or Vinay Sita Pati, as it were, continue to flourish and write many books. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a pleasure. It's the first time we're um, doing this in person. Um, it just tells me that how inadequate Zoom is uh, when it comes to building chemistry in such a conversation. So, thank you very much, Amit. Absolutely thank you for being here. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes where I've linked Vinay's books as well. Enter rabbit holes at will. Buy both his books. His previous episode with me is linked from the show notes. Vinay doesn't seem to be on Twitter, smart person. That's why he's so productive. But you can follow me on Twitter at Amit Verma, A M I T V A R M A. You can browse past episodes of the Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen. dot i n. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of the Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.